IB Nation, welcome to the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It is Friday, free for all mailbag. Of course, it is the show that you all get to drive the conversations. We already have 32 mailbag questions in the chat. If you are new to the chat, throw the question in, hit the MB beforehand so we can kind of distinguish between the mailbag questions really quickly. We're going to let you guys drive kind of the conversation today. Ryan Roberts, Brian Driscoll, if you missed our live draft coverage of day one of the 2023 NFL Draft, you should go check out CFB Nation. YouTube channel. We uh we had a long conversation. I mean, what were we live for four and a half hours last night, Brian? Right? Kind of breaking gosh, that every yeah. single pick for the first round. Yeah. So make sure you check out that coverage, man. I thought it was really good stuff. We had a great crowd in there last night on CFB oh, yeah. Nation. So make sure you check that out. Gonna get into some mailbag questions just momentarily, but Brian, I know that there was a couple updates that we're going to kind of kick the show yes. off before we start talking about the Logan Diggs stuff a little yes. bit as well. But a uh, b- big update, man, from the uh, Irish Breakdown family up here. Yes, well, a couple things real quick. First of all, I want to say happy birthday uh, to a, a longtime listener and supporter of the show, John Gerardo. It's his birthday today. His wife, Amy, reached out to me and asked that we could wish him a happy birthday. John's been a longtime supporter of what we're doing here at Irish Breakdown, listens to our shows all the time, uh, responds on Twitter all the time. So, John, we appreciate your support enormously. Uh, Obviously, uh, uh, tons of thanks for that. I also want to uh, reach out to people and, and say thank you to all of you. You all are a truly, truly amazing group of people. Yesterday, we started a show and we were doing a fundraiser for a couple other Notre Dame fans who were going through a tough time. And a lot of people are going through a tough time, but we found out about this particular situation. Um, and Jake and uh, and Abby, their baby Brady, who's named after Brady Quinn, and after our uh, precious dog that Angela had that we lost a few years ago. Uh, not he wasn't named after him, but our that was the name of our dog uh, that was very precious to us. And as we don't have kids, as I've said before, our kids are our dogs. So it just meant look, just kind of touched me in a different way. And so we're like, you know, hey, let's help out a little bit. So they had a GoFundMe page open for a, a few days, and they had raised about $1,800, which is good. But their goal was at $7,500. So we kicked off. You know, I asked if we could we could partner with them and help them out, and they were very thankful and, and gracious. And uh, I went this morning, and they were already over $9,700. In less than 24 hours, this community raised almost, what, what $8,000 to help out a family in need. I, I um I'm beyond humbled and I cannot thank you all enough. You all are so amazing. And we've done this multiple times. We did this with the cancer drive for the softball team. We did this with the Thanksgiving drive a couple of years ago. And every time we've stepped, we've asked you all to step up and help out, you have gone above and beyond what we dreamed. My goal was to just hope they could get close to their goal of seventy five hundred dollars. That was my goal. And we shot them past it. You all shot them past it. And and I just um I can't thank y'all enough. I want to thank you all so much. This is truly an amazing, and we don't always agree on everything. And sometimes we'll, we'll go back and forth. And I know some of you don't like things that I do or you do or whatever, but man, um, when, when it comes to things like this, just to see everybody rally around each other and and unify and support of, of a family, you guys are amazing. And I just want to thank you all for that. And we just had to kick the show off with obviously a happy birthday to John uh, who, who's a longtime listener. Amy, thank you so much for bringing his birthday to our attention. I uh, hope you enjoy today's show, John. And then, of course, to all of you, just a, a huge thank you to all of you who have been just stepped up to the plate and and have just really done amazing things for our community. So, you know, tip of the cap to y'all. Thank you all very much. That's awesome. A great way to start the show, obviously, as we get into the mailbag here. I, I think the, the, the community is so great also, Brian, because a lot of insightful questions that we always get, a lot of great questions. And we actually had one that I think is really pertinent to starting this conversation, of course, about Logan Diggs. And that was Eric Radford, who I wanted to bring up real quick, who just said, what went into the Logan Diggs decision? Most running backs are by committee. Can't be a playing time issue. So we're going to get, obviously, into the a little bit of the layers of the Logan Diggs, uh, Logan Diggs transfer. If you didn't see that yesterday, that news broke. It was something that we had been, you know, kind of hearing that was it was going to happen type of situation. Apparently, we didn't drop enough been. hints. I thought we <laughs> dropped enough hints on that one. And I, if for some of you that didn't see it, I really apologize. But I really thought we had dropped enough hints this spring to kind of let people know that something was going to be happening at running back. Yeah, but apparently not. Please continue, Ryan. Oh no! I, and so for anybody that missed it, Logan Diggs, who was the second leading rusher on the football team this past year with over 800 yards was actually the leader in total carries for Notre Dame in 2022. 
obviously was going to be entering his, well, it will be entering his third year, his junior season this year after playing both years as a freshman and a sophomore for Notre Dame. He announced yesterday that he will be entering the transfer portal. And uh, so we want to kind of just talk about this, for, you know, for, for a few minutes here. Just yeah. it's it's going to be impactful. It is. There's no doubt about it. He was a really good running back. But Brian, I know this is something that it wasn't obviously wasn't super shocking to say the least. No, it, it wasn't shocking. I mean, Logan's been a transfer waiting to happen from the minute he got to Notre Dame. I mean, and it even started before he signed. There was the back and forth about LSU, which what made it even more frustrating is he had already signed with Notre Dame. He just didn't. They weren't going to announce it, and so. Uh, he wasn't going to announce it till February. So when he was talking about, you know, maybe signing with LSU, that would have required him to get out of his letter of intent that he had signed with Notre Dame in December. And he ended up coming to Notre Dame and and was unhappy early in his freshman year because he wasn't playing and then got the chance to play and was happy to a degree again. But then he he almost he transfer he was going to transfer when Brian Kelly left. It, well, there was obviously a lot of rumblings he was going to go to LSU then. And Tommy Reese was able to convince him to stay because Logan had a great relationship with Tommy Reese. And so he, he went out last year, you know, had a good season, uh, was part of a really excellent one-two punch at running back. Everybody knows I'm a, a very pro Notre Dame guy as a player. And he was supposed to be a dynamic one-two punch again this year. And I think that, uh, you know, once Tommy Reese left, it was a concern, obviously, about how Logan would handle that. It, he seemed to be initially on board. Yeah. But I just think as we kind of got deeper into the, the the winter and spring that it just he was back to kind of not wanting to be here. And I think the fact that he was going to split carries of Logan Diggs, I, I think he wants to go somewhere where he's going to be a little bit more featured, which, OK, you know, whatever. I I think that's so incredibly short sighted in today's era. I mean, people talk about running backs aren't valued because they have too much tread on their tires and he's in a situation where. He had a thousand yards of offense last year, Ryan. He would have yeah. had another thousand yard season this year if he just stayed healthy, and he could have gone to the NFL with back to back thousand yard seasons. And I'm talking about all purpose yards. So he had a, a eight hundred. I think Ryan, what was it, eight hundred and twenty two rushing yards last season, something like that. Yeah, and and then he had over two hundred receiving yards. So he had ten thousand. He had a thousand and thirty three total yards. Aldrich estimate was at a thousand eighty something. So both of them went over a thousand yards last year of all purpose. And, you know, he's not getting the same wear and tear on his body, which, you know, and I think NFL teams would like, but you're still getting plenty of opportunities to show your skill set, in my opinion. And he had some big games for Notre Dame last year, obviously the big game against South Carolina. But I I, I think that, that that was just sort of a – and I'm, I'm not saying this disrespectfully. It's going to sound disrespectful, but I don't mean it to be. I think the whole splitting carries things was just what he could use as his excuse to leave. And what I mean by that is I just don't know that Logan was ever fully happy at Notre Dame. I think that he really liked the idea of Notre Dame. I think he got along really well with Tommy Reese. He's a kid that values the educational part. So did his mom. I just don't think he was ever happy being this far away from home. And he was able to do it because there was a coach that he had a great deal of trust in and Tommy Reese and, and Tommy was able to convince him not to transfer multiple times, but now Tommy's gone and I just think the writing was on the wall that he was eventually going to leave. I was just hopeful that they'd be able to convince him to stay for one more year and then go pro. Yeah. Like that, that's what doesn't make sense about this whole thing is like, dude, stay for one more year. You and Audric are going to be a dynamic one, two punch. And then you can both go pro next year or Audric goes pro. You stay for one more year and then you're the dude. But I mean, go pro after next year. I mean, most running backs do go pro after their junior year. Yep. And he chose to go another way and he's going to transfer. So I, where he's going to go, I don't know. It would not shock me if he goes to LSU. Although, you know, Ryan, looking at the LSU backfield, he's not going to be able to just walk in there and, and just get 20 carries a game. I mean, it's not a great backfield, but it's not a bad backfield either. Josh Williams, Jane, um, John Emery, right, is back again. Is he I back? Think I think I, Noah Kane is also back, I believe. No, I, I think they're both back, yeah. So, you know, and then they signed a, a really good freshman running back who, you know, might be a year away and and especially now with Logan. So, I mean, he'll play there. But honestly, I think the playing time thing that that I've been told by so many people, I really just believe that was kind of just what he used yeah. to be able to want to go closer to home. Now, he may go he may not go to LSU, he may go somewhere else, but it's going to be closer to home. And and I believe it's LSU. I think it's going to be LSU. But uh, it's about does LSU want him? I would I would think that they would. I mean, he's a 
Logan's a good running back. I mean, good player, yeah. I'm going to say some things in a minute about where I think Notre Dame is in this conversation. Uh, but the reality is, is what I'm about to say says speaks volumes about how good the backfield is as a whole. And is not, and it's not, I'm not one of those people that's like, Oh, well, uh, he wasn't that good anyway. And he was, no, I'm a big good. Logan Diggs fan. Logan Diggs is yep. a good running back. Yep. And everybody liked to pick on the, well, he's not fast. He's not, I'm like, well, South Carolina would like a word for you about him not being fast. Right. I mean, you know, Oh, he only averaged X amount of carries. Well, that's partly because of the first two games were really bad. And, and he had, you know, he, I, I, that's his game. I mean, he's a good running back with no help from the past game last year. So it's a loss in that regard. But my point is more of, but this is why you recruit the way you recruit. This is what big boy football is about. And, and I think some of us need to remind ourselves of this. It's the same thing with recruiting. When you recruit the way that Marcus Freeman's staff is recruiting, you're going to have big boys come and take some of your players. But you recruit so well that you're still recruiting extremely well, even when you do lose those players. And you look at the running backfield, there's some question marks, and we'll dive into that here in a second, Ryan. But the fact is, is that Notre Dame's going to be okay at running back. And I, I am not someone who's saying good riddance to Logan Diggs. I wish right. he would have stayed. I wanted him to stay. I'm not even saying this now. I'm not saying oh, I'm glad he's gone, you know. But if he didn't want to be here, then – how was he going to be in the fall if things didn't necessarily go his way? I mean, that's a that's a question. And if you're not happy, if you're truly not happy somewhere, and I think this is this is why I'm the reason I'm being specific about this is because what I'm told by multiple sources is it was playing time was the issue. But I just think there's more to it than that, just because of what we know about what he's been through is two years. I don't mean like been through like he's been through something tough, but just that he just didn't like being away from home. Uh, and that's okay. I, I know a lot of people like that. So I just think that was kind of the reasoning. And when a kid who's is not happy in that regard, and I'm not even saying this negatively as a shot towards Logan, then he's going to have a tougher time handling adversity and, and, and working through different things. Yeah. And so for him, I think it is best that he leaves because he wasn't happy here. And for the team, I think it's best that he leaves because he wasn't happy here. And I don't say that disrespectfully. I wish him the best. I hope he goes to LSU and crushes it. I, I like Logan Diggs. I like him as a player. I think he's a good kid. And I just think he made a misguided decision. But I don't yeah. think there's – I don't have to say that with any ill will whatsoever. But I'm also going to say that they're going to be fine. Now, yes, there's some injury question marks. I get all that. But he's going to – they're, he, they're going to be fine at running back, in my opinion for a, a host of reasons and which I want to discuss before we dive too much in the mailbag, Ryan, but you know, that's kind of the reason behind it. The reality is, you know, he was, he was also with, he had an early injury in spring. I think he was good to go by the end of spring. He just, just a lot of reasons. He just didn't come back. Right. But the reality is him being out early, Audric Estime separated himself from Logan in the spring. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And I don't know that the splits would have been the same in the fall because Logan has had some injury issues. He has had at times trouble staying on the field. Now he had, he missed a game last year with an injury. I, I think he was still struggling to come back from the shoulder injury that he st yeah. suffered in the blue gold game. And I think he got a chance to clear his head because he was awful. The first two games misses the cow game comes back against Carolina and he's vintage Logan Diggs, Right. And, uh, you know, so he was a really good part of it and, and a good player. I just feel, Ryan, that I always want the extra talent. So this isn't a they're better off without him situation. I'm no. not saying that. It's just they're going to be fine. Estime is in, I think, with the leaner body. I, I My hope is that Estime is able to carry a little bit more of the load. I'm going to have an, an article coming out later today that's going to talk a lot more about this. But. You know, you do have Jadarian Price coming back off of an injury. You do have Jabron Payne emerging. You do have Jeremiah Love coming in as a freshman. All three of those guys, if healthy, can play. And as and that's the big, right, the asterisk right there is, are they going to be healthy? From everything that we hear about Jadarian Price, he's on pace to be ready to play. And I think you could make a case that if Jadarian Price is healthy, who, by the way, had beaten out Audric Estime and Logan Diggs last spring as the number one back, that's just a fact. And I've yep. multiple sources have told me this. 
the interesting part, Ryan, is they're a they're a, a much better complementary one two punch if big giant capital letters if Jadarian's back to full speed. Yeah. Just because Audric and Logan are are not the same, but they're similar. The yeah. offense executes the same way with those two in the game. Even though their skill sets are a little different, they're running the same stuff. Audric and Jadarian are different backs because Jadarian is a little bit more of a slasher. He's more of that home run threat. He's more of that big play, one cut and go guy, can catch the ball, can run wheel routes and those type of things. Jerron Payne's a little bit of a different runner than Logan Diggs, although there are some similarities there. But he's got a little bit more juice than Logan, not as powerful as Logan was, right? But he brings a little bit of a complimentary style. He had a great spring. Yep. And then Jeremiah Love is a guy that is is got some Chris Tyree in him and that he only needs five touches to impact the game as a freshman, right? And a six one, one hundred and ninety five pounds body. And he ran a <laughs> and he ran a ten five recently, right? Yes. And and if he's one ninety five now, and I and I talked to somebody yesterday that that mentioned that he's around one ninety one ninety five because he's in the middle of track. He's going to be two hundred five by the time the season starts. Oh, easy, yeah. And yeah. and so you've got you've got some different skill sets now. That's four guys. Ideally, you want five backs. They could go to the transfer portal and get another guy, but you've got Chris Tyree who could play there if you need him to. But now you just maybe altered the, the game plan with Chris Tyree as a slot guy a little bit, Ryan, that you now maybe get him some touches on jet sweeps and outside zones and things like that, even though you keep him as a receiver. And you also have a situation where you do have some walk-on backs that can get you out of a game if you need to. But you've got – you have to have a lot go wrong to in a game to not have running backs to get you out of a game. You have to have a lot go wrong. I mean, Notre Dame went in to play Georgia in 2019 with one healthy running back, one, Tony Jones Jr., and they almost won that game. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is you don't have to necessarily replicate the carries the same way they did last year, right, because this offense is going to be different. You're going to have receivers. You know who's going to take some of those carries away that, that Logan Diggs had last year? The wide receivers. Man, what are you talking screens. about? Yeah, yeah. No, screens <laughs> and RPOs. Yeah, because things that were pure handoffs last year are going to be pulling throws this year. You're sure. going to throw the ball more effectively and efficiently. So, and then if you can just add four to five more carries onto Logan Diggs, or I mean onto Audric Estime, who last year averaged 12 carries a game. Now, if you can get him up to about 17, 18 carries a game, that Ryan, that only has him in the top 30 nationally in yard and in, in carries per game, right? I mean, it's not a huge, huge load. If he's in a little bit better conditioning, maybe he can stay you know healthy for the course of a whole game. And then now you have some guys can can handle 10 to 12 carries a game. You have three guys that can handle 10 to 12 carries a game. Plus, you have Chris Tyree that can handle three to four jets a game. You've got uh, you, you've got some other guys can do some things off of that that action. And then you've got the RPO game. So there's plenty they can do. And it's not like last year they also had a running back, a quarterback that was, was running the ball a ton. They did in three games out of the 13. Right. Yet, yeah, right. So the others, they didn't have that. So I they're gonna be okay. Now they can't afford another injury. That's the that's the that's the concern, right? They really can't afford yeah. another long-term injury. They can't afford someone going down for eight weeks. But I think they're gonna be fine. And and between Janarian Price and Jabron Payne and Jeremiah Love. With Audric Estime becoming more of a true number one, I think Notre Dame's going to be just fine at running back. Yeah. Well, if there is an injury, Brian, it's going to be a fun conversation of who you move to running back. I can already see Drake Bowen, baby. They're like, give Drake the ball, give Drake the rock, which is pretty yeah. funny. Obviously, half yeah. hitting there, right? But it's, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, you know. I, I, I'll say it, man. If, if Drake Bowen's a stud in his junior year, Brian, let's say, if you want to give him a couple goal line carries, I'm all right with it, man. I'm all right with it. That's all I'm saying. But I, I think there's layers to this, right, as far as, like, how you quantify this backfield. You went from, with Logan Diggs, an embarrassment of riches at running backs to, without Logan Diggs, still being very rich. I mean, that's just kind of where you are, right? Like, your backfield is not hurting in talents. You have Aldrick Estime, who's going to play football in the NFL, barring an injury. He's going to play. Jadarian Price, who you mentioned, is going to be a guy that, if he's back to full health, he was – potentially going to be the number one back last year. Like that's kind of how everything was trending. You have a guy like a Jeremiah Love who's going to come in and I think be able to give you some big play potential. You have Jabron Payne who, yes, he's dealt with injuries in his high school career, but he has been able to be durable so far in his Notre Dame career, at least through the practices and the limited game time that we've seen of him. So I think Notre Dame's going to be fine, man. They're going to be fine. This is one of those – and not to mention, you're we're, – we're, Peek into the future. I know this is more of a 2023 concern, but you already have a commitment from Aeneas Williams of the 2024 class. They're trying to get a second running back of that class. Kedron Young, Anthony Carey, they'll be okay. And they'll that okay. makes it way – I mean, this this sets up a much easier sell to them. Hey, guys, we only have four running backs in the roster right now. Yeah. And we're going to lose Audric. 
I mean, he's going pro. I mean, if Audra goes out there and starts, or like guys, you you realize Audra's gone, right? And if you in the in the pitch to Keedron Young is that's you. <laughs> that's your like, not not you know like, like like I don't like doing the whole you're the next Audra Estime. I ki- most kids don't like that. They don't want to hear that. It, but it's more of a you see that see what he does. That's your role. That's exactly yes. how we want to use you. And imagine what you could do in this offense, right? And so I think the set the selling point becomes a lot better because. You're going to say, well, man, you got Jadarian Price and Jabron Payne and Jeremiah Love. He's like, yeah, but they don't do what you do. They can't do what Audric did. Yes. You can do what do what Audric did. So I think it helps in that regard. But I, I, I again, they're still going to be fine. And I think here's another thing too. There's a concern that well, these guys haven't proven themselves. Very true. Very true. That's fair. That's, and that's fair. always a legitimate argument. But I've always said there's two positions on offense that are very easy for freshmen and young players to step into. I've said this all along. So this isn't spin because they lost a guy. I have been saying this for years. Running back is without question the easiest position for a freshman to come in and play. It's not easy, especially yep. in an offense like Notre Dame's. It's more pro style, which means more pass blocking, responsiveness, and things like that. But it is is the easiest. And here's the other thing. I think Dylan McCullough is, is really well situated to make it happen because he has talked about in the past about finding niches for backs. Yes. finding niche roles for backs. And so I think he's smart enough, and I think Jer- Jared Parker is going to be smart enough to say, hey, look, if we got this young kid who isn't the greatest pass blocker, then you know, we got to be smart about how we use him. Well, then you know, teams are always know you're running. No, you do more empty free release stuff. There's a lot of different things you can do. And then he, you know, you make his responsibilities somewhat easy. You have the quarterback tell him, hey, you're blocking five, you know, things like that. So you can make it work if a guy doesn't figure that part out. But there's That's, more individual tension for the guys here now, Ryan. And you, you're, you'll be able to find you, – you, none of these guys besides Estime are going to have to be the do-it-all, everything guy. They're all going to have their roles. They're all going to have their niches. And that's how you put a backfield together and how you make it work. I think that's the best part of having a running back coach that has an NFL background as well, Brian, is that he's used to assigning and designating roles for backs, right? Like I feel like you see a lot more in college football bell cows still. In the NFL – I mean, how many teams are, are have a true bell cow as the running back? Most teams are now a committee by approach, and when you're a committee by approach, you have to designate roles and you have to be very specific with what you're asking players to do. So I think that that's Coach McCullough's background is going to be big time in kind of formulating those roles. And I th- would say this also, you're not running RPO every play, but when you are running RPO, it's also nice because, yes, you're going to have to pass protect in this offense, but if I'm running a, he- a bunch of heavy RPO, that's more designed to – using that guy as a little bit of eye candy when you're pulling it, right? And be, to be able to run that run action. So they're not really a designated pass blocker per se all of the time in that type of role. So well, you can find ways around it. You can find at ways least in the spring, that. Ryan, you're right. They didn't run an RPO every play. But yeah. They ran it most plays. Ran it a lot, man. <laughs> right. And, and, and there will be games that you're going to go into and say, Hey, Sam, we're not pulling it here. Right. We're, we, with this look, but that's easy. That's literally a call. You make that yeah. call. Like you, you know, you call like deuce, right. You know, 24, um lock right so you're running deuce right you're running 24s your inside zone play or mid zone play or whatever 24 wham lock that's what you call it. lock means we're locked into the run right yeah. you carry out your rpo action but we're locked into the run now you could even still tag rpo routes just to influence the defense but it could also be a thing where when we call lock we want the front side receivers to block because we, because of the way that they lined up, we need to get that slot receiver in on that lead backer because we can't get to him the way that they, or you know, that safety or whatever, because we can't get to him the way that they, they run fit, with, you know, in this look, and we want to run this play, and we feel like if our, if Jaden Thomas can go block that safety, we got a chance to ghost this thing. We want to get that handball handed off, even though they're giving us that backside outside, you know, quick out route. They're giving us that window so we can pull it and throw it. But you know, like, but I don't want to pull it and throw it. I want to hand this sucker off. So there's checks and calls you can make to the quarterback to say we're handing it off. And nobody else needs to know that on an RPO call. You're just just handing it off. And you may make a call to receivers. Okay, when we're in this formation and we run this play, play side receivers, you've got to block. And then you've only got one guy running an RPO backside. So there's a lot of different things. When you're doing RPOs correctly, all those things are part of it, right? And so we'll see that at times, but to your to your point, Ryan, we're going to see a lot more RPOs, which is then going to say, okay, if, if teams start defending the RPOs, then now all of a sudden you don't need as many carries to get where you got to last year with that production. Yep. So that's the ideal scenario and where Notre Dame wants to be. But at the end of the day, is it a loss? 
not having Logan Diggs? Sure it is. Anytime you lose a good football player, it's a loss. And I don't think Logan's attitude issues were he's a bad kid attitude issues. It was more of just a he's clearly just not happy here type of yep. thing. And eventually that can that can be problematic in, in a way that's not so much, I'm sick of this kid. Just more of a man, like, buddy, I'm just I'm I'm tired of having this talk what? with you, man. I think he's just gonna be happier going somewhere else. And and you know what? I wish him well. I do. I do. Yep. But I think it's gonna be better for Notre Dame in in the long run, having guys there that really truly want to be there. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that my last point was you appreciate Logan, what he did for Notre Dame. He was a real yeah. good player this past season. You wish him well. It is a loss, obviously, but you also understand that with how Notre Dame is recruiting the position and developing the running back position, you're going to be good. Everything's yeah. going to be fine. So I think that's a good yeah. way to end it. So, Ryan, that's a, that is a good way to end it. Let's um, yep. Now let's let's get to it, buddy. Let's, let's get absolutely it. get to it. So we got we got a ton of questions here. Obviously, we'll, we'll, we've got John A1. Got a lot. Look, so hey, here's what we can talk about today, folks, right? We'll obviously talk about Notre Dame's team. We can talk about Notre Dame recruiting. We can talk about college football. But if you guys want to have some draft questions that you want to ask Ryan as well, feel free. So if you want to ask about what he thought about your team, if you did not listen to our show last night, it's on the CFB Nation channel. We did a live four and a half hour long, because that's how long the draft was, uh, pick by pick kind of predictions and there's a couple where ryan's like you know i think they should go with this guy and then i'm like uh pick is in it's the guy you just said and then we give live instant reaction to all the picks so i mean we we put a lot of discussion into that so if you really yes. want to know more in detail like what we thought of the draft and your teams and you know things like that like the Bengals, we had a conversation about how we were disappointed they didn't take the take michael mayer yep. but also talked about how Okay, it I'll, sucks for I'll Michael Mayer, but pretty good. <laughs> it's a pretty freaking good pick for the bet, right? So we had some of those, yeah. and um, it was a lot of fun, man. I had a blast Let's, last night. I'm tired as heck, yes. uh, but I uh, had a blast last night. So it, just point is, if if you're an NFL draft person and you didn't get a chance to listen to that, go check that out, and you know you can go fast forward to whatever teams, and you'll know who we're picking because uh, on the crawler at the bottom, we actually put what was the most recent pick. So if you want to try to find something in the show, you can kind of scroll and you look at the crawler; it'll have who the picks were. So yes. that'll help you find out where we are too. That was um, that was a lot of fun. The if, if the NFL draft ever wants Irish breakdown to run the coverage, I'm just saying, man, just, you give us yeah. a call. Just give I us mean, a call. we had to do all. I'm I'm, I'm doing a crawler. I'm writing <laughs> stories. I'm checking the message board. Yeah, I mean, we did it all last night, buddy. But it was yes, a ton sir. of fun. So, but that doesn't mean you can't answer, ask questions about the draft now. That, that's all I'm saying. And you can feel free to yep. do that as well. So and we'll, we'll, we'll also be giving a lot of analysis tonight on the message board at boards.com right. when yeah. Notre Dame players are picked. And then we'll be having some live reaction videos. There'll be a yeah. lot of good stuff. Tonight. I actually have an idea that I need to rem remind me to talk to you about, okay. about live analysis of the draft as cool. we're going. So I'll, I'll talk to you about that here in a little bit. But let's kick Sounds things good. off, Brian, yep. with a question from John A1. John had a lot of questions to start us out here. John, always appreciate it, man. Always great, insightful question. He's, he's starting us off with. How would you compare the run blocking combination potential of Blake Fisher and Rocco Spindler post spring to the right side blocking in 2022? Obviously, 2022 was Blake Fisher and Josh Lug as the starting right guard. Well, let's just kind of work off of the the assumption of let's just say that that we go into the season and Rocco Spindler wins the job because he keeps playing like he did in the spring game. Let's just for the sake of argument. Yeah, I think what you would have is a more physical group, and and the reason I say that is not because necessarily Josh Lug wasn't physical. I, I think Ryan, you've pointed this out before. Josh Lug, by the time he was a six year senior, just wasn't the same guy because he had so many injuries: Godzilla, back, yeah. knee, shoulder. I mean, that kid. It, it did frustrate me the last couple of years, and and it it frustrated me to hear how how hard Notre Dame fans were on Josh Lug, and the reason it bothered me is because. We knew what that kid was playing through. Oh, he's a warrior. Josh Lowe's uh, a warrior. 100%. A warrior. Yeah. And you're like, dude, you'd realize most human beings would not even be able to put on, like, use their arms to put on pads with the stuff that Josh Lug has had to play through. And this kid is out there answering the bell every single week. But he wasn't as powerful as he was as a younger player. He just he just wasn't. And, and Blake was a, still a sophomore coming off of a season where he missed most of the year with a knee injury. And so he's going to get bigger and stronger. Rocco's probably about 10 pounds heavier than Josh Lug and like four inches shorter. 
So it's it's just a he's different dense, type of body. Man. He's a dance. Yeah, so kid, yeah. I, I just think I think you'll get a little bit more physicality if that's if that's the duo. And Andrew Kristoff is a good football player. He's technically sound. He's he's in the right position. He doesn't make a lot of mistakes, but he's not really a mover in no. the run game, right? That's not really his game. His his strengths are in other areas, but it's a situation where you'd be a lot more physical. Now I don't know if you would move as well at guard. And we got to right. see Rocco continue to improve his footwork and conditioning and all that. But you'd, you'd have some movers there on the right side of the line, Ryan. I think you'd be a little more scheme specific on the right side in the sense that, like, I'm not asking Rocco Spindler to run, like, an out, a lot of outside zone, for instance. Like, that's not going to be his bag, right? Kind of the movement-based stuff. But I'll say this, Brian. Some inside zone, some duo, working with combo blocks with the right, right tackle and right guard. I mean, you're going to create a lot of movement at the point of attack, man. Like, I could just envision, like, someone's lined up in a three-tech – Rocco steps out, Blake steps down, and you just kind of blow that guy out of the uh, you know out of the hole. Maybe Blake gives him a little bit of that, you know, a little bit of the the hit toss into into Rocco, and Rocco's able to finish the block, and someone works up to the second level, right? Like that's kind of what I envision with it. So I think you said it perfectly. There is going to be some, there's going to be certain ver- types of runs that are going to be mu- going to be more successful. I think if that is the combination, right? You're talking about inside zone. You're talking about just some gap stuff, some well, power duo, stuff. Yeah. Duo is the yeah. one that yeah. could be the most impacted by ha- – if if Rocco does break out, yep. right, duo and counter to the right yes. could be the two plays where you see the biggest jump. And, and, where, he's, and, where he's blocking down and just pulling correct, someone out Because you're there. just getting a <laughs> – you're getting a – if the best – it's hard to run counter to a side where you're not getting a, a real good drive block. It, it, yes. it just is. And so if you're able to get like a good movement, even if it's just a foot of movement inside and outside with your down blocks and then your kickouts, depending on how you're blocking it, counter can be a monster play. I mean, it really can. And that's why it was so, I mean, if you remember 2015, Ryan, counter was great to the right. And it wasn't just because you had Quentin Nelson pulling to the right. That was part of it. Yeah, but you had Mike McGlinch and Steve Elmer would move people on counter. Go watch the counter play that CJ Procise had against Georgia Tech. I'm actually going to pull it up now because I because I remember this play, and I remember like Steve Elmer is is just like driving a guy. I believe it was that particular play uh, where Steve Elmer just he's like eight nine yards down the field, and you're just like okay, that's that's how counter works. And last year you weren't getting as much of that to the right side. And so counter, you know, if you're, if your backs are, ha- if your, your, your blockers are having to work laterally, then yeah, I'm watching this play. And, and so Steve Elmer he ends up losing the block late, but st- the ball snapped at the nine yard line, right? Steve Elmer drills the nose and then he drops him back and he, lo- he loses them, but he loses them at the 13. Yeah. That means the guy was in McGlinchey does a great job getting to the second level. He's blocking a linebacker. He engages a linebacker about the 13, washes him out. CJ Procise takes the counter and he stops basically at the 10 and jump cuts outside because Elmer had driven that guy to the 13. If Elmer doesn't get movement on that play, the hole is closed up at the line of scrimmage. If you can get movement on a counter play, it, you can crush people with counter. Yeah. And that's why counter was such a great play for Notre Dame in 2015. And it was great to the right. And, you know, because again, you got that movement, but you know, you know what else happened on that particular play? You had Quentin Nelson pulling around and, and, and <laughs> you know, kicking out. Now on that particular play, a guy blitzed wide and Q just got a piece of him. That's all he needed to do. And then bam, you're off to the races. So that's a play that I could say would be huge. And then of course, duo, which is just, I mean, drive blocks essentially is, is yeah. what you're asking to do on that. And, and like I said, like outside zone wouldn't be as successful in my opinion, pulling him at pulling Rocco at time, but wouldn't be that great trying to get him to the perimeter, like pull the kick out at times. Sure. Pull into the perimeter. Oh. Not as much. Yeah. You know, a play that I do think could work though, Ryan is, is yeah. if you want to pull him to the perimeter, I think buck sweep could work really effectively. Because Buck Sweep's not really meant to be an outside run. It's a stretch yep. play where he's then, you know, getting a kick right. out or something like that. But that yep. but to your point, like a toss sweep, no. No. Because <laughs> you're just not going to get him out quick enough. Uh but a a something that's more of a and that's the same like outside zone. That's mm-hmm. why I kind of like the idea of a buck sweep because you you'll have some pin he may, a lot of times on buck sweep, he's not even the one pulling, he's pinning. Yeah. You know, if you're running that to a side where you're, you're running to the tighter technique, he's pinning and Zeke Corral's getting out moving. 
you know, or you're tackling your tight end or getting out moving. So there's some things you can do, but you got to be smart about it because to your point, you don't necessarily want to have to depend on him to get out to the corner quickly yes. and get that block because you have a quick perimeter run coming. Yep. So, yeah, that's I, a good I, point. I, I still want him to stay a little condensed, like even like when we're running screens, right? Like middle screens, cool, all day, but I don't want him being the guy that has to run the alley to kick somebody out in space a ton, right? Like that's just not going to be his right. game. But to to certain certain plays – I think that Rocco could be a big asset, obviously, to being very good at certain types types of runs. Yeah. All right, let's get some more questions, Brian. I'll, I'll This will be one uh, I'll bring for you because this is an NFL draft question. Adam Blair says, Ryan, my Saints got Brian Bercy. So in the second round, do you think we should go, we should get Jalen Wyatt or Brian Branch? Where do the Saints pick in round two, Ryan? I'm not 100% sure about that. I need to go yeah. check. I'll uh, I'll check this out. NFL draft gotcha. order, two thousand twenty-three. So obviously, Ryan, I know you like the you and I both like the or it's more so you because because you follow it more. But we both yeah. like the Brian Bercy, right? Yes. Uh, yep. Um, pick for the Saints. What uh, what would you what would you say their their top need is in round two? Well, I, I think a, a secondary wide receiver to go wrong with Chris Olave. Olave obviously did a lot of good things and as his, as a rookie, went for over a thousand yards. Jalen Hyatt would be an interesting player out of Tennessee because he would bring a slightly different combination to the t- well, not slightly. He would bring a much different combination of skill set comparative to Chris Olave. Olave's got solid vertical speed or good vertical speed, but he's much more of a precision route runner, separator. That's his game. Jalen Hyatt's a I'm faster than you. I'm going to run fast you. Like he's a Ted Ginn ish type of football player with how he attacks. So I think it would be an interesting combination, Adam. I would say this though: if you said told me Jalen Hyatt and Brian Branch, for instance, like those are the two your two top guys on the board, I would always go Brian Branch there. I have maintained. I think Jalen. I think Brian Branch is a top fifteen player in this year's class. He just plays a position because the safety spot that he played for Alabama, he was basically playing more as a nickel type of thing right like they had a three safety alignments because they had Jordan Battle DeMarco Hellums and they had Brian Branch so Brian Branch is playing more nickel so I think he's been a little bit underrated through the process because you haven't seen him as much from depth but I think he's incredibly proactive great hips can play man coverage that would be my guy if those two guys were on the board but getting a secondary pass catcher to go along with the Chris Olave I, I, don't, I don't think that those, that's a wrong move especially because you have Derek Carr and you need guys that are going to be able to create some instant separation Chris Olave is one of those guys, and I think Jalen Hyatt could potentially be the vertically oriented receiver that can create some big plays. But I love Brian Branch, man. That would be my guy. They pick ninth tonight, Ryan, in second round. So okay. the Saints have an earlier one in the in the draft, so they'll have that uh, number nine overall pick. In but most no brainer pick of all time is number thirty two overall, Brian. The Pittsburgh Steelers. I would put money on it. Are going to take Joey Porter Jr. for obvious Interesting. reasons. <laughs> obvious. Yeah, reasons. I know, right. <laughs> But I mean, there's a lot of obvious obvious things last night that didn't come to uh, come to fruition. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll have to. You mean, you mean you mean like drafting the best tight end in the draft who lived 20 minutes away from your facility who grew up a Bengals fan, like like one of those types of situations. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to bring this two parter up from John A. One because I just like okay. being told that I'm right. So nice. here we go. Nice. Here's a two parter. John says, also Brian, you were right. When we spoke at the gathering before the festival, I argued transfers shouldn't have to wait a year. Now my stance is if you participate in practice or team meetings for the and for an upcoming season, you aren't eligible to play for another team without approved waiver. Yeah, I mean that's there there just there has to be that process. And again, it's not even about an unfair advantage. This is about getting young people to make smarter decisions and and trying to put enough roadblocks in front of them to say, hey, listen, you know, are you really sure about this? It also completely eliminates ta- almost almost completely eliminates tampering. It, it, it really does because you're not going to tamper for a kid that that you have to sit out a year. And as I've said before, the key to this is to put things into their into their NILs, make them contracts essentially, where both sides have to honor the contract, right? And if a school says, "Hey, we're going to promise you X amount of playing time, we're going to promise you this dorm, this jersey number, this whatever, a free Big Mac every Thursday, whatever the promises they're making to you," they have to put in writing. And if they don't honor those promises, then you are immediately allowed to to go. Or if a school wants to say, hey, listen, a school should be able to release a kid. Look, we know what's going on. Notre Dame had a situation a couple of years ago with Devin Upal, the kid, the linebacker they signed. We had a legitimate family health situation that just, and he was struggling being away from home. And Notre Dame 100% 
understood and supported his decision to leave. If that's the case, then the school should be able to sign a waiver saying, hey, we are good with him being able to go and play. Yeah. If you're going to force a kid out, then he shouldn't have to sit out a year. There's a lot of stipulations, but they're very clear stipulations. If you're just unhappy, you can transfer. No one is – there's never been a rule – well, there actually has in conferences. But, like, there's never been a rule that I've supported. And this is why I've said the previous rule is stupid. There's never been a rule, basically, that says you couldn't transfer. There, n- never, ever. The rules were that were bad were conferences could – schools could determine where you could transfer. That was wrong. A school should not be able to tell a kid where you can or can't go when he decides to leave. They have no right to do that. That was a bad rule. The other thing is, the only other rule was you have to sit out a year. Okay, so let's let's adjust that rule to not to be more helpful to kids. And as I've said before, here's a great way to do it. If a kid transfers and he sits out a year, if he stays in good academic standing, because we're supposed to still care about academics, right? If he stays in good academic standing is and is on pace to graduate before his fifth year. So even if it takes him like, you know, two summers or whatever, but if he's on pace to graduate, then, or or you could even say, let's give him a little bit more time. And by the end of his fifth, of the fall of his fifth year, if he's on pace to graduate that winter, then we'll give him an extra year. We'll give him that extra year back. So you lose that transfer year, but if you handle your business in the classroom, you'll get that year back. So, because what would happen, Ryan, is a kid would redshirt as a freshman then transfer the next year and then lose us lose that year because he already used his red shirt. The kid played as a freshman and transferred. He still has he can sit out that year, but he still has three years left because that's now your red shirt. I would say give him that year back. Right. And if kid transfers, give him that year back as long as he does what he needs to do in the classroom. So you're going to still have some tampering, but most teams aren't tampering for two years down the road. Most teams are worried about this upcoming season. You would eliminate almost all tampering if you did that. Right. And NIL tampering becomes less impactful because how valuable are you going to be sitting the bench yeah right so you want to get rid of tampering there's an easy way to do it make kids sit out a year right i mean and if you think that's a bad rule and you don't think you should have to, then don't go play college football it's not a, here's the thing that pisses me off about all this and, and the courts are responsible for a lot of this as well and the ncaa is responsible for being d-bags for 50 years right and letting it get to this point but People act like playing college football is a priv- a right. It's not a freaking right. It's a privilege. And if you don't want to live up to the things that, it, well, I don't like amateurism, fine, then go play semi-pro football somewhere. Or go try to convince the NFL to let you come now. I, go There's there's leagues in all over. Go play arena. I don't care. But playing college football is not a, pri- a right. It's a privilege. And they should have the right to set certain standards. Now, don't be D-backs about it. Right. Don't don't hammer a kid who has a YouTube channel that has nothing to do with football, but he's making money off of because of you have some stupid idea of amateurism. I'm a supporter of amateurism, but not in this ignorant way that the NCAA did it for all these years. That was ignorant. That was all about greed and power and control. That's wrong. But now we've gone so far in the opposite direction that it's equally as stupid in the opposite direction. And it's all because they don't want to do their jobs and they're afraid. Oh, if the, you know, we're going to lose lawsuits. Okay. So whatever, then just, then what are you here for? Why are you existing now at this point in time? Right. What do you do? You don't run the NCAA basketball tournament. The TV people do that. You don't run a college football playoff. The T the, the, the committee does that. The TVs do that. So what do you hear? It's like that scene from office space. What would you say you do here? Right. NC. I don't know what the NCAA does here. And, you know, it's just it's just getting stupid. It's just getting. And then these state governments are passing rules to shield their schools from NCA, you know, and it's just like, well, you guys don't have enough going on with the unemployment rate and inflation and stuff. You you don't have anything else to worry about. But freaking NIL deals for your athletes. Are you freaking serious? This is what you're worried about in state governments. Stop being stupid. This whole thing has just gotten dumb. And that's the frustrating thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's the NCA brought this on themselves by being dumb and D-bags for 50 years and screwing kids over and cheating kids. That's exactly what happens. You're going to let Justin Fields get automatic eligibility, but you're not going to Blake Blake Huffman, who's literally got – didn't he have like a mom that had like cancer or something like that? Brock Hoffman. Brock Brock Hoffman, Hoffman, right? Yeah. yeah. Luke Ford. I was going to say Luke Ford. You didn't give Luke Ford automatic eligibility, but you're going to let Justin Fields 
play right away? Are you freaking Dude, kidding me? Lou Ford's mom had cancer or something. Yes. Like that, right? Like it was like something crazy. This yeah. is what yeah. made it all so stupid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's just like, you brought this on yourselves and you've ruined the game. That's what's happened. But they need to fix it. And I don't know who has the power or the courage to do it. But yeah. it needs to get fixed because it's ruining the game. But more importantly, we are pre- we are presenting horrible, horrible examples to young people. Yeah. Hey, you don't like your current circumstance? Ah, just leave. You don't need to worry about battling through it. It's all good. We don't. We. Hey, I mean, I know a bunch of 18, 19 to twenty year olds. You know, won a world war like sixty years, eighty years ago. But it, it's cool. You guys are soft now. It, you know, just just give me a hug. It's okay. We'll hug it out, and then you can just go just go leave because life's too tough for you that you have to you know, be a backup for a year. I mean, God forbid, you know, uh, just go, just go, man. It's all good. It's all, what, what are we doing here, man? What are we doing here? Seriously. So it's so, um, it's so weird watching the draft last night, Brian, because the NFL cares so much about tampering. And then the NCAA cares absolutely nothing, nothing. about tampering. It doesn't make any sense. I'm like, shouldn't the NCAA who is overseeing a bunch of young adults care more about tampering than the adults in the room? Like I don't know, man. It just seems very backwards thinking to me in that regard. It's but because so you're dumb, supposed you're, so, you're supposed to be setting an example and a standard for young kids coming up, right? I mean, we are talking right. about 17 to 22 year olds here, right? Like guys that are still growing and still maturing, and you're just like, eh, do whatever you want. Who cares? I mean, and <laughs> like, look, you okay. have a lot of former college athletes saying that they think this portal stuff. I mean, even Tyron Matthew was on there, like who's a younger guy. I mean, he's not like a 60 year old that you know, 70 year old is like, well, in my day, you know. I mean, like, like, seriously, college athletes left their schools in the 40s to f- freaking fight in a war. Yeah. Do you understand? Notre Dame sacrificed two years of college football amongst many other teams to fight in a freaking war. And we can't ask kids to be a effing backup for a year because it's too hard on them. Their coach yelled at them. He was mean to them. So I got to leave. Give me a freaking break. And it just, and, and, but that's what we're, that's, but you know what? Coaches do it. I'm going to go be a running backs coach somewhere else. Cause I'm getting a hundred thousand dollar pay raise. Well, forget loyalty. I know I convinced this kid to come play for me for four years and I promise I'd be here, but nah, I'm going to pay raise. I'm going to go over here. It's not just the kids, yeah. right? No, it's not. So there are things you can do to protect the players when that happens. If coaches are going to be D bags, that's fine. When you leave though, here's the thing. Kids can go in the portal and transfer right away, but they can't come to your. They can't follow you. Can't follow you, you you because if they and if they do, they got to sit out a year. You can follow Lincoln Riley to to USC. That's cool, but you got to sit out a year. That's the reality of it, right? But if you can transfer somewhere else and play right now, because your head coach left, you know, and you know that's that's how I look at it. But it's 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 gotten sad. It really has because we've just gone in such an opposite direction of of where we were. And I'm just hoping someday we can kind of meet in the middle and say, there's a way to make this right where NIL is a phenomenal thing for student athletes. NIL at its foundation is tremendous yes. for young people if done right. Yeah. And if they're protected, but the problem is the NCAA and the schools, they don't want to protect these kids. They want to get their peace back. Yeah. Right. What are some of the reasons that these schools are mad about NIL? Because their donors are not giving them money anymore. They're giving it to the collectives. That's what they're mad about. That's what they're mad about. So they want to get their peace. It's not about protecting. It's not about saying, let us be involved so we can make sure that these kids aren't getting screwed over and they don't have agents asking for 30% when in reality, agents should only be asking for five. Right? It, but that's not what they're worried about. They're not worried about protecting the kids. They're worried about getting their cut. And that's what's so sad about it. It, it just it disgusts me because we don't have enough people that care enough about what's right to be able to say, hey, I know this is going to hurt us in the end, but this is what's right. This is what's right for the game, and this is what's right for young people. And sometimes what's right for young people, Ryan, your daughter doesn't want to go to bed. Yes. Oh, just all let her time. stay up. Let, let's let her stay up. It's a, And now all of a sudden you've got a one-year-old that just thinks she can set all the rules. No, you're going to go to bed because yep. she may not like it, but you know this is what's best for her. I understand how important it is for sleep for a young child or what you no know, why it's important to give them certain foods and feed them certain things, even though she wants to have cookies all the time. Right? But now we're just letting kids just decide whatever they want. It, it's insanity. It's like I, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone sometimes. I really do. 
But anyway, that's my rant. Sorry, guys. I know it's been a while since I've had a really good rant, so I just I needed to get there that off go, my man. chest. So sorry, sorry about that. Sorry Everyone about that. needs one occasionally. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Question from Sean Green. Don't want to give it too much shine, but what is your thought on fans saying overreacting to these portal ethics as signs of a sinking ship? Rather than it's just the talent pool is rising. I just think it's just um, there's there's mul- there's not one reason for it, right, Ryan? I mean, there's multiple yeah. reasons for it. For some people, it's just they're just always negative and looking for something to be upset about. That's some people. We live Brother- in a hyperbolic world as well. Oh yeah. So it's like oh yeah. Oh, it's just thinking- the other. Oh my yeah. God, backups don't want to be backups because they got beat out by better players. This means Marcus Freeman sucks. You know, no, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, for some people, I think it's an adjustment to what the portal is like. If we're being honest, uh, Notre Dame now has backup players that are desirable for other big time schools, right? Think about it. Notre Dame's backup quarterback just got pursued by Alabama. And people are upset about that as if somehow Notre Dame is screwed. Notre Dame's number two running back is being pursued by Alabama, LSU, schools like that. And people are like acting as if like this is some major problem. Number one, Alabama went through that, but Alabama went through that in January. They yeah. lost a starting offensive lineman to Miami, right? Georgia won a national championship, and their leading receiver went into the portal and went to Alabama. And their defensive right? tackle just left the USC. Exactly. Right? Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this is happening everywhere. This is what – because what it is is Marcus Freeman's raised the game quite a bit, right, with the way that they've recruited and the competition. There's no more entitlement. Like, hey, Lorenzo, you're getting pushed by these young bucks. That's just a fact. Right. And you're not acting in a way that 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 should make us think that you've deserved anything more and you want to leave, leave. You know, Tyler, you battled your butt off. We want you to stay, but if you want to try to go battle somewhere else, go do what you got to do. And I'm gonna go coach up Steve and Kenny and get ready for the CJ Carr era. Right. That's what college football is now when you have players that other teams want. Yeah. I, I just it's the reality of it. So is it I I I don't want any of those kids to leave. Would well. I don't want Tyler. I didn't want Tyler and Logan to leave. Didn't necessarily want Prince to leave because he's a great special teams player. But he was literally a backup linebacker that was being challenged by younger players to even be a backup anymore. Do you guys understand that? It was not a given that a healthy Prince Collie doesn't get beat out by Jalen Snead and Nolan Ziegler. Ziegler. It's, it was not. It was, and it was actually likely that he was going to get beat out by them. So think about that. He's a top hundred recruit. Yeah, who got beat out by? Another top hundred recruit, right? And another guy that I graded as a as a as a uh, a top one fifty guy with borderline five star upside in Nolan Ziegler, right? That's what happens when you recruit big time players. Oh, and by the way, you got Drake yeah. Bowen and Jaden Osbury breaking down your throat, who are two more top fifty football players on my board. I, I think I think that was the best part of the twenty twenty three class, Brian, is that that was such a balanced class, right? Yeah. Like it wasn't like a lot of big gaps at positions, right? So I think that's what people are missing a little bit now. It's like. Because there used to be like clear hierarchies, right? It's like that guy is clearly our best player at this position, but number two is like there's clear separation there, right? Like they're not really in the same talking point or in the same class. Yeah. Now it's like you are – with how you're recruiting and the fact that you are being a, a balanced recruiting, getting mm-hmm. positions – I mean, even though they lost two safeties late technically in the process this past year in 2023 sure. – you still hit all your numbers, right? You still got two safeties. You still got two corners. You still got three linebackers. You still got four defensive linemen, five offensive linemen. You still you, you still make that happen, right? So when someone comes in, when you have that type of balance, guys, like we're going to have to get used to this. There's going to be talented yeah. players that are going to transfer at times because they're going against other talented players. That's just right. like there's not as much clear separation between hierarchy one and hierarchy two. Like there's just the separation is is loose is is leaving right. now. It's not the same as it once was. The the other part of it too, Ryan, is uh, he, now here's where I will say when you start seeing this happen, get worried. This is this is what I'll say. There's two instances where I would generally say if this happens, it's not just ah, it's just part of the deal. You yeah. start seeing mass exodus from one position, like we sure. saw at receiver a couple years ago. We lost five kids over the course of a calendar year. That's a problem. The other one is you start seeing starters who aren't being challenged leaving. That's a problem. That's not what's happening here. Literally not a single kid that left was going to start. And the closest to it was Logan Diggs. You could you could make the case that Logan Diggs was going to be 1B. Co-starter, you you yeah. could absolutely right. make that case, and, and that's valuable. But he didn't want to be 1B. He wanted to be 1. 
and he was going to be he was closer to two than he was going to be one B this coming upcoming year. That's the closest thing to it, and that's a kid who's been looking to transfer since he got here. But you know, Lorenzo Styles was people like no way Lorenzo's going to be no. yeah he was he was behind Tobias Merriweather, Deion Colsey, Jaden Thomas, and Chris Tyree. That was obvious to any pra- go to any practice that you went to this year, and that was blatantly obvious that he was not he was. And the other thing was obvious was he better start playing better or number 17 is going to pass him up too, Rico Flores. Now, I'm not saying Lorenzo left because of that. I'm not. I'm just simply saying, okay, leave, right? Like they're going to be fine because they have the, because of the way that they've recruited and developed the players that they have. And so, you know, those are the two circumstances, mass exodus from a position or now there's always times when a transfer leaving, even if it's not an indicative problem of the program, can be dangerous if it's like a situation where your numbers aren't great. Like let's just say, you know, I don't know, a freshman safety was just homesick and he left. Yeah. That'd be problematic yeah. because you're not good on numbers, but it doesn't mean that Marcus Freeman's program is a sinking ship. Right. Mass exodus, right, from a position or multiple positions, and you start losing starters, that's when you say these kids don't want to be here. That that's that's when you worry. Sinking ship is more what kind of what we're seeing in Texas A and M this past off yes. season, right? Where you're just like, guys are just leaving, man. Like that's right. just point. Like they're just leaving. <laughs> just and it's a high number. The Colorado one, I think there's a little bit of context with that, right? Because it's right. like those a lot of those kids were expected to leave because and they were Dion told to literally leave. told <laughs> them like you're out of here, man. <laughs> right, you're going to be out of here at some point, right? So that's a right. little bit more of a weird context. Like some of those Texas A and M kids that lost left this off season. You guys think that Jimbo wanted all those kids to leave? Absolutely not. There's a lot, a lot of talented football players that left Texas A&M, but that may be more coined as a sinking ship just because they're losing and they're not turning that corner and they're not taking that step. That's that's a troubling area for me. Right. So, again, I'm I'm not happy that most of these guys transferred. I, three of the four kids we've talked about, I wish they were still at Notre Dame. It's just one of those things where you have to be reasonable and rational about why they left and what that means. And in this instance, I think it has nothing to do. Cause again, Logan's been a guy that's been threatening to leave since he got here. Yeah. I mean, and it doesn't have anything to do with Mark. It, and if anything, it's like, I don't think Logan has any ill will towards anyone at Notre Dame. I just think he wasn't like my sister, for example, went away to college. And well, I mean, went away. She went like four hours away and she didn't handle it well. She just, and she still lives in the same town as my parents. Right. It's, it's doesn't mean my sister's one of the toughest people I know. She just didn't like being away from home. It doesn't make her soft or anything else like that. It just, she just didn't like being away from home. She likes the ability to have family around. And now that she's a mom, she likes to be able to have cousins and stuff like that for, it doesn't make her soft. Yeah. It just means I just rather be close to my family. Doesn't Logan Diggs want to go back home. Doesn't want to be far. It doesn't make him soft. It just means he's just more comfortable back home and around his family. I mean, it doesn't make him soft. It just means that's his personality. For me, I've lived all over the country. I miss my family incredibly. But this is just what I felt I needed to do. It doesn't make me tougher than my sister who decided she didn't want to go away. It just means they're just different, just different personalities, different desires, different wishes. And it has nothing to do with, I'm, I, I haven't lived near my parents in 15, 16 years. I love my family. I talk to my dad and mom all the time. Doesn't mean I don't like miss them. It doesn't mean I don't have a relationship with them. It just means uh, I just have other things that I'm doing. Right. And so um, I just, I, it doesn't mean that, that I have that the fact that I went away from home doesn't mean that I don't have a good relationship with my parents. And the fact that my sister says doesn't mean that she has a great one with them. Right. It just means it's just part of life. And it doesn't mean that Marcus Freeman is not able to run the program the way that he wants. And, and that's just the reality of it. And so, and as, as I've said, in some instances, some of the departures have been, let's, let's be honest about that. Some yeah. of them are, um, you're, you're okay with it. You're okay. Yeah. With it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not talking about even me. I'm talking about Notre Dame's. No, staff. no. Yes. Yes. Like as yeah. a staff. And, and Logan Diggs is not one of those. He's not yes. one of those. I, they, I think they wanted Logan to stay. The same with um, um, Tyler. Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, you know, that's just the reality of it. But these kids are going to find out. Yeah, you're closer to home, but that's a fan base that. Uh, whew, it's a little different. If you think Notre Dame kids are tough or Notre Dame fans are tough on you. Wait till you throw a pick or fumble a ball in the SEC and see what that's see what that's like. Seriously, man. Seriously. Yeah. 
have fun with that. We did have a couple of super chats that I wanted to get to, Ryan. So we have nice. a, we have a couple of those. Rob Osgood said, missed the show yesterday. Please add. Thank you so much for that, Rob. Yeah, really we'll do appreciate do. that. We'll do. We have a super sticker from Golden Domer. I appreciate that. And then, Pete, this is one of my favorite new favorite avatars. Do you know who Pete Weber is, Ryan? The bowler? Uh, the bowler, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what's he say? He's like, who, who do you think I am? Or so, yeah. what was, what's the thing he said? <laughs> Something it was, like that, it was yeah. so funny, yeah. He's yeah. an interesting cat, man. He's the <laughs> T.O. of bowling. I love me some me. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, he has a super chat. It's That's not him, but the guy yes. uses his name in Avatar. It's not the actual Pete Weber. And Pete Weber says, and if it is I, the actual Pete Weber, I expect a lot bigger super chats than four ninety nine because that guy's <laughs> made a lot of freaking money bowling. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, it's probably the best bowler of all time, right? I think he's I, in the conversation. I, yeah, he's yeah. certainly the most uh, flamboyant. That's for sure. <laughs> Pete Weber says, I noticed that Bryce Young had smaller shoulder pads than most quarterbacks. Will Tyler Buckner have access to these smaller pads? It would help his throwing motion. Well, it would. It, it, I, I don't necessarily. I think. I think Ty. ty I think Bryce Young just has a little bit narrow shoulders. Yeah, he's, <laughs> just a a <laughs> he's just a small guy. I don't think. I mean, I don't think Tyler Buckner had small shoulder pads. I mean, um, I, yeah, I don't. I don't think he had small shoulder pads. I shoulder pads were normal size. I don't think that they're any smaller than Bryce Young's. But I think St- Tyler Buckner's um, style of play is going to require him to not get any smaller than what he has. And number two, his shoulder pads have nothing to do with his throwing motion. At yeah. all, yeah. I mean, quarterback pads are meant for to allow you to have a full range of motion as a thrower. So those have nothing to do with his throwing motion. That throwing motion is something he developed during a year in which he could not put on shoulder pads. So it has nothing to do with uh, the shoulder pads at all. Yep. And a super chat from Tyler Evans. Actually, Tyler, thank you can, so much. I can go yes. and read this one, Ryan, since this is a draft okay. one for you, there, buddy. Tyler Evans, thank you for the Super Chat. He asks, what was the biggest shock last night at the draft, in your opinion? I, I mean, I think the biggest shock is that Will Levis didn't get picked in the first round for me. I was I was I was foregone conclusion that that the NFL was going to draft Will Levis in the first round, Brian. Like I had no doubt in my mind that it was going to happen. That was a massive shock. If you're asking me what's the biggest shock of a pick, I'll let you think about that. I'll say this, Ryan. I'm yeah. also shocked that Will Levis didn't get didn't get picked in the first round. I thought he was going yeah. to get picked too. I just was bothered by it. Yeah. Because I just don't and I have I know it can come across as like venom to Will Levis. It's not. I don't think against the kid. I kind of make fun of the mayo and the coffee thing. It's all in good fun. <laughs> I just don't think he's a very good quarterback and don't think he's a first round pick. I've said this before. I'm not taking him in the first round. I don't even know if I'd take him around two. But, you know, um I I mean I pick. So I'm I'm certainly Certainly surprised that he was not picked last night. There's no doubt about yeah. it. Can, can I say, I, Tyler? I think I think a pick that started a lot of chaos, in my opinion, was Chicago Bears were on the clock at number nine. They trade with the Philadelphia Eagles. The Philadelphia Eagles move up one spot to draft Jalen Carter, and then with Peter Skaronski and Broderick Jones both on the on the board, the Chicago Bears went Darnell Wright. And up until that point, Brian, I was like, this is a pretty normal draft so far. I'm like, all these picks make good sense. And then Darnell Wright got picked at 10. And then I was like, wow, things just went off the rails, brother. Yeah. Like things like 10 to 25. It was like, that was something. I was just like, I don't know what I just watched 10 to 25 right now. Like it went and then it normalized at the end of the 20s because then we started seeing sure. Brian Brissy and yeah. Miles Murphy. And, Although and I'll say like four, 24, 25, 26 was a little wild. Yes. Like when the Giants traded up, everything I'd been told before the draft was they're going to trade up and take – they wanted Michael Mayer. So then they yeah. trade up and I'm thinking, oh, I literally – Ryan, I joked with you last night, but like I literally started writing the New York Giants draft Michael Mayer story <laughs> at that time. I literally was writing that. And then they take my, my, my – not that it wasn't my, a need, but just everything we'd heard was they're going to – they want they really like Michael Mayer. They had to position yeah. themselves to move up to make sure somebody else didn't leap them. And think, oh, here, here it comes. Here's the Michael Mayer selection. And they went corner. And it was kind of – kind of shocking and then you know, the cowboys sit there at 26 and you're thinking well wait, of course they Mossy love michael smith. mayer and they take yeah. freaking mozzie smith yeah they got a little That's nutty weird. there but then it's it's it calmed down those last there's some tell you what man this is why this is why good teams are good because they make smart choices and the Bengals, yes. as much as i would have loved to see them draft michael mayer it was a, it was a great pick in my opinion taking yeah it was a very good pick got a top 10 talent at 28 yes you know um 
at, at a premium position too as right. a defensive end as a pass rusher to your point right it's like yeah it's a, it ended up still being a very good pick for them I, I just think, man, that during a right pick just started a little bit of chaos yeah. there in the teens. I'm just yeah. like, well, this is going off the rails a little bit now, man. But to your point, like there was still 25, 26. And funny enough, I mean, you know Joe DeLeon. He has, he's mm-hmm. pretty plugged into the New York Giants side of everything, right? And mm-hmm. he also thought that that pick was coming up for Michael Mayer. Like he 100% yeah. thought it was that, and then yeah. it didn't happen, man. It was weird. Weird, yeah, but. I was I was uh I know you were a little surprised that that the Redskins the Redskins the Washington took Emmanuel Forbes with Christian Gonzalez on the board and uh that was a little surprising. Quentin Johnson Johnston was a, a little sort of shocker for me because with the yeah. other especially with the other receivers that were still on the board. And then the Deontay Banks one was a shocker, not because of the player, but because of all the expectations that we had. So it was yeah. um it, it and I think the the biggest shock for me of the uh, the the faller the fallers is I'm I'm shocked that Will Levis fell out of the first round. Although he should have, you know, and then Mayer. Mayer, Mayer yeah. shock, and then also Nolan Smith falling all the way down to thirty was a shocker for me. I just yeah. I just assumed that the NFL was going to freak out about the combine stuff and the fact that he went to Georgia. You know, yeah. I mean that was I, that was the thing I, for me. I think I finally have a very cohesive understanding of what the NFL likes and doesn't like, Brian. And then the second corner off the board is 166 pounds. You know, I'm like, oh, correct. Didn't, correct. didn't see that one coming. I didn't think that they right. would value him in that spot. I mean, and I, then, I, I like and the then Tampa Bay but... takes a six foot, 280 pound D tackle with short arms <laughs> with it's... sub 31 inch arms, which historically yeah. is, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The next guy that dominates at that size will be the first guy in this modern era that dominates at yeah, that size. Yeah, man. So, it's like Carlo Kemp, Colby Whitlock. Like, oh yeah, there yeah. was a, who's the one guy on there? I was like, oh wow, that guy had short. I, I'm trying to remember who that was, but yeah, it was a it was a wild night. It was a it fun was, night, man. I had a blast doing yeah. that. I'm glad that we did that. It was yeah. a lot of fun. And you did great last night, by the way, Ryan. That was oh, excellent. thank you so much. I, I actually, I'll be honest with you. I kind of joked to my wife. I said I'm a little nervous. I hope that like nobody from like ESPN or some major draft <laughs> network watches that show last night because then I might not have an employee anymore. Uh, you, you, you did a great job last night, man. Thank uh, you, man. Appreciate it. We got a super chat here from uh, from AST one two three two one. He says I caught the Colleen uh, clues, but Diggs blindsided me. Didn't catch those clues at all. Uh, you're, you're not alone. A lot of people didn't catch them. We just made a couple comments about. Wouldn't be, you know, running back might something might happen to running back. You know, if this were to happen, you know, let's just say hypothetically Diggs were to leave. I think I said that a couple of times last week. Um, I you know, obviously the clues weren't very strong because you you more people didn't catch the clues than caught the clues, to be honest with you. So clearly I didn't um I didn't lay them on thick enough. But I was also shocked that people were shocked by Diggs leaving just because forget the clues. I'm shocked that of all the players on the team, I thought he'd be the least surprised, the, the guy that would least shock people that he's leaving with just his history at Notre Dame of constantly being a, con- a potential transfer candidate. I, I think it was because he just had a productive year, man. And they were like, okay, why would he leave anymore? Right? Right. Like he's not like barely playing and stuff. That's dumb. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then exactly. uh, Kirk D.A. Anderson Fitness. Thank you, Kirk. He also said the same thing. Love the show regarding the hints. We're not all Sherlock Holmes, including myself. Apparently, you guys needed to be because uh, I wasn't laying the hints out strong enough, obviously, uh, for that one. But uh, I do I do apologize. I'll try to get a little bit better with my hints moving forward uh, in those kind of things. Uh, Kenny Moore said, uh, Brian and Ryan, salute to you guys for crushing the show last night. I didn't crush Thanks, anything. Man. I just set him up. Right. That's all pretty much what we did. But uh, yeah, Ryan, you did a did a great job last night. I appreciate it. And uh, he, here's one I'll, I'll um, um, from Shane O'Day. So we'll get back on track now. Yep. Shane says, thanks for the great draft coverage last night. First draft, I didn't have to listen to ESPN's coverage, which is good for my sanity. Yes. I heard Mel Kuyper was off the off his rocker last night, by the way, but that's another conversation. Yeah, somebody said something like he's like Michael Mayer wasn't like a heavily recruited guy or highly ranked guy or something stupid uh, like that. And I was like, yeah, I guess a five-star yeah. tight end is – I kept seeing yeah. people in the chat and on Twitter that were just like, uh, Mel Kuyper just needs to stop. And I'm just like, oh, I don't know what he did, but okay. No. With Logan Diggs gone, does this mean Notre Dame will take two running backs in the 2024 class? Shane, that is that is the that yeah. is what they are aiming to do. Yes, they obviously they, they have a commitment from Aeneas Williams. They're still targeting both Kedron Young and Anthony Carey for hopefully for that second spot. So to me, Ryan, it's it Logan Diggs leaving doesn't change anything because I think the staff was already working with the pos the strong possibility that they were both going to be gone after this year anyway. So I think that's partly why that they were kind of looking at that as a second yep. back uh, in this class. I just think they wanted to be smart about who that second back 
is at least early on. And then if a second, if they both leave, then you could try to go maybe get somebody later in the process. Yeah. But I think that's kind of, uh, that's kind of where, um, that's been going for a while. That's Kedron Young and Anthony Carey. Now, what you may see, what you may see is them expand the board a little bit, but, you know, keep my eye out on the portal for the right kind of fit, you know, kind of guy. So I would, I would do something like that. Um, that's kind of where I would be if Notre Dame. Um, I, yeah. I, th- I think this is going to regulate itself pretty quick, though, Brian, because, I mean, even if Aldrich leaves after this year, you'll have three scholarship running backs and potentially two more in the 2024 class if everybody comes back. So you'll be back up to five at that point, right? So mm-hmm. that number is going to regulate itself pretty quick. Yeah. All right. Let's get back to uh, – we got here one from John A1. Um, this is an interesting one, Ryan. And John says, did Logan Diggs' departure open up open a potentially better complementary diverse skill set to what Audric Estime brings? It's a very interesting question. It, it did. And, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna read you something that that I'm gonna have an article uh coming out here. And this is something that I wrote in the article that I have not published yet, and it speaks to what you talked about. And it's it's just I kind of go through the different players and I said uh um let me find that part here real quick. Let's see here. Um, a healthy price gives this is Jerry Price gives Notre Dame a much different type of complement to estimate. You would have a true thunder and lightning combination as opposed to estimate Diggs combo, which was two players with more similar styles, more thunder and thunder. An argument could be made that a healthy price gives Notre Dame an even better one-two punch than what it had last season with the estimate Diggs duo. There's no doubt that Diggs is a talented runner, but Price outplayed him last spring and is a more dynamic athlete. It's not an argument that that is about Price being better than Diggs, as is about when I think that he is, but it, as it's about Price providing a better complementary style to Diggs. So, John, spot on. And, and I'm going to have that in an article, and I think that can't be dismissed. But it's also not something that's like, oh, Logan Diggs sucked. It's not that at all. They were a dynamic one-two punch, and you, you know, I had said we think that, that that is one of the best, five best one-two punches in college football. This next one-two punch won't be as proven, but if Jadarian Price is healthy, it could be better. And that's just yeah. part of – I mean, it's not a shot at Logan Diggs. It's just – it's not, I prefer two different types of players in, 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 when you talk about backfield combinations. I just think it, for, it fits better because otherwise the defense – like when a Logan Diggs and Audric Estime are in the game, the defense doesn't have to adjust to either one of them. They should have had to adjust to Chris Tyree, but Notre Dame didn't use him correctly. Having a guy in there that says, hey, we're all prepared for duo. You just ran duo up our behinds that entire last series, but now you've put so-and-so in the game, and now you're running counter and buck sweep and you know, and then running inside zone at us, and it's just like now we've got to completely call this game differently. And I think that can make life a lot tougher on a defense in my opinion. So. Well, that, that's I, I would, a good point. I would say it like this for people that have watched the NFL over the years. It's like for me, Brian, it's like if I have a team that has both, let's say, Jamal Lewis and Deuce McAllister, right, where they're both really good power backs, really physical guys, does that scare you more, though, than if Jamal Lewis had Chris Johnson with him instead, where it's like that is a completely different style of back. Now we're talking about one power back with one pure speed guy working together rather than two just – sturdy power backs again it doesn't but in a vacuum that doesn't make deuce McAllister less of a good football player it doesn't make less jamal lewis less of a good football player it doesn't make chris chris johnson less of a good football player it's just different and i think right. different is kind of the conversation there yep yep it is so let's get uh let's let's get to some more here ryan we got we got a lot of good questions today yep from coach bent 574 Even with the higher level of teaching and recruiting being done under the staffs of Coach Marcus Freeman versus Brian Kelly's, what are some fundamentals that you think still think Notre Dame is lacking to be a championship program? That's a good question. I I, I think obviously we still don't know about quarterback development. And if Notre Dame goes out this year and Sam Hartman lights the world on fire and, and he's phenomenal, even if they don't win a championship, it's not like, hey, quarterback development has arrived. Gino Gadulli still has to prove that he can develop a guy at Notre Dame that isn't already developed. I mean, that, that and, and Sam Hartman playing well doesn't necessarily answer that because he was so productive beforehand. Even if Notre Dame wins a title, it's like, well, are they going to be able to win another one without getting a transfer quarterback? I mean, we don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. So I feel the first thing that still pops in my head is still quarterback development. And, and it's going to be harder for Notre Dame to do what Lincoln Riley did at Oklahoma, where he just 
got a transfer, had a different transfer every year because the transfers he got were not grad transfers. They were younger guys. I mean, uh, Baker Mayfield wasn't a grad transfer. Kyler Murray wasn't a grad transfer. Jalen Hurts was, but, uh, and then obviously his quarterback now at at USC was an undergrad transfer who came with him from Oklahoma. So we, we don't know that they can develop quarterbacks still. Now, again, I'm not blaming Gino Gadouli for the sins of the past, but I'm also not someone who just assumes that he's going to do the, the job better. He has to prove it just like everybody else has to prove it. It's, it's an idea. So, it's an idea. And, and, I, and I still yeah. think that they need to up the defensive line recruiting. I think the defensive line has a chance to be pretty good this year, but the defensive line to me is not going to be the kind of group that goes out there and, and can put a team on its shoulders the way in which – the Georges have done the way Bama used to do, uh, the way that uh, that I think Notre needs to. Time. Right, yeah. they yeah. they 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 need to continue to upgrade that position, in my opinion, with a, a couple just a couple more dynamic players, and and they're getting closer. I mean, last year's D line class was pretty darn good, it, but it's not there yet. It was a lot of low floor, high ceiling guys. This year's class is off to a good start, but you got to finish. I mean, you got to get Justin Scott. You know, you've got to get some some impact guys. And and finish that on an credit on a really high note, and then twenty five, you know, you you need to continue to go out there and get big time players. And so I just think stacking some D line classes on top of each other, like you're about to do at receiver, is the way to go. But I mean, I think receiver recruiting is up a ton. Yes. I think the way that they've salvaged running back recruiting right now is outstanding. I think offensive line recruiting is a question mark with Joe Rudolph. But up until now, I mean, one thing about Jeff Quinn, there's a lot of things to complain about, but he didn't leave Harry Heastan with a, a bare cupboard. When it comes to talent now i mean the, the yeah. roster wasn't necessarily built correctly with too many inside guys but harry he stand didn't fix that in his one year of recruiting right but you're still getting pretty good players corner recruiting has been phenomenal under mike mickens linebacker recruiting up until this year has been phenomenal right now it's a big question mark but there's a potential class out there that notre dame has a shot to get that could just say okay they're still rolling you know, they don't need Marcus Freeman to be the linebacker coach anymore. If they go out there and get Chris Cole and Kingston, Filiama Asa and Bodie Cahoon, I'm like, okay, they're still rolling, you know, and, and this year, which is not a great linebacker year. Yeah, that's that's pretty flipping good. And and then the other one that I'm, is still a big question mark is safety. Like yes. Safety is a giant question mark. Can Chris O'Leary coach? Yes, no doubt. Can Chris O'Leary recruit right now? The answer is no. He's not a very good recruiter right now. He struck out in 22. Last year, he in 23, he got, you know, Don Schuler and Ben Minich. Nice job. And then right now, they don't have anybody. And I hope that that changes, and I think that'll change. But as of right now, that's still a giant question mark. So I think those are the areas right now, Ryan, that I say talent acquisition needs to get better. And, and of course, I mean, with Jared Parker, I, I'm, I, I'm very cautiously optimistic about what Jared Parker's going to do. And we have a question about him a little bit, so I'm not going to address it too much. But he's still got to go out and prove it. They still got to prove that he's a coordinator capable of, of leading a championship caliber offense. And now Golden's got to prove he's capable of leading a championship caliber defense. So there's still some question marks there. It's just I think that there's potential pl- people in place to to answer those questions uh, in, in a positive manner. Right. Yeah, I, I think defensive line for me was the biggest one that I you know I would I that kind of came to my mind quickly was just you're getting good talent in, but to your point, the players that you're attracting at least from 2023 were guys that you have to develop properly. You have to. So you're betting on yourself a little bit as a coach to take on that much low floor, high upside talent. Can Al Washington get the most out of them? I certainly hope so, but that's a question mark until we're proven there, right? So I, I need to see what the defensive line starts to look like over the next couple of years, but I think it could get there. It's just a question of how quickly and will it ever get there? We'll see. Yeah. All right, good good question. Let's get a two-parter here from Rob Osgood, right? Rob says, I have seen so many negative comments about the draft and Notre Dame. XYZ has two draft picks. ABC has four, so on and so on. Just wait for our sophomore and freshman classes. Get ready for the draft. Next year, Joe Alt and some others will make the case for the NFL draft, the NFL draft picks. The future is bright, but it does not, but it does take time. Not overnight. I am excited to see this draft in two to four years. Yeah, I, I get where you're coming from, Rob, but I think there's just a little bit more to it than that. I think part of it is that we talk about the Ohio State quarterback thing. Well, I think the Notre Dame tight end thing is a legitimate thing as well. I mean, Notre Dame's had a lot of tight ends picked high recently, and, and not all of them, Tyler Eifert didn't pan out. Now it's injuries, right? Cole Komet's been good, but it took him three years to 
to really start to make an impact. And even then he was good, but he wasn't great. Yeah. You know, Tommy Tremble hasn't panned out. Durham Smythe's been okay, but good I fine, mean, yeah. as a yeah. rotation guy, I mean, it's not like any of these Notre Dame time. I mean, Kyle Rudolph was good, but he got picked all the way back in 2010 and he wasn't great. He was just good. You Too know, hard. John Carlson was just solid, then injury. I mean, John Carlson actually was probably off to one of the better starts and then he got hurt. Anthony Fasano was just kind of okay. You know, so maybe that's something that's factoring in too, on top of the tight end position for some odd reason, starting to I hear people like talking down the importance of the tight end position all of a sudden. And I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, you know, but but that's another part of it too, guys, is, you know, why would you trust a Notre Dame defensive lineman? What's your evidence that Notre Dame produces defensive linemen that you'd want on your football team? Right? I mean, there isn't a whole lot of that. And look, the NFL, are, they're not infallible people. They fall into that trap too. That's why I've said this before, Ryan. If you go look and you compare the number of, of SEC players picked in the first round and compare that to the number of SEC players that make all pro in a given period of time, the draft produces a lot more SEC first rounders than it does NFL all pros from the, yeah. it just does. Because there's this perception that, well, the SEC is where all the best players are, right? Well, okay. There, there, there's some truth to that. But it's also inflated in why you see so many SEC guys get overdrafted. Like, remember the guy from uh, Kentucky a couple years ago? And I remember you were like, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't Who's pick this, this guy. What position? The linebacker from Kentucky. Oh, oh Jared. Um, Jamin Jay- Davis or Jamin something like Jamin Davis. That, right? Jamin Davis, yeah. And you're yeah. like, don't do it. Don't do it. This kid, don't is he's it. not that guy. But what a SEC linebacker with crazy combine Testing. numbers. And yeah. what's he done in the NFL? Nothing, yeah. right? So you see that happen a lot more with SEC guys, whereas other conferences have to kind of prove it a little bit. Why are you seeing Iowa defensive linemen getting drafted right now? Why? Because you're seeing Iowa defensive linemen go to the NFL and be productive yeah, and, and good football players. So they're willing to say, well, you know what? The track record of, of when I see this kid on film and, and I compare it to other guys, those similar guys have gone to the NFL and been good football players. I mean, and, I didn't even think Iowa linebackers are one that even makes sense, right? I mean, like even – I mean, you talk about Chad Greenway was a little bit back now, but you talk about, you know, Josie Jewell's been a good football player in the NFL when he's been healthy. There was that other – who was the other Will linebacker they had a little bit before Josie? It's it's not it's not imperative to this conversation, but, like, they've, they've developed some linebackers over the years, so that's right. why you're comfortable taking Jack Campbell at the 18th right. overall selection if you're a team because you're like, Iowa – does a pretty good job with developing right. linebackers historically. Like they do a good right. job. Defensive players under Phil Parker, this includes the secondary, have gone to the NFL and largely been pretty quality football players to some degree. Notre Dame hasn't done that as well. They just haven't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And why is Notre Dame? Notre Dame's had multiple offensive linemen get a little bit overdrafted, in my opinion. Nick Martin, Mike McGlinchey, but why? Because people see what the Notre Dame guys end up going and doing in the NFL, right? Track and record. so yeah. when Harry Heastan was the coach. And it's, um, you know, it, it, I'll say this. If, if Harry Heastan was still at Notre Dame from 18 to 21 or from 20, Liam Meikenberg's first-round pick. There's no doubt in my mind Liam Meikenberg's first-round pick. Somebody would have picked him because of the Harry Heastan pedigree. Flat out. That's why Mike McGlinchey went ninth. Yeah. Right. And so uh, that's all part of it. And Notre Dame right now is suffering because of that. So it's not just about they've got to win more on the field and they need some of these guys that go to the NFL to produce. And I don't care where they're picked. And that's, you know, that's that's part of it, too. I mean, there's a reason. Like, guys, does anyone think that that Georgia has 15 guys picked last year if that same team went eight and four? There's no way. There's no way. But they have 15 I hate, guys I, get picked. I hate to harp on the Michael Mayer thing again, but does is anybody truthfully think that Michael Mayer is not a first round player? Like, does anyone actually believe that? I, I, I don't Apparently, know. the NFL does. I mean, that's right. the crazy part about the, per- it, the perception is there for sure. Right. Yeah, perception's there for some reason. I yeah. hope he just makes everyone like pay for it. I just, I really it, hope that he does. Is there any doubt that Michael Mayer is going to do that, man? Like, that I, kid is I one know. of the most competitive dudes I've ever yeah. seen. <laughs> like, he's so competitive. Yeah, you, man. you guys just, you're about to unleash a pissed off Michael Mayer onto the NFL. I don't have know. Yeah. fun with that. <laughs> Goodness gracious. All right. Question from Robert Klaska. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. In your recent discussion about Notre Dame players get drafted too high or too low, opinion on Kyle Hamilton. I thought he was drafted too low. 
Yeah, number 14 not, overall. Not astronomically. I mean, he's still a top 15 yeah. overall pick, but he, he, he should have been, been, been a top 10 pick. Should have been a top 10 pick. I, Robert, he was that, – that's my, that's my frustration with the Michael Mayer thing this year is that Michael Mayer for me is just such an easy evaluation, right? It's just so easy. Kyle Hamilton last year, that was an easy evaluation, man. It's like that kid is – a rare, a rare size profile that we haven't, we don't see at safety too often. I mean, you have to talk about the Steve Atwaters of the world, right, Brian? The Sean Taylors of the world to start getting body types that are anything close to what Kyle Hamilton is. I mean, six right. four and an eighth, two hundred twenty pounds. You don't see that body type too often. Rare body type, really good film when he was healthy. Obviously, range on the back end can come down, can tackle. Like it was just an easy eval, man. Even even with the inconsistencies he had at points in his career on film, you were just like, but that guy's different. Like, that's just a different cat. So, yes, he should have been a top 10 pick. He was the 14th overall pick. And you know what Kyle did that was really good for the trajectory that we're talking about, though? Played really well as a rookie. He right. was really good. <laughs> he played really right. well. That, that'll that change perception a little bit. Like, oh, maybe yeah. we should have valued him a little bit higher. You, and now him. you have three safeties from Notre Dame in the NFL playing good football. Julian Love. Kyle Hamilton and Alohi Gilman to different degrees, but you know, based on their expectations. I mean, Julian Love's a you know fourth round draft pick who's been a pretty good football player, and so you know, if Notre Dame that might help a a guy down the road, you know, kind of hey, you know, this this Xavier Watts guy tested pretty well and he had a pretty good career. Notre Dame's had a track record of putting good safeties in the NFL. Maybe it helps. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. So, uh, you know. And people have asked, there's there's a question here that we just had, Ryan, that kind of plays into that. I want to pull it up here real quick from uh, we are in our, on our Marshall. He says, uh, another year of, of zero high draft picks. How does this impact recruiting? Smart and Saban can rattle off dozens of dudes in the NFL. Lack of portfolio can drive kids away, i.e. Keon Kelly. That's absolutely correct. I mean, we've talked about this plenty of times. Yeah. When people have said, oh, they lost Keon Keeley because of NIL, I'm like, I don't think that's why they lost Keon Keeley. I really don't. I think they lost Keon Keeley because Keon is an elite five-star football player who wants to be a high NFL draft pick. And right now, it's not even close to which place gives you the best chance to do that. And, you know, so they're going to have to go out there and prove that. That means winning, right? Because yeah. the one thing that can trump that, the one thing that can trump this is winning. Yeah. You know, win a championship. Because you know what's going to, you know what will happen if Notre Dame goes out there this year and wins a national championship? You're going to see four or five Notre Dame kids next year get way overdrafted, way overdrafted. Yeah. Because they're going to be like, man, did you see what these Notre Dame kids, they went out there they, and, hey, we're getting smart kids and good kids and think, you know, and I've, and, you know, that's an interesting thing I've heard. I've heard people say that, that sometimes NFL teams don't like Notre Dame kids. And this has been going on for decades because they don't love football. <laughs> there's the stereotype that that, yeah. but then also because they don't need football. Yeah. And, you know, you and, and you can't take advantage of a Notre Dame kid the way you can some other kids there's that perception i don't know how tr much truth there is to that but yep. that's been going on for a long time that that perception been out there for a long time like do these kids really love football if they really love football they would have gone to like alabama or auburn or something like that. they don't they don't eat sleep and drink football i think that's a stupid thing but i i think there are people out there that that have stereotypes about what notre dame kids are because they're smart they speak well they're academically oriented and there's a, there's some negative perceptions about that that I think are pretty stupid, but there's a lot of that. Stuff. I mean, the NFL has a long, long, long track record of really ignorant views on who to draft and why. Yes. I mean, long track record of that. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, look, Notre Dame needs to win. Number one, yeah. win, start beating these teams. You know, you know, the best way to start getting some of your players drafted over Ohio state, go out in the field next year and whoop their butts. As simple as that. Right. I mean, so then if you know you got all these USC athletes coming out next year and then they pop on the film and they're like, Mason Notre Dame kids kick their freaking butts. Uh, let's look at that. You know, because you know one thing that you're getting from Georgia, forget all the, the, the all the toughness and all I mean the athleticism. Do you know why else they like Georgia kids? Because they know those kids are no can take coaching. Yeah. And they know those kids are tough. Right? That that's another reason why that's also why you why they liked Alabama kids for a long time. Because the two things you know about Alabama kids, on top of the testing, but you know they're coached hard, and you know they're physically tough. That's what you know about Alabama. That's the two things you can guarantee about a kid coming out of Alabama, and all, or at least you think you can guarantee, or have a high percentage of getting right. Hey, I don't know what this if this kid can read a defense, or if this kid's going to get in trouble, or whatever. But you know what? This kid can. This kid takes hard coaching, and this kid is physically tough. I mean, right? Is that 
Is that yeah. fair to say? It's very fair. So best way you do that, go beat their butts. Yep. Beat them. Right? I mean, George, George has always had been a school that put, put a lot of guys in the NFL, but it's it's up the notch in recent years. And it's not just because they recruit better players. It's part of it. But it's also because you're getting guys drafted higher than they should be drafted because they played at the best team in the SEC. Something yes. like that. So you want you want to overcut take those teams, beat Ohio State, and then get in a playoff and beat an SEC team. That's how you that's how you fix it. I mean, because those are the big games too. I mean, Brian, I would I would still contend this, and somebody some people probably disagree with me on this, but if Isaiah Foskey would have played against Ohio State last year and had three sacks and dominated Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones, he would have heard his name called last night. Yeah, would have heard his name called. Hundred percent. Yep. Nope. But he didn't show. But he didn't have a productive game in the biggest game of his season. Like that's right. just where it comes down to. Well, you could argue a couple of the biggest games of the season. Yes. I mean, you, you you could make that case. Yeah. Especially against the NFL offensive tackles, he saw right. on the on the schedule. Right. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I meant by biggest games. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, you're you're spot on. And that's what. But that also is what frustrates me about Michael Mayer because Michael Mayer did play well in big games. <laughs> I in know, my man. opinion. I know, man. There's just there's no. Man, there's just no way that I can I can buy that. I just, I just, man, I just can't. I just, I have a hard time embracing that one. Like with some of them, I understood. Okay, I get it. Whatever. Man, there's some of them I just, I just don't understand. Like I just, you, you can't convince me of that. You just, you're not going to convince me of that, man. We do have a, some super chats here, Ryan, that I want to get to cool. here. We have a couple super stickers from Jim uh, DeMatteis. Jim, I appreciate you very much for that one and that one. I'm wow. going to look to see if Jim has uh, – uh, and 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 that one. I'm going to try and see if uh, Jim has some questions with some of these as well. But we really we really appreciate all that, Jim. We have a super st- uh, chat here from Shelton Hager. Shelton says, Brian, yesterday when y'all were talking about Isaiah Canyon – we were saying there is a lot of transplants in Georgia to make the transition to Notre Dame a little easier. Although, as a native Tennessean, no one considers Florida to be the South. Well, it depends on what part of Florida you're talking about. Yeah. I lived in Jacksonville. That's a very Southern community. It's the most Northern part of Florida. But the culture of Jacksonville, where I lived, was much more like Georgia than it was Central Florida or Miami. Yeah. And those are not Southern in culture. Right. So I understand where you're coming from, but um, it just depends on which part of Florida we're talking. I mean, like people in the panhandle are a lot more like people from Mississippi and Alabama than they are from people from Orlando and Florida and, and Miami. That's what makes Florida so unique because it's really like three different states culture wise, actually really four. Northern and Northeastern Florida is a lot like Georgia, the, the Carolina type of culture and people. The panhandle is a lot like those Alabama, Mississippi areas. And then Orlando is kind of, I don't know what the heck, how you cl- classify Orlando and Tampa. It's just like, it's like, I don't know, a northern city. It's like New York. Yeah. Right. And then Miami is like um, uh, I don't know, Puerto Rico. Right. I mean, it's like, like, it's just, it, it, the culture is just so much different than the other parts of the state. And I'm talking culturally. Yeah. It's a completely different universe. And so uh, you don't see that a lot in a lot of places like Ohio. I mean, there's, you know, Eastern Ohio is a little different, but it's still Ohio, man. You know, you're, you're in Ohio. It's Eastern Pennsylvania. People aren't a whole lot different than Western Pennsylvania people in culture. They're just, they have different accents. That's really the only difference. Well, you know what though? North Jersey and South Jersey are just completely different people, Brian. You'll just never understand this, man. They're just completely different. We don't associate with the Northerners around here, man. That's just because you guys are weird. <laughs> no, the North is weird. They're yes, New Yorkers, they are. man. They're the weird yeah. ones. Yes, they are. But they're but they're more New York. They're more yes. like they're want to be New Yorkers. Is basically what they are. Yeah, we're, we're Philly over here, man. That's we're right. down there. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we're tougher. From Sean Higgins, super chat. Thank you, Sean. Was it a coincidence that Prince Kali and Logan Diggs, Logan Diggs sat the majority of the spring? Did the staff know, or were they sandbagging? Uh, I don't. I don't want to speak on the second part, Sean. But the first part, no, it's not a coincidence. And and I mean that's why we, we pretty much said it about about Prince Kali. I did not know the entire spring that I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I knew all spring that Logan Diggs was leaving. I didn't. I didn't start hearing that until last couple weeks. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I'm not going to pretend like oh, I was dropping hints all spring. I just like the last week or so we were, you know, we were 
kind of made aware. Ryan, I think I told you it was about five, six days ago that about the text I got. I was like, yeah, this is what I'm, yeah. I'm hearing. And we started hearing a little bit of rumblings. But no, I, I, I don't want to say that they were sandbagging. Um, I don't want to even say that they didn't have some injuries at some point in time. I just feel like the injuries didn't keep them out as long as they were out. So, which is okay. But, uh, I mean, the staff knew. If I knew that Prince Collie was telling everyone for months he was leaving for Vanderbilt, I promise you that the Notre Dame coaches knew. Promise you that. So, um, yeah, it's it's not a coincidence that they that they sat majority of the spring at all. And and I'm saying that is a negative way. I mean, I, I in no way was I told at any point in time that that Prince Col- that uh, Logan Diggs was any sort of disruptive personality this spring. I was not told that at all. He yeah. wasn't out there like, screw this, I'm leaving. I'm I'm not getting enough care. It just it was not. I mean, tell kids, yeah, I just want to go somewhere. I want to be the guy. And, but it wasn't like an, a disruptive, um, bad attitude kind of. It just it wasn't. And not everything is like that. It's just like I just think that everybody knew he wanted to leave. And and there and and when you when he starts saying things, it's like, yeah, okay, this is just him convincing himself of right. why it's okay to leave. He wants to leave, so he's got to find some kind of reason to make it make sense. And it kind of came down to that is basically what it comes down to. I was honestly surprised that Prince Kali did anything in spring. I know he only participated a little bit in the beginning, but like at all, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that he even yeah. practiced whatsoever it was, right. it was sounded like he was decided before things even kicked up in spring. So, which makes me think they found out about it around then. That's just my two cents. It's possible. We have a super chat here from Tyler Evans. Ryan, I'll ask you this one. How many Notre Dame players can get drafted tonight and Michael Mayer to the Detroit Lions with a question mark? So, Tyler, I did a best fit. Lions pick third. Real quick, Ryan. uh, They pick third, by the way. So I I put together a best day two options or round two options for Michael Mayer in the draft because I do expect Michael Mayer to be drafted pretty early on here in the second round. Lions are one team that I highlighted. They actually have two first round, uh, two second round picks, I believe. They have the third pick, and then I think like the 34 and 48. Yeah. 48. Yeah. And I just published that article, by yes. the way. So it's up on irishbreakdown.com. So the Lions are one, I think, just makes so much sense, Tyler. Like that one is one that I think you wouldn't, I wouldn't have been super shocked if they would have taken him at 18, uh, personally, because right now the top tight end in the Detroit Lions is Brock Wright, who Brock. Did a nice job last year, right? He had over 200 yards. He had a few touchdowns. He blocks well. But you just need more production than that out of a starting tight end. So I think that getting Michael Mayer and Brock Wright to get back together would be an interesting option. So they're one team that I think makes a lot of sense. There's going to be other teams that you can make the conversation for, right? Like the Green Bay Packers is another one that would make some sense. Miami Dolphins pick further down in the in the second round. I think they're pick 51 in the second round, but like that would be yeah. a perfect fit, I think, in that offense. Their starting tight end right now is Durham Smythe, who, well, you know. Is, did J- did Jacecki leave this offseason? Mike yes, Jacecki leave? Yep. Okay, where'd Jacecki's he go? Gone. He went to – that's a great question. Mike Jacecki went to – It'll come to me in a minute. It'll yeah. Come to me in a minute. I can't remember. Which yeah, I'll look was, it up while yeah. you're still talking. Yeah, he, I'll, I'll he, do the research. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, now he left this off season. I know it's going to come to me as soon as you say it. I'm just like stalling for a second because I, I hate remember. it when that happens, man. Where New is England it? Patriots. New England Patriots. Yeah, he's there with Hunter Henry now, which I still think is an interesting spot for a tight end because I don't think either one of those guys are the answer long term. But Miami Dolphins is another one. I think there's a few teams there. As for who's going to get drafted tonight. Michael Mayer, for sure, somewhere here in the second round. I also think Isaiah Foskey will probably go in the second round. If not, he'll definitely get drafted in the third round. So he's going to be a day two player. I think that's it, though, today, Tyler. I really do. I think Jared Patterson's more somewhere on day three. I think then you start talking about the maybe Jason Admalola's late type of conversation, maybe Brandon Joseph's late, like those types of guys. But I think tonight, specifically for rounds two and three, I think you have Michael Mayer and then Isaiah Foskey at some point off the board as well. Yeah. So what you're saying is you you don't know for sure that Foss is going to get picked tonight, but there it'd be shocked if he doesn't get. I mean, excuse me, round two tonight. Yes, but you'd be shocked if he doesn't get picked because tonight's I, I w- two two and three, two and three, two and yeah. three tonight. Right. I, I I would phrase it like this, Brian. I would be surprised if he didn't go in the second round, and I would be absolutely shocked if he wasn't drafted on day two. I guess I I coin it like that. Yeah, that that yes, I would be shocked if he's not picked tonight. I just don't yeah. I don't. 
know if it's going to be round two or not. Because like yeah. some of the people that have told me he's not he's not going to get out of the second round are the same people that told me there's no way Michael Mayer gets past you know the Cowboys yeah. at twenty six. So uh, yeah, I didn't talk to a single person this draft season, man, that said Michael Mayer is going to drop the second round. Not a single person. Yeah. So you never know. You never yep. know. Yep, I saw a stupid mock draft the other day, and I was like, "This is stupid." Pro Football Focus did one. I was like, "This is stupid," and they had Michael Mayer in the second round. I was like, "This is just dumb," and it is dumb. So it just tells me that Mike that the NFL is as dumb as Pro Football Focus is. So there, <laughs> there you go. All right. Oh, yeah. oh man, Chris Collinsworth's uh, pick of Hendon Hooker being the thirty-first pick last night didn't happen. By the way, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm really shocked. Yeah. I'm sure it was a really <laughs> tough decision for them not to take a quarterback in the first round. Of the NFL draft. They're like, huh? Should we take a pass rusher that can actually play for us this year? Should we take a quarterback that might start two games? I yeah. wonder which one we should do there. From Paying John, first round a- money to never play ever. Exactly. John A. One's question: If Jason Onye continues to build on his strong spring, and Tyson Ford continues to develop as an interior defensive lineman. Does the Irish defensive lineman have future high draft pick stars anchoring the defense? Boy, oh boy. Um, On the interior, I think it's still questionable, John. Yeah. But I mean, if, well, you told me, if you told me Joshua Burnham's a high draft pick eventually and maybe Jordan Patello's a top 100 pick if he develops, I, I wouldn't be surprised by that personally. I, 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 do, I do think both of those kids have the tools to be high draft picks. I do. Yeah. I, I do think that Jason Onye and Tyson Ford have tools to be high draft picks. They're not going to be anchoring the defense in 23, though. I I, I don't th- – I mean, t- Jason Onye is not going to start. I mean, he's going to be really good and play a bunch, but he's probably not going to start. That doesn't mean he won't play starter snaps, and I think that, that they that they could end up doing that. But I, I – um, yeah, I – not this year. And down the road, yeah, I mean, there's several guys that have a chance to be you know, future high draft picks – I mean, Armel Mukum could be that. Bubakar Traore definitely could be that. You know, I mean, he I could see him being that. But th- there are ways – all those guys are a ways away from being that kind of guy. Like Rodney Mills, I think, has a chance to be a really good player and an NFL player, no question, if he can put all the – but it, but he's not going to be Jalen Carter. He's not going to be like picked or Jay. I mean, I'm hoping he can develop into a day two pick next year is my, is my yes. hope, right? I don't see him being a day one guy, first round guy. You know, like maybe if he goes out as like a dominant year. I mean, Riley's got some tools that NFL teams covet, yeah. but he just but I wouldn't call him the, the type of elite athlete that, that 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 some of those guys are. And he's got a big jump he's got to make in production, in my opinion, this season. Because he's not gonna get picked with Jordan Davis's production or yeah. Jalen Carter's production because he won't have the dominant film they have. He's gonna have to produce, he's gonna have to put up the numbers as well as have a good film. And but even then, I don't think he's a a first round guy. I hope I'm wrong. That's one of those ones I hope I'm wrong about. So, yeah. Brian, I forgot to tell you, I talked to R. Mel Mookum the other day, and he's up to 265 pounds. By the way, man. Oh wow. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> he's been working, man. Yep. All right. So let's uh, get to some more here. I I've got a ton of great questions. Though. You guys are you guys are on fire today. I got to wade through John's to get to some more. Here we go. Here's one from <laughs> Scott L. Scott L says Blake Fisher was an elite recruit, but Joe Alt developed so quickly that Fisher has not gotten as much buzz. What did Fisher do well in 2022? What improvements does he need to reach his ceiling? It's a good question, Ryan. I mean, what did he do well in 2022? He had stretches of dominant play. Yeah. He's a mover. He can move people off the line. I thought his pass protection for the most part was pretty good. You know, he would his footwork would get him in trouble. He said, what improvement does he need to reach a ceiling? I think the biggest thing for, for Blake is consistency which is true for most young kids. Joe Walt's the anomaly. Joe Walt's the unicorn when it comes to a true sophomore lineman that is about as steady of a blocker as you're going to find a college football. And that's more of just – that's who is who raised him, I mean, if we're being honest. And that's not an insult. I mean, he was raised by a guy who was a 10-year NFL offensive lineman, yeah. right? I mean, that's just <laughs> that's that's just going to be the case. You know, Blake's got to Blake's got to do a better job with consistency and pass pro. I mean, he would have snap after snap after snap of really good pass pro, and then just completely lose a guy on the edge. And it was never about because that guy just was too quick or too strong for Blake. It was he underset and a guy ran right by him. He overset and the guy beat him inside. It's just a, it's a lot it's like what hand, Ronnie Stanley went through. Stuff. And yeah, and Ronnie yeah. Stanley in 2014 that was his third year as a player, and he had a lot of that too. Just a lot, a ton of inconsistency. And, and as he got older, he started to get more consistent with that stuff. That That's really the big thing for Blake is, you know, keep getting stronger because he's still just a, was still just a sophomore. 
and then just be more fit consistently fu fundamentally sound and technically sound with how you go about your business on a on a snap by snap basis is, is really what it comes down to because i still think blake is a more physically dominant player than joe joe walt is joe walt's more dominant than people give him credit for i think people act like joe just kind of is great at getting in the way all the time no joe joe joe's dominant right but i'll say that the 10 best blake fisher reps are going to be more physically dominant than the 10 best joe walt reps yeah it's just joe walt does that every single snap Right. I mean, Joe Walt's got 150 of those where Blake has 25 of them. That's the difference. Yeah. Right. Is that is that fair, Ryan? Yeah, sure, sure. And I think that's what he needs to do. It, it, at the end of the day, look, I've seen some people projecting Blake as a potential first round pick next year in the 20s. I think the best thing for Blake to do, come back next year, be the best you can be. Joe goes pro, move to left tackle and prove to people you can play on the left side. That's how you see his 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 draft jump. But he could also say, look, the first second offensive tackle, actually, wait a minute, hold on a second. Yeah, second offensive tackle taken last this last night was a true right tackle who was drafted was. because he was a true right tackle. The yeah. last time Notre Dame had an offensive lineman go in the top 10, he was drafted as a right tackle. Number nine. So yeah. it's certainly possible. I just would it's like changing. to see him prove he could be a left. Yeah, agree. Uh, it, I agree. It, it's changing the uh not distinction between left and right tackle, but the importance, I guess, like right tackle is valued a lot more than it once was. And it's continuing to move that way. I mean, right. for me, like the biggest differences, Scott, in my opinion, are I think that the handwork is something that's a little bit of a separator between Joe and Blake, right? Like Joe, you can tell Joe has a father that played in the NFL because he plays with really good independent hands. And what kind of that means is, you're, you're in your kick step, whether you're in a 45-degree step, whether you're short setting, whether you're in a vertical set. And often, and defensive linemen are going to try to get inside of your chest, and when they can't, they're going to try to use their hands to get your hands off of you and get guys off balance. I think I think Joe has a really good understanding of, I'm going to stay, maintain in my, in my slide, but I also have to keep repos repositioning my hands and resetting my hands so I don't give up an inside track and I don't allow them to get inside my chest. I don't think Blake does that incredibly well right now. Now, he's got really strong hands. So when he gets inside of you, good luck <laughs> because he's that type of physical, physically imposing player. But when a guy is able to get his hands off, can Blake reset quick enough to get back inside? Like that's the next step, I think, from a hand usage perspective. And that's something that Joe Walsh is just, I mean, most sophomores his age aren't as good as what Joe is at that. And that's kind of one of the separators is that, yes, he's long. Yes, he's athletic. But he is a more nuanced player right now. And I think that a lot of that is because his dad is John Alt. So like he was an right. all pro, he was a, all, he was a pro bowl offensive tackle in the NFL level. Like he's been around that guy his entire life. Right. Yeah, good, good, uh, really good question, Scott. Really good questions. Uh, we got to that one, got to that one. All right. Let's see here, Ryan. Let's get one from John A1. John says, who can Notre Dame land in the 2023 portal that will continue the momentum Notre Dame had going into the spring game? Pick a safety that can help them. That's really it. I, I, look, yeah. look, I know they lost Diggs and Styles and Buckner. And I, I really don't think going to the portal fixes any of their problems. D coach the kids you have. I mean, coach up the kid. You have a really good young quarterback, Kenny Minchie, who you're going to need to be in the now in the quarterback battle to start next year. Coach him up. Don't take reps away from him to go get Ben Bryant. For example, now if you did that, I would understand it. I, I would. It, there's a difference between saying this is what they should do, and and I don't agree with what they did, and saying it's a bad decision. I wouldn't say it was a bad decision. I would understand it because Notre Dame is putting all their chips on the table for 2023 in a lot of different ways. Yeah. I just would say just coach the kids you have up, right? Coach up the running backs you have. Now, if there's a a guy in the portal that's going to add value to it, then sure. But what you all have to understand is most of these kids in the portal that are high level players are not going into the portal because they want to play more somewhere. They're going to the portal because they want to pay out. And they're not going to get that at Notre Dame. Yep. And and so that's why you know Notre, there's some grad transfers that might be that way, but most grad transfers you're getting in January. That's where Notre, Notre Dame's going to a lot of times do most of their portal work, but that's not always true because they got Nick McLeod late at, from NC State. But the reality is, is the kind of guys that Notre Dame's going to get late are going to be more Nick McLeods than – Caleb Williams and Jordan Addison yeah. and Barry Alexanders. Those guys are going in the portal for completely different reasons than what Notre Dame has to offer. 
Notre Dame has to be, and everybody can say, oh, Notre Dame has to get with the times. And we have a question about that. But the reality is, is Notre Dame is not going to be able to do it the way everybody else does. And that's okay if you do it right. And I have some ideas on that that we'll get to um, as we kind of get down deeper into some of these questions, because there are some questions that, that do address that. And I think we'll let those questions kind of come up for it uh, um, when we address those. But here, here's one from Mark Applegate. I'll, I'll ask it again, Ryan, uh, so you can answer it. Why didn't Michael Mayer not, why didn't, why didn't Michael Mayer get drafted in the first round, but a tight end from Utah did? Notre Dame is tight end. You and Mayer's the best tight end we ever had. Uh, Mark, I, I think there's a combination of reasons why. I think, one, Michael Mayer isn't a very flashy athlete in the sense of he's not a 4-5 athlete that's just going to just run by anybody in a straight line. I think that some people lose sight of overall athleticism sometimes, and they just kind of coin speed, straight line speed as the only form of athleticism. So I think that Michael Mayer has kind of been underrated in the fact that I think that he is a quick football player. I think that he's a very loose athlete. And I think that Michael Mayer is also a guy that has great body control working in the air, right? Like all that stuff is about that. All of that is a part of athleticism. So I think he's just an underrated player in that regard. And I think when you look at Dalton Kincaid, he's more of the modern move tight ends, right? A guy that's going to play detached more often than not, more of a true slot type tight ends, more of a guy that is just a little bit more of, and he's smaller, right? So he's a smaller player, but he's going to get in and out of his breaks a little bit more smoothly than Michael Mayer because Michael Mayer is just a different body type. So I think that Michael Mayer's style has caused him to go a little bit underrated because that's just not a attractive t- style to some people from a tight end position anymore and Dalton Kincaid kind of hit fits the 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 archetype now of what some teams wanted a tight end I think it's flawed I think it's going to end up being a completely wrong decision but I think that that's basically why this went into that decision is that I think that Dalton Kincaid is what NFL teams are more trying to look for than what Michael Mayer is Michael Mayer just has kind of a throwback style for me I want to speak on something that's kind of I saw I'm seeing happening in the chat that I didn't okay. get to because it's hard to get through all of them. But uh, Notre Dame did not lose the Smith twins, just for the record. When the Smith, when the first Smith twin committed, and I don't believe the second one was committed yet, no, Notre Dame was no longer an option for either one of them because Notre Dame is filled up and their spots have gone to other people. So that's they didn't lose the Smith twins. I'm not I'm not saying I'm not guaranteeing they would have got them if they didn't bow out. I, I think they would have, but it wasn't a given, as we said on the show a couple weeks ago. But they didn't lose them. They they took better players, to be honest with you, in my opinion. They just took guys that are better. Ryan and I somewhat disagree on that, I think, at least one of the spots. But um, Notre Dame, in Notre Dame's view, they got better players. In my view, they got better players. But they bowed out. Notre Dame was not an option for the Smith twins when they, when, when they sit down to make their decisions now. Could have been a month ago, but not. Not now. So I just want to make sure that that's clear because there's a conversation going on in the uh, the chat about that. And, and there's some people that seem to have missed that update. So uh, yeah. I wanted to make sure that we're on the that we're on the same page there and everybody understands what's going on. All right. Here we go. From Coleman Smith, who said, could you take Kedron Young or Anthony Carey as a second running back if both wanted to commit? Yes, 100 percent. And Notre Dame would do that. Not just my opinion, but Notre, Notre Dame would take either one of those guys in a heartbeat. I, 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 I think that you probably prioritize it as young and then carry, but I, I don't even know if that's how the staff would view it. That It's more me. That's more my yeah. priority. They're both really good. I, per, but, but Notre Dame's my understanding talking to people in Notre Dame is like both are guys we want. Now they can't take both. I don't think, but they're both guys that they want. And so that's yes, no doubt. And and they're they're those two are in a category of their own. There's some other backs on the board that they may have to look at. They have they may have they may ha- I think they have to take a second back now. Where before yeah. it was sort of a luxury. I think they have to take one now. Uh, so you you're gonna have to expand the board a little if you don't think you're gonna get one of those two guys. But I think they like where they're at with Kedron Young and Kerry's gonna make a visit to Notre Dame before he commits, I believe. And yeah. so you'll have a chance to to knock that one out of the park if you can. Yeah, they so. they both have official visits in June. So yep. yeah. So good good question there, Coleman. Question from Jimmy James: Do you have any uneasy feelings regarding the program? For me, there is no one issue that concerns me, but stacking issues are beginning to make me feel away. Re coaching, 
changes, transfers, et cetera. Jimmy, those are things happening everywhere, including Alabama. Yeah. Alabama had to replace both of their coordinators this offseason. Actually, and, and if we're being honest, they were both basically essentially fired. Yep. Neither of them had the option of coming back to Al- – you don't leave Alabama to go to Ole Miss if you have the option of going back to Alabama as a coordinator. Can we can we agree to that? Bill O'Brien was not going to was not going to be the offensive coordinator in Alabama next year, even if he wanted to. Ohio State's a year removed from firing their defensive coordinator. A year removed from that. A, a year from removed from firing their offensive line coach and basically revamping their entire staff. Like this is what happens everywhere. Like you guys understand that, right? Like. Why is there more coaching turnover now? Number one, there isn't more coaching turnover now than there was in the past. But number two, you have coaches that actually want – you have big schools that actually want Notre Dame's players now, or coaches now, in, including some NFL teams. That's why. Uh, the Indianapolis Colts don't come to take Brian Polian from Notre Dame because he's not a very good coach. They're going to try to come take Brian Mason, right? And so uh, that's the whole point is this is – guys, this is the life of big-time football. They're going to have – Georgia has literally had starters leave after championship teams. Alabama yep. has had starters leave in the transfer portal in recent years. You guys get that, right? This is happening. Notre Dame lost zero starters in the transfer portal right now. Zero. None. Right? Like, this is the whole thing. It's like, this is what happens when you are this type of program. Do I have uneasy feelings regarding the program? My only uneasy feelings are the fact that this program hasn't won a championship in over 30 years. Yes. But I... I I just feel like Notre Dame fans are so used to bad things happening that anytime something happens, it's not good. And again, I'm not saying that losing Tyler Buckner and Logan Diggs are good. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they're going to be okay. Yes. Right. And so anything, it's just this ginormous overreaction to it as if like there's some giant cancer spreading through the program. And I'm like, that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is college football life happening at (laughs) Notre Dame right now. Right. You lost your offensive coordinator, Alabama, the same offense coordinator that everyone complained about every freaking show that we did where we ever talked about the offense. And there's a couple people that would just run their mouths about Tom Reese if we were doing a show on uh, anything. Hey, today we're going to do a defensive line show. Tommy Reese sucks. You know, it's like, what? Like, what? What does that have to do with anything? And then he leaves. And it's I can't believe that they don't lost. Their, 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 what's going on? Their coaches are leaving. And. Tyler Buckner sucks and he can't complete a pass and Logan Diggs shouldn't carry the ball as much as Audrick estimate. Then they transfer. Oh my God. I can't believe they lost Tyler Buckner and Audrick <laughs> Logan Diggs. Logan D- Lorenzo Styles can't catch a pass. He goes in the portal. Oh my God. The sinking ship. The guy that we've been complaining about our, for our years. Leading, our leading receiver left. <laughs> it's like, guys, like pick a lane and just stay in it. Right? Like, yeah. I don't understand. Now, is it again, is it good that Tyler and Logan left? No, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying they're going to be okay. And this is big boy football, right? So we all got to put our big boy pants on and our big girl pants on for some of y'all and say, hey, this is life, but they're going to be okay. And you know what the job is now? Okay, we lost a guy. This is college football. Go find another one, whether it be high school or college or whatever. So, I mean, you guys can choose to live in negativity, and I understand that and I respect that. And as Notre Dame fans, I get it. I'm just not going to live in that universe because I look at the roster and I'm like, okay, I wish Tyler Buckner was still here. I hope Sam Harper doesn't get hurt. But if he doesn't get hurt, it seems going to be really freaking good. Really freaking good, y'all. Yeah, so don't waste this time with negative energy. Like, okay, it is what it is. Sack up. Let's move on. Okay. And 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 realize there's a lot of freaking talent on this football team. Does that mean that Notre Dame could just keep doing what they're doing? And no, no, there's some adjustments you need to make, and we'll discuss those when we get to some of those questions. But no, I'm not. I'm excited about this football program. I'm excited about the direction of this football program. I'm excited that Marcus Freeman is leading this football program. I'm excited to see what Jared Parker is going to do. I am thrilled with the work that Gino Gadulli has done. Dylan McCullough and Chancey Stuckey have been absolute dudes. Since they arrived Al Washington, who I have hammered for a year is stepping up right now and doing a good job. Mike Mickens is one of the absolute best in the business at what he's doing. Do I need to see more from Al Golden? Yes, I do. 
Do I need to see more from Chris O'Leary on a recruiting trail? Yes, I do. Are things perfect? No, they're not. Is the administration standing in Notre Dame's football program's way in some regards? Yes, they are. But you know what else, Ryan? You know the last time they stood in Notre Dame's way? In the 1980s when Lou Holtz was here. And he said, I don't care. I'm going to go win for Notre Dame. So get it done. I'm excited about the direction of this program. That's not spin. Ryan, you've heard me say this when we talk privately. I'm going to give you freedom to tell people exactly what you and I talk about in private conversations. When I talk to you about this football team, as of last night, what, what is my my feeling? Honestly, when, when it's just me and you talking, no fans around, no spin, no nothing, what is my feeling on this football program? They, they could compete for a national, national championship in the near future, man. I mean, that's it, right? I mean, I think we both – I think we both feel that way i mean we really do i mean I, it's no spin guys like last year i was at the syracuse game we were at the syracuse game ryan remember yeah. and i was just like i remember we were talking we're like man like they're they're, they're probably a quarterback away from being like a national that title team. contender like that, that team. team yeah it was yeah. like they're close man like they're pretty dang close i mean they did what they did to Syracuse last year and Clemson last year thrown for a hundred yards a game like that. That's what they did, man. Like it's, it's, I don't know. I'm excited. They about it destroyed excited Clemson about it. and passed for 86 yards. Yeah. Destroyed Clemson and passed for 86 yards. Are they there yet? No, they're not. They're not there yet till they do it. Right. I mean, that's the reality They're They could go sign three straight number one classes in the country, sign 10, five stars, and they're not there yet till they actually win it. Right. Otherwise, you're just Texas A&M and Florida State and, you know, all these other teams. Ohio State in the last six, seven years recruits as good as anybody. Gets their behinds handed to them by Michigan twice in a row. You know, I, it, it is what it is. But I'm ex- I'm genuinely – I we could be wrong. They could go 8-4 this year. I have no clue. But I am genuinely – yeah, Ryan, I got you. They are, I'm genuinely excited about the direction of this football team. I am. You can ask my dad. You can ask my wife. You can ask anybody that I talk to. I'm genuinely excited about this team. And I wish that some of you were that way too, because, and and if we're wrong, okay, then we can be miserable in the fall, but we can be happy and excited right now and bring positive energy in our lives right now. There's no need to have negative energy right now. Number one, it's unhealthy, but number two, there's no reason for it. I'm, I'm, I just, I, I wish that we could get that way, but I look guys, I also, I'm not hammering you. I, I get it. I get it. I understand, especially especially people my age and older who experienced that that greatness of Notre Dame for a, a time and to see what it is. It's like, yeah, I get it. I do. It's like, oh, every time you feel like you're there, something happens. And I get all that. I really do. I'm just telling you right now, I'm excited. I'm very excited about this football team. I really am. And none of the things that have happened with these guys who are not going to start for them leaving changes that for me. It just it, it, it just it doesn't. It doesn't move the needle for me. I'm 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 very excited about what this program is going to be. I have a question here from Cameron Crazy. Is Grant Bricks a take for the staff? You know, Cameron, I would not uh, I would not necessarily explain any offensive lineman other than than um, uh, Gearby Lambert is necessarily takes right now. I I don't know if I'm comfortable enough with where the staff is to really say for sure that the guys that who are or are not takes, I think they're still trying to figure some of that stuff out. I think that right now, actually I'll say that I take that back. There's two guys right now. I'm confident. There's no doubt about it. They would take right now if they wanted to commit Gearby Lambert and Styles Prescott. I'm not sure I'm comfortable enough to know what the staff thinks about Kevin Haywood and Grant Bricks and some of these other, uh, other guys to say for sure that they would or would not take them either way. It's more of a lack of knowledge then it is a, I don't think they would take them. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So I, I really don't know. I think they're still trying to formulate what their board is, to be completely with you. I think they're still trying to figure out, you know, where do they turn if they don't get a couple of the top guys that they like. So I think that's um, that's kind of part of it. And we had this question here, some similar to this, Matt McCarthy, and I believe Matt asked this yesterday, and I'm sorry we didn't get to it, Matt. But Matt said, if Liam Andrews, Gearby Lambert, and Styles Prescott all want to come, which two do you think the staff would take? No chance they'd take all three, right? I think in that instance, Matt, as of where the staff is right now, they would take the first of any of those guys that wants to come. And if it's not Gearby Lambert, then they would then still take Gearby Lambert. I don't think they I don't think that right now they would take all three. Having said that, 
if there's an injury or if maybe an offensive lineman that's currently on the roster, a younger player decides to jump on the portal between now and Sunday. And I, and I don't know that that's going to happen. I've not heard anything. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if it did happen, then I think you might start talking yourself into saying, Hey, we might have room for five. But as of right now, I think right now the, the goal is three to four and, and um, they would take two of those three. I personally would like to see them take all three of those guys because I think all three of those guys are better than anyone they have in the class right now, except maybe Peter Jones, but even then it's close. So, um, but that just, but I, that the, I, don't, I don't think the staff would agree with me on that. Cause I think the, st- uh, at least Joe Rudolph is a lot higher on Anthony Knapp than I am. That's part of it too. Is he, he likes Anthony Knapp a lot more than I do at this point in time. So I hope he's right. And I hope that I'm wrong. So um, we just answered a couple offensive line questions here, Ryan. So we'll, uh, We'll we'll move up. Um, uh, the, the, Jimmy James, this is a positive this is a, a, a mailbag follow up. I did see our head coach escorted his mom at the White House transfer that Alabama. I got to admit, that was a pretty cool deal, man. I couldn't, you know, um, it was what the South Carolina president or South Carolina, South Korea president was here and yep. in, in state dinner. And, and Marcus Freeman, whose mother is South Korean, uh, had a chance to be at that. That was pretty cool. It's like, hey, how many head coaches are getting pictures taken with Angelina Jolie? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't think that's happening. So hopefully, uh, here's my prayer, right? This isn't a political conversation because I don't care who the president is. I really hope we see Marcus Freeman back at the White House again soon. And this time, but he's taking the rest of his team with him. That would be nice. That'd be nice. Hope we get to see that again. Can I say that uh, I think it's impossible for Marcus Freeman not to take a good picture, by the way, man. He always takes good pictures. It's yeah, insane. It's true. Have you ever have you ever watched How I Met Your Mother? Or was that not yes. your type of show? No, so you remember you remember you remember when uh Barney couldn't take a bad picture, even when he mm-hmm. was like sleeping and stuff, he would just wake up yeah. and just be like, Yeah. <laughs> he was time. my favorite character on that show, by the way. Great, man. He great. was he he was excellent in that show. Um yeah, he was. I, I actually I I enjoyed that show, but the main guy, I guess. Ted just annoyed the crap out of me. Yeah. It's oh, like, he was, dude. he was, he was meant to be whiny. And oh my God. Yeah. And yeah. I just can't yeah. deal with that kind of character. It just, I, I know it's part of the shtick. I get that. Right. But it's yeah. just like, Oh my God, just enough. And I saw they have some spinoff. How I met your father. It's like, no, just stop. Guys. We, just, we, we, just tr- stop. We, we tried to watch it. I, I, it was okay for a couple episodes. And I was like, yeah, yeah it's just, isn't it's just lame. Just stop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just like I wa- yeah. walked in one time and my wife's, watching fuller house like babe you know? oh gosh <laughs> yeah i didn't try like, you want to watch this with me no we're oh not they also like girl girl meets world i'm like why yeah no why are we doing that boy why meets world wasn't even that fun oh and, stop you know, don't so, you say that ever but you're don't young you, 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 you gotta think about your age when you were watching that show compared to my yes. age when that show was going on it's it had been a lot creepier man. for me to be watching that show it's classic classic show yes because you were about the age of those people in that show <laughs> For me, it's a grown-up watching children. You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, uh-uh. uh. It was funny, that. man. It was funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I ain't rolling like that. All <laughs> right, let's get down to let's get down to some more questions here, real quick. All right, let's get down to here. I'm trying to find some more. Uh, see, uh, all right, let's let's get to this one, Ryan. Here's the here's the one I was looking for earlier that I wanted to address. This one right here from uh, Matt McCarthy. Matt says, with Notre Dame's restrictions when it comes to taking undergrad transfers, will they have to start signing more kids in every class given the increase in players transferring due to the transfer portal? Yes, to a degree. This is absolutely something Notre Dame needs to be more willing to do. Like overestimate the numbers, I guess. Well, just, hey, look, we're not going to stop this position because we may lose some guys. Now, the other part of that is you also have to be careful because then you don't want a bunch of your freshmen leaving. Like, we're going to sign seven wide receivers because we know we're, no, that's dumb because then you're going to lose half of your receiver class. But you say, hey, look, perfect example was your last question, Matt. And this is why I wanted to kind of bring uh, this is why I should have just immediately brought this up and, and want to do it now once I saw the second part of your question is that's why I would take all three of those offensive linemen if they wanted to come because you're going to lose somebody to the portal that you didn't expect to lose, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or, or you may want to have someone go to the portal that you otherwise wouldn't. And so, load up at that position because that's a position where kids tend to be a little bit more patient, right? Where kids just don't leave after their freshman year, but you can't go out and sign five corners because a bunch of cornerbacks that are any good, aren't going to want to stay and sit for three years. And when they're not even in the top three in their own freaking class, you know what I mean? So you got to be smart about it, but it's like, Hey, 
we're not sure if we're going to take one or two backs now. It should not even be a conversation anymore. Take two. It's not even it's not even a conversation. Well, we're not sure if we're going to take four wide receivers now. It, it shouldn't even be a conversation. Take four, right? And because you and then figure it out. Because somebody who's not going to play now is going to be upset and leave in a year. I mean, that's just at, at some of these positions. And so, how ah, do you take a sixth defensive lineman? Yes, there's no. What's the debate? There isn't one. Right. As long as it's balanced, you know, three and three or four and two, and it's not like five and one, right? Inside, outside. But yeah, I mean, do we take a third cornerback? Yes, of course you do. Do we take a third safety? No brainer. Maybe yeah. even take four <laughs> if one of those guys has rover potential. You know what I mean? Like, so it's not about going from four to seven, right? And at, at a position, but it's more about all those. So, like, when we do our needs, we go like two to three, three to four, four to five, one to two. Right when we do that after signing yeah. day, Ryan. Now it's just nope. Take the bigger number. Yes, answers <laughs> yes, yes. Right. So do you yeah. take one or two? Two. You take three or four. Okay, guys, we could do this at every position, but just take the bigger number across the board, and then we're good to go. That's what I would do uh, if I'm Notre Dame, because as you said, you're going to lose guys. You just are. And if you're upping your recruiting caliber right now, which some of the people in this chat are understanding. Like, hey, guys, this is what happens when you recruit the kind of class in Notre Dame. It, and here's the thing. It hit. Like, it flat out hit, y'all. The one kid in the class that I was a little unsure of, and I talked to someone at, you know, some sources, and they're like, you yeah, know, this kid's, the only kid that's really struggling is, of the kids that are playing is, you know, Preston Center. And then I see him. I'm like, oh, okay, I see it. And the whole thing was, we love his talent, but he's just, he's thinking too much. He's not sure of what he's yeah. doing. And then you watch him in a blue gold game, and you're like, that's the only guy that hasn't hit yet? That dude right there is the only guy that hasn't hit yet? Looks freaking hit to me. You know what I mean? But, like, think about that. Like, all the receivers showed out. Sam Pendleton looked better than I thought he was going to be as a true freshman. Right? All the linebackers look legit. I mean, every yeah. single one looks like a dude. And and then um, Christian Gray. Look yeah. legit. Now I didn't see anything of Ben Minich, like meaning not that I I saw him and I didn't see him. I just didn't see him this spring. I didn't really notice him. And then the one practice that we got to that second full practice, he wasn't in it because he had broke his hand. But every single freshman I saw hit, and I'm like, we haven't even seen Jagasaw yet. We haven't seen <laughs> Jeremiah Love yet. We haven't seen Caleb Smith yet. We haven't seen Bubakar and Brennan and any any Armel. of the defensive line. We haven't seen Devin Houston was even yeah. out for the out for right. the spring. Yeah. We haven't seen the fastest guy in the recruit yet, and Micah Bell. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm like, yeah, okay. I mean, but if you're able to start stacking classes like that on top of each other, you're going to lose some guys. So just keep stacking classes, right? And then the other thing, too, is you've got to start being a, a program that's better about playing a deeper depth chart. You have to. You have to be willing to play five, six receivers instead of four. It's just the reality of it. You've got to make sure that you're finding as many opportunities in some of those non-Ohio State, Clemson, USC games of getting your, your fourth corner in the game a little bit more. You, you, I know you want to put starters on special teams, but no. Occasionally, if a guy's too good, sure. You can't take Jack Kaiser off special teams. I get it, right? But you need to take J.D. Bertrand off special teams, right? Yeah. You need to take um, Cam Hart off special teams, Benjamin Morrison off special teams and play Christian Hart or Christian Gray and and some of these younger Jalen. Because the reason is, is you can now, now then say, guys, we're not because here's the here's the problem I have with the we're going to play starters on special teams. What you're telling me is that starters on special teams are not starters. That's the message that you're sending. And I don't like that message. My yeah. message is this guy starts at linebacker and this guy starts as my gunner. And now all of a sudden, when these kids who aren't starters on offense or defense are earning special teams roles, they are being viewed as, but I'm a starter. As opposed to, well, I'm a here, but they're going to actually bring a starter over and make, you know, because he's just, no, I don't like that. If a starter on defense is the best guy for the job, then he also starts on special teams. Yeah. But you need to be able to build that up because that's what Alabama's done. A Nick, one of the, 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 really wonderful things that Nick Saban has done because for a program that recruits as many big time players they have, they don't have a lot of those guys transfer because of playing time. They don't have many of that at all. They'll have starters leave because they know they're getting pushed or they're getting pushed out. But Alabama doesn't have a, a ton of guys leave and transfer early on. They'll leave later when they get beat out by somebody younger. Why? Because the way he sells recruiting is Alabama doesn't put a lot of starters on special teams. 
Am I correct on that, Ryan? Yeah. They put these young studs, but they sell special teams as you have earned a starting role, a very important starting role. And that's how they get that experience. They play a ton of snaps. They take pride in it. And then as sophomores and juniors, they're stepping into the starting lineup on defense. And they're cool with it because the way they sell it. And that's why I don't like the whole, we're going to put our starters on special teams. Well, so those guys aren't starters? Those guys that were there on the kickoff team, they're not starters? I hate that messaging. I, I, but that's, I something you can, that's something yeah. you need to do also to help keep those young – when you're bringing in those bigger classes, that's something you can do to help keep those freshmen and sophomore a little bit more happy is find them roles right away and be willing to go a little bit deeper into your bench in nine or eight of your games out of a season. I used to feel like that Alabama kickoff team was like a almost a preview of like what's the future is going to hold, right? Like I remember when like Reggie Raglan was running down on kickoffs. You remember when Ruben Foster was like a backup linebacker, but he was just running down into Cleeton dudes yes. like Leonard Fournette on kickoff and stuff like that. It's just like it, it's it's kind of cool. I mean, honestly, I love watching those guys run down on kickoff because it's like kind of a oh wow, we got that guy coming up the pipe soon, man. Like, that's kind of neat type of situation. And that's kind of how Alabama used to run that kickoff, man. You used to see, like, year in and year out, it was like Reggie Raglan, then Rashawn Evans was on there one year, and then it was mm-hmm. Ruben Foster, and there's just they just had that kind of revolving door of, like, the next great linebacker at Alabama is on kickoff, Christian Harris. Like, they just always had that type of guy, which is kind of fun. Yep, I uh, yep, I think that's a lot of fun. So, so Matt, to your point, I think that's a great – point and i think it's something notre dame needs to start be going about four or five over so like this year they're telling me they want to take 22 23 nope 25 minimum is what you need to do because now you're at 83 82 scholarships and and you're over right so absolutely abs- that's exactly what I, I would absolutely start going over no more debates about you taking three or four now debate between three and five sure that's a debate because now you're starting to get a little bit too many at certain positions and now you're going to lose one of those guys a freshman's going to come in in the spring He's clearly the fifth receiver of five, and he's like, screw this. I'm transferring to my in-state school that I can go play right away. He's got to be yeah. smart about it to a degree. But, yes, I'm going over. I'm absolutely going over. You just made Brandon Plesner's day, man. He's like, why? Because he's been he's yes. been like 25 plus. Yeah, but there, but there still has to be some, some reason <laughs> to this, right? Like there still has to be some justification to this, and there's still some numbers that you've got to be able to say, hey, we can't go there at that position. Because that's not a position you've seen a bunch of guys leave. So there's always some you got to be smart about it. But in certain positions, as skill positions, for example, receiver, running back, corner, safety, not worried about it. Take them, take them. Linemen tend to be more patient. So you got to be smarter yeah. about going too too high on numbers uh, on the defensive line. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. We got a couple of super chats down here, Ryan. From John Bertucci, thank you so much for the super chat. How does Notre Dame expand the number of elite defensive line guys they can go after? Seems like they only have one guy a year, and if they miss, that is it. I mean, I think they're already doing that. I mean, they're they're going after guys that they believe are fits and they have a shot at. I mean, that's the rea- reality. You, you, there's no strategy that's going to make a kid who's not interested in you all of a sudden interested in you unless you just go out there and start winning. Yeah. And so the, the best thing to do is find those high upside guys, find the Malachi Williamses, find the Cole Mullinses, find the, you know, the, the Bubakar Traoris, the Armel Mookums, the the Tyson Fords that that are, you know, someone the, the Josh Burnhams who are linebackers that you can turn into edge players. Go find those high ceiling guys and just sign as many of them as you can and just make sure that whoever you have as your D-line coach is a great teacher and start putting those guys out that that's the way to go and then eventually all of a sudden the next Keon Keeley comes along and he's like yeah okay you're putting dudes in the NFL your team is great I'm gonna go play for you guys so that's um to me that that's really what you do you're just not gonna all of a sudden well our strategy is this year let's go let's go uh change our strategy make sure we get now Nigel Smith I don't there's nothing else Notre Dame could do to get Nigel Smith to be interested in Notre Dame nothing yeah there's nothing they could do to get Williams and Amari more interested in him there's nothing they can do to get Elijah Rushing more interested in him except have better results. You know, Elijah rushing is a lot like Keon Killy. That is a, that is one of the most Notre Dame kids in this class. Everything about Elijah rushing screams Notre Dame fit, except Elijah rushing doesn't necessarily believe that right now. Now it could change, right? They're still in the game there. He's going to take an official visit, right? But in, in, if Notre Dame had the results on the field with defensive linemen that Alabama and Georgia had, Elijah rushing would have committed four months ago. 
Yeah, I, that's, I mean, I'm being a bit hyperbolic on that, right? But like it, because then Notre Dame's lacking nothing for what he's looking for, nothing. But they don't, they don't have that track record, so change it. That's why well, I, I, me- I remember after he visited the first time, I remember he actually met Keon Keeley the first time that he went on a visit, and that was a big deal to Elijah Rushing. But I mean, so could you imagine if if Keon Keeley, I mean, not Keon Keeley, I'm sorry, uh, Fosky, Isaiah Fosky Elijah met on, Fosky. on the first trip, yeah. Elijah Rushing met Isaiah Foskey on his first time at Notre Dame. Could you imagine how impactful it would have been if Isaiah Foskey would have went in the first round last night, if things would have developed in that fashion? I mean, that's kind of where the trends start, and where you start attracting guys in different avenues. I think that's the biggest thing is that, like, Notre Dame has the easy selling points, right? They play high-level football, great academic school, great tradition, but it's the other parts, right? It's the – get guys to the NFL, compete for national championships. Like there's still a couple of checks that they still need to make on their checklist. And once they do, then Notre Dame's just going to roll. Like it's just yeah. – because it, then you're going to have very little that you can negatively recruit against Notre Dame. Like, man, they, they're they cold. It's a cold spot mm-hmm. up there. Man, they, it snows sometimes. Oh, man, who cares at the end of the day, right? So nope. it's just about checking those boxes for some of those elite guys. And they're – they're working to get there, man. So let's just be patient yeah. with it. I hope it, I hope it comes soon, though. I do. The thing too, I'd say is, is not every elite D line guy is a guy that right now is an elite D line guy. Like, yeah. For example, Malachi Williams is in my top five guys that I wish Notre Dame could get. And I, if if I'm going with any defensive lineman in the country, I can add to that list. Malachi Williams is in my top five. Why? Because he's not, he's not where some of these other guys are right now. Yeah. He's not where Elijah Rushing is right now. But he can, if they all pan out, he is right there, flat out. It's like that's give me a Bubakar Traore every year. Now I ranked Bubakar pretty low in last year's ranking because it's a different ranking. But where was he? Was one of those kids that was like tenth or eleventh on the defensive class, and like first in my upside grade. Give me those guys. Give me one or two of those guys every. I just don't necessarily want them to have only those guys. And that was my only knock on last year's class is like that's all they had on the D line. You gotta have some guys with some floors, right? But that's what you do. It, it's find those guys. Find those guys that may not be stars right now, but have those tools that when you get them in with Matt Bayless for a while and we teach those kids how to play. Like, like Braylon James is a great example. Braylon James is not a five-star receiver. But Braylon James has five-star talent. Yeah. If Braylon James was a five-star receiver right now, he might have been harder to get out of Texas. Maybe, maybe. Now, Braylon's a bit unique. That might be a bad example because Braylon's a very unique kid that, that, that with a very unique family that really valued that. But you get kind of the point. If Jaden Greathouse was viewed as a wide five-star receiver now, he would have had a lot more schools coming after him. And Notre Dame may not even – it might have been way too late for Notre Dame to get in with him. But for whatever reason, he wasn't getting the same level of interest. Go find those guys. And and then Texas came calling and Oklahoma came calling later and but he was already committed to Notre Dame, so get on those guys early, and and land those guys early before those other Isaiah Canyon is a perfect example. If Isaiah Canyon was a guy that was already ranked as a five star when he was a sophomore, I don't know if Notre Dame has a shot to get him. Maybe because he's a unique kid, maybe. But part of the deal they got him right is they went and found him early, and got yeah. on him before anybody else did. And they were able to sell the things that really mattered to him and get that interest to where now the 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 new pitches coming in don't work for him. But if those pitches were the ones that sunk into his head, then it'd be a little harder for Notre Dame to sell something different. And so that's another thing to do is not every not every elite player is an elite player right now. Like yeah. If you look at the NFL draft last night, Ryan, I, I looked up the numbers of the NFL draft last night. It was, it was very fascinating. Let, let me find it here real quick. But – we, we kind of do this deal every year. There were 12 five-star guys drafted last night. So out of 31 picks, only 12 were five-star. The first-round picks are five-star recruits. Nine were four-star. So, again, higher percentage of those guys, right? But there were eight three-star guys, and there were two guys that were not even ranked, including the number five overall pick in the top corner on the board were both – was Devin Witherspoon was not even ranked coming out of high school. Wow. The four cornerbacks that were drafted last night, the, the highest ranking for the four corners that were picked last night was number 186 overall. Christian Gonzalez was 326, Deontay Banks was 854, and Devin Witherspoon wasn't even good enough to get ranked coming out of high school. Right? Four defensive ends got picked last night. Miles Murphy was the number seven overall player in the country. Tyree Wilson was number 471. 
Will McDonald was number 787, and Lucas Van Ness was one number 1,063. <laughs> right? Edge players, one, Nolan Smith was number one, but Nolan Smith got picked after Will Anderson, who was number 17, and Nolan Smith got picked one spot ahead of Felix and Aduki Uzoma, who was the number 2,421 player in the country coming out of high school. One linebacker got drafted last night. He was the number 662 player in the country coming out of high school. Right. So, you know, re receivers, another Jackson Smith and Jigba, five star recruit, number 29 player in the country. Quentin Johnston, four star recruit, number 71 player in the country. Jordan Addison, four star recruit, but number 275 player in the country. Zay Flowers, the number 1,188 player in the country coming to high school. So all of them became stars. They just yeah. took different paths. What Notre Dame has to do is do a better job of finding the Zay Flowerses. They need to do a better job of finding the Lucas Van Nesses, the Jack Campbells, the 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 Tyree Wilsons, guys like that. That's what Bubakar – Bubakar is Tyree Wilson for me. If Bubakar reaches his full potential, they're going to be saying things about him that they're saying about Tyree Wilson. Would you agree that there's some truth, some Possible. merit to that, Ryan? Like it's when possible. you look at the skill set and and just long and twitchy and you know he could he has that kind of upside. Now does he have a long way to go to get there? Yes, but you know what? We'd have been saying the same exact thing about Tyree Wilson if he would have signed with Notre Dame. This kid's a three star kid, like top barely top five hundred. But man, he's long, he's athletic, he's got some tools. He's just gonna need some work, right? Yes. And that's what you need to do. That's what Notre Dame needs to do is find those kind of guys. The feel, the kid from Kansas State's not ranked anywhere close to where Umar Armel Mukum is, but Armel Mukum also isn't anywhere close to what Nolan Smith was. Yep. So, elite players are not always elite players and as seniors in high school. That's what you need to find, and I think this staff is doing a pretty good job of that. Ryan, I mean, who who the heck thought Brandon Hillman was a big time player until Notre Dame got involved, right? So I think the staff is doing a pretty good job of that. I, I really I do. I, I like what they're doing. I really do. Want like a, what they're doing. Want a random tidbit on Zay Flowers? He has thirteen brothers and sisters. Are you serious? Wow, thirteen brothers and sisters. <laughs> you don't see that as much nowadays. My dad's no. one of eleven, right? My dad's, my one, grandma, of, my dad's one of eight. So yeah, yeah, my grandmother's like one of thirteen. You should see that a lot more. They don't yeah. see that as much nowadays. Who was the guy? Was there um? Oh, there was another player that I read. Was it a? I don't think. I'm trying to remember there was a an NFL guy, or maybe he's a guy that's going to get drafted. It's like one of 17. Wow. I'm trying that's to remember who, where did I read that? It was recent, it was some kind of sports story. It's like maybe it's a guy who's who's a rookie or something. I don't know, but it was some kind I, of story. I, I know like I know Antonio Cromarty has like 14 kids. Yeah, well, that's a little different animal. <laughs> you know, like this is more of a you know, one family having a bunch yeah, of know. kids, right? I know. So yeah. I know, I know. I was just told oh. that story of Antonio Cromartie. It's so funny. Yeah, un unreal. <laughs> All right, let's get down to uh, some. I have another super chat down here from Quinn Kibler. Quinn says, I have seen Jane Daniels in several top 10 quarterback lists for 2023, which seems high. Dare I say, could regress this year given his coach's history. It's possible. But I, I yeah. you know, look, the one time that I felt like Notre Dame didn't, man. It's huh, a good one because I, I I say this I don't think he's going to regress for a couple reasons, and the biggest one being Mike Dembrock. I, that's the thing. I, I have a lot more faith in Mike Dembrock than I do Brian Kelly. Yeah, and I don't think Brian Kelly is as, and this is not Involved. meant to be an insult, not in because because that's going to come across as an insult, and I don't mean it to be. I, I'm trying to be fair here. I think Brian Kelly is not as my as much of a micromanager as he was in 2015 and 2016 when he. Like 2015 offense was clicking, and then he starts getting his little paws in there, and he wants Mike Sanford to do more, and, do, and he's picking the quarterback. He wants Deshaun Kaiser instead of Malik, whereas Denbrock wanted Malik and all that other kind of stuff. Um, I think he's allowing them to coach more, in my opinion. It's a good thing, and that's why I just don't think there's going to be the regression. And also, I don't think he was phenomenal last year. I think he's a top-10 quarterback, but I think there's still room for him to improve because – the other thing is he's going into year two of that offense, which I think is just naturally going to allow him to, to be a little bit more effective because he's running the same offense for a second year in a row. So I'm comfortable with Jaden Daniels being the top 10. I think I think we had him in ours, right, Ryan? Didn't we talk about that? So. Like we both would have had him at the bottom of our top 10. Yeah. So I'm think, comfortable with that, with him being top 10. After, I think it was like after like five or six, it's like start splitting hairs between yeah. guys at that yeah. point, right? And it's like – Jane Daniels brings a nice dual threat element to the game, right? Like he's a good runner. He's, he's 
pretty efficient passer last year for the most part. I mean, this guy's the best receiver coming back, Malik Neighbors, number one tight end, number one running back. All, the offensive line, actually, for LSU last year was super young, so they're bringing back pretty much everyone on offensive line as well. So, I mean, that offense comes back pretty much intact with Mike Denbrock as well. So, the LSU's offense will be good this year. They'll be yeah. good. Uh, it should be. It should be. And I, and they got rid of some headaches, if we're going to be honest about it. They got rid of some headaches, yeah, which is going to help some, them a little bit. Yeah, they got rid of some rid of uh, some pain in the bootes. Am I right? Yeah. There you, yeah, yeah. Well done. Well yes. done. Very well done. Got another super chat down here from Andrew Hoffman. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew says, do you have a sense for how Coach Marcus Freeman and the position coaches address transfers with the team, especially with all the noise the team sees online? preemptively discuss or talk about each one after the fact. I think they've done both from what I've been told. You know, I was told recently of a story where, um, you know, I think coach told the team, I think he was, I think this was a team thing is, is how it was related to me if I'm relaying it incorrectly, but he talked about how there was actually a kid that coach Freeman was telling the team about a player on the current team that he said, Hey, just so you know, like you're not going to play a lot. And we understand if you want to leave, we'd love for you to stay. And he was like, I'm not going anywhere because he, he wants to be a part of He wants to get that degree, but he also wants to be a part of what this team is building. There's a lot. It's kind of like recruiting. Yeah, Notre Dame had like, you know, three really tough decommitments. Yeah. I don't think Jaden Lamar was a tough decommitment. I, I, I used to go player, but whatever. Dylan Edwards stung, you know, yeah. uh, Peyton Bowen stung, and Keon Keeley stung, right? Of the guys that were publicly committed. And that those hurt, right? But the vast majority of that class didn't leave. I mean, that's the thing is, right? Like we're focused so much on the three guys that transferred and you're forgetting there's 80 some dudes on scholarship who aren't transferring right yeah. now. You know what I mean? And so what do you want to focus on? The, the negative small or the fact that most of these kids are completely bought in and part of the reason this team is going to be okay is because of that. So I think part of it, Andrew, is just uh, you address it. But the other thing too is you don't make a big deal out of it. You say, hey, look, we've told you all from day one, those who stay, are going to be part of something special. Those who want to compete are going to stay here and compete. And if you don't want to be part of that, God bless you. We love you. But this isn't the place for you. I don't think you need to make it. Because, And here's the thing. This is so true, Ryan. Players do not react to these things as emotionally as fans do. Sure. Just don't. Most of them are like, yeah, I understand it, man. That's my boy. I love you. Good luck wherever you're going. This isn't the place for you. It's all good. Still love you. You're still my boy. And then... They move on, right? That's how most of these kids are. We're the ones being emotional about this. Yeah, The players aren't because they also look and say, man, we love Logan. We wish he was with us. He's one of our brothers. But we've got Audric. We've got Jay and Jadarian, you know, we've got – we're going to be okay. We're going to keep rolling. doesn't mean you have ill will towards the guy that left. You say, man, we love you, you, you know, but you got to do what you got to do. And we're going to keep rolling and do what we got to do. That's how most of these kids are. Uh, the fans act the way that we act that. Yes. And then we think that that's happening in the locker room and it's not, you know, like it can Andrew, it can, but this team is just not there. This is a, this is a much healthier football team emotionally and mentally than it was a year ago where you had a lot more of the, and I'll be honest with you. There is a lot less of the Brian Kelly leftover attitude because of a lot of these guys are leaving for the NFL and for the transfer portal. And you're getting more and more and more and more of the guys that are here because of what Marcus Freeman is selling. And that's a good thing, right? Now, some of the guys that are not Marcus Freeman recruits have bought in to what Marcus Freeman is selling. That's also true. Michael Mayer was completely bought into what Marcus Freeman was selling. Isaiah Foskey was not. The Adam Yolos were not. Brandon Joseph was not. Others are. That's true everywhere. There's clearly Barry Alexander wasn't completely bought into what Kirby Smart was saying because he thought other things were more important and being developed into a like why would you go to USC to play D tackle to play D tackle yeah. and not yeah. play Georgia? Yeah. Like seriously. It's because he doesn't care about championships and he wants the money now. He wants the he wants the to all the, the he wants the immediate gratification. He doesn't want to stay and work. He doesn't want to to to, to do what Jalen Carter and some of these guys have had to do, which is wait your turn. Guy played a bunch last year. Yeah. Do you think he left because it's a bad culture? Or, you know, no, he left because uh, more things are important to him. And you know what? The players are like, hey man, good luck. All good. Now we're gonna move on. And that's where this team is right now. 
we are the ones as fans that are emotional about this and sky is falling. There's that's not happening inside the locker room at all. Like if I went to a Notre Dame coach was like or a Notre Dame player and said, Hey man, this is the way the fans are reacting. What do you guys think? They'd, be, they'd probably laugh. Like, seriously? Wow. Like that's not that big a deal. Right. I mean, we understand it. We've known he's wanted to leave for a long time. We, and we understood that it was the brotherhood that made him stay as long as he did. So he's leaving. It is what it is. It's all good. Thank you. So um, they they would probably get a kick out of the 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 manner in which we're reacting, and that's true a lot. Same thing with the decommitments. This guy left. The class is going to fall apart. Why? <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with me? Keon's got to do what he's got to do. I'm not going anywhere. And you know, but to fans, it's the sky is falling. That's on us. That's not on them. And yeah. that's the reality of it. But there there does require some some conversation about it andrew and that conversation has led to more of a big picture has led to that he doesn't have to address every single situation no. uh so so very fair question ryan I, but I I, I I think i think the players need to know that you're open to having the conversation yes. you need to have it though right like you can't hide from it i think mm -hmm. is the biggest no. thing though no no yeah. and he's been open about those things but it's just yeah. kind of one of those things where it's like we don't need to address this because this is the way that football is now yeah because you also can't tell some kids to leave and then get pissed off when another kid chooses to leave. Please. Like, yeah, right, right. You got to be consistent with it, you yep. know. No doubt. All right, let's get down. We have some more super chats here. We got Billy, Billy D. Williams. We got Pete Weber in the oh. chat. You know, we got Pete Weber in the chat. We got Billy D. Williams in the chat. So hey, let's roll. It's famous people watch this show, man. How good? <laughs> <laughs> How good can Jabron Payne be? Is he star potential? His juice in what limited glimpses we saw from spring was downright impressive. Uh, is he star potential? No. If if there comes a day where Jabron Payne is the leading running is the lead uh, the number one back in Notre Dame, can he be a thousand yard rusher and a, a part of a really good offense? Absolutely. Yeah. Is he a star? No, I don't think he's a star. I think he's a really good college running back. I think he's Logan Diggs is what I think he is. Right, Nothing Logan Dix is that? never going to be a first round. He's never going to get picked where Jameer Gibbs was picked. He's never going to get picked where Bijan Robinson was picked. He's probably a early day three guy, late day two guy at best when his career is over. Would you yep. agree with that? Yeah. But he's a darn good college. His game just doesn't translate to the NFL as well. But he's a darn good college running back that can be part of a really good offense. And that's kind of how I feel about it. I don't. Yep. I don't not. And that's how I feel about jabron Payne. i think jabron Payne could be a lead back for notre dame be a 1200 rusher and you have a great offense he just doesn't translate to being a star very productive and and you know it's part of it's you're you're taking advantage of having a great offensive line as well but um that's kind of my uh my two cents on that one and, and billy i mean i th i think that you don't need him to be a star though when you have the depth you have in that room right it's like i could just have a bunch of Good to very good running backs with the offensive line that Notre Dame traditionally has, and hopefully a, a really good scheme, and you'll be good, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, Brian, think about the Georgia team this year, right? Did Georgia have a star running back this year? That's some highly bunch ranked of, guys, but they weren't playing to the level of their high school rankings for bunch, different reasons. Bunch of good runs, right? Like they're just good players. Kenny McIntosh is a good player. Branson Robinson is a good player. Like those guys are just good. Are they stars? No, they're not stars. Not on the college level, anyway. I mean, we'll see if. Hopefully Kendall Milton can stay healthy and maybe he could be that guy. Like who knows? But as of right now, they're just all a bunch of good running backs and there's right. nothing wrong with that, man. You could win with a bunch of good running backs. Two yep. years ago, Alabama had Brian Robinson as their lead running back who had a really nice season. Brian Robinson wasn't a star. He was just a good running back, man. Good, tough runner. And there's nothing wrong with that. Notre Dame averaged about 300 yards rushing per game in a year where their best running back was a guy who was an undrafted free agent. Josh Adams. And their next best running back was an undrafted free agent and their next best running back was a sixth round draft pick and their next best running back had a trouble getting on the field at washington state when he transferred Deion yeah, mcintosh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah right so now other positions you need impact talent you can't do that on the defensive line and, and have an elite defensive line right yep. you can't do that at corner receiver you need some big time, and but and that's the thing is there are certain positions Notre Dame has to up that you can't just scheme your way or you know rely on other things. You got to be pretty good. Yep. Running backs just not necessarily one of those. And also, if I got four really good backs, my production is going to equal your production with one great back. Great yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's it's like do you want one Bijan or do you want four 
Aldrich Estimates, right? I'm just right. like, you know, yeah, probably taking Aldrich Estimates, <laughs> right. you know, like, <laughs> right. No disrespect I mean, to Bijan because he's great. I'd, r- but I'd rather have one Bijan, one Audric, one Price, yes. one Love, and oh. you know. But yes. you know, it is what it is. It is 100%. what it is. But no, that's not a position I'm at all. I'm all. I'm, I'm at all concerned about moving forward. To be honest with you, I have a super chat from here from Wicked Bronco Productions. I'm going to get to your other bigger one, but I accidentally just unclicked it, so I'm going to go find that again. So oh, let's man. pull that one up there, right? And Wicked sends the super chat. Thank you so much for the super chat. Has Freeman lost his luster with these five-star recruits? A little bit, but not – I mean, that's it, it's in a normal expected manner, right? Yeah. I mean – He's he's not the new guy anymore, right? Right. Like, I mean, and he's got to go not, win. Yeah, yeah, he's got to go win. He's still having a big impact on recruiting. But here's another thing, too. Notre Dame has adjusted its recruiting strategy a little bit this year. Yeah. And they're – it's not that they're afraid to go after big-time kids because they are. It's just there are certain positions where they're just not doing it. And – you know, and and but at the same time, you got to understand. Sometimes the luster is the only reason you're, because it's it's not much. The only reason that you're even in the game with some of these kids at all ever is because of Marcus Freeman. Now you're, it's just not enough to get them, right? Yes. I mean, that's the reality of it. If Marcus Freeman's not the head coach at Notre Dame right now, I I don't know if they're even in the ball game for Justin Scott at this point in time with how things went down. Yeah, but he's able to kind of walk in like a rock star and immediately get you back on track. So it's just it's some kids in some parts of the country. Southeast is probably not as impactful as it was, but in the Midwest, Northeast, West Coast, it's still very impactful. Uh, but it, and it comes right back if they go out and win this year. It does. It comes right back. And the way they ended the season last year, it comes back. But it'll be a little bit like this until he just really the team, the program takes off. You're, you're going to yep. see that a little bit. It's and the here's substance, that substance behind the message, right? right? Like that's the end of the right. day. Yep. Right. Here's that next super chat from Wicked Bronco Productions. Wicked, thank you again for the super chat. Big one. Appreciate you very much. Any concerns with Notre Dame recruiting? This time last year, we were what Michigan is now, hitting commitments left and right. And the number one class, now I've heard Justin Scott was crystal ball to Miami. We probably lost both Smith twins, Aaron Scott, et cetera. Why are we missing? Okay. Number one, I don't care about what a crystal ball said about Miami from a person who I like, but constantly changes crystal balls in order to get his percentage where it is. Okay. And I put zero stock in a system that allows you to constantly change a crystal ball. Hey, do it once. And then if your percentage is in the nineties and you've, and you can't do it within a, a month of a kid committing, then I'm impressed. Um, he had a good time at Miami likes Miami. I'm going to have an update on the board here soon on the premium board, but I'm not concerned and no one that I know is concerned right now. I just don't care. I mean, look, there was a, I, I mean, there's been so many of these jokes. I had to sit here and deal with last year. We were joking about you and I have joked about this where people are talking about, you know, Jeremiah loves trending to Texas A&M while you're oh in negotiations, <laughs> while you're in negotiation, not negotiation, but like you and his dad are trying to work out the details of when he's going to come on our show and to commit, commit two weeks <laughs> later. Yeah. Right? yeah. He's already committed to Notre Dame, and I'm here. Oh, he's trending to Texas A&M, right? I remember Xavier Watts. I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone with his dad, and we're laughing about someone had just crystal balled him to Nebraska, and he had committed to Notre Dame the day before. <laughs> right? I mean, so I'm – Oh, serious. do you remember Do you remember Braylon James in TCU last year oh, too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember talking to his dad about that. He was so pissed. <laughs> that was one of the worst ones ever, man. Yeah. Literally, I remember we talked. Yeah, I remember I talked to his dad too, and he's like, Where the heck is that coming from, man? Like, yeah. what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. He's like, Mike's not going anywhere. It's uh, just, it's all, all of it's just so much. But see, we only remember the two that they lost. Yes. Right. That's, yeah. that's the reality of it. Uh, am I concerned with Notre Dame? I'm concerned that it's April 28th and we're still five months from signing day. That's the only concern that I have <laughs> to, to your point. And, and I want to make sure that we're clear on some stuff. We addressed the Justin Scott thing. They did not lose the Smith twins. They were in a position where they could have pushed for Jacob or taken Cole Mullins. They decided to take Cole Mullins because Ryan and you and I have talked about, they like the Smith twins. They've never pushed for the Smith twins because there were better players on the board. Bryce Young is going to make a decision on Saturday. That's been known, right? We know where Notre Dame stood there. They like him better than Jared. Fact. 
So they didn't lose them. They took better players. Now, you all may not agree with that because they're not ranked as high. But Notre Dame doesn't care. Notre Dame cares about the film. Aaron Scott, they were never going to get Aaron Scott. They've already got two corners recruited right now. Yeah, it's a miss, but they're going to lose an Ohio kid. I mean, when you call him a loss, you weren't going to get him. You were tried. You put in your best effort. You had a you, had, you were in the game. They were never the leader for that kid. No. And so I think part of it is you have to understand the recruiting business is designed. It doesn't work as a business if there's not drama. And so, so much of this is just created drama in an attempt to make recruiting what it really isn't. And a lot of times, I mean, kids will buy into it and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is, is there's been so many times we hear, oh, so-and-so's crystal ball. We kept telling you all last year. Now, again, I I get it. You could say, well, yeah, you also told us that Peyton Bone wasn't going anywhere. I get that. I get that. But most of these kids, we kind of had an idea when things weren't going in the right direction, right? Peyton Bone is a bit of an anomaly. But we had all these rumors about Jeremiah Love and Braylon James and Jane Greathouse. I mean, think about all the kids that there were rumors about that ended up not nothing. There was one about Sullivan Absher. Remember that? He was going to flip to NC State. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that that one was a thing. Braylon James, TCU, Jane Greathouse oh, in Texas. Do, do you remember what, when Braylon was Cooper about Flanagan to commit? in Alabama. That's yeah. another one. When Braylon James was about to commit to Notre Dame too, Brian. You remember, remember who people were pushing that was the, the front runner for Braylon James at the time? Everyone was saying it was Texas, and then we talked to his, his parent, his dad, and him, and it's like I, I was never going to go to Texas. Like, Braylon, all, Braylon like, always <laughs> said I don't want to go to school in state, and yeah, I definitely yeah. don't want to go to Texas. Yeah, he would have went to like Stanford if he didn't go to Notre Dame. Right. Like that's kind of where we right. are with that one, right? Like, <laughs> but but that was the thing that came out. So I mean, yeah. look, I'm not bashing them; they have a business to run. Uh, sure. I'm not even bashing them. I'm just saying. We try to take a different approach to it. We try not to play the emotional game. So like, here's the facts. If there's something to worry about, I promise you, we'll tell you. I, yeah. I promise you, we'll tell you. We're just not going to play the emotional up and down game. And if some of you want to do that, that's fine. I get that. But that's why I say I don't want that stuff on my board. I don't want that stuff bring brought here because I don't want to play the emotional game. And I don't want to have to respond to every ridiculous crystal ball that some people. And I'm not saying that Steve's crystal ball is that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm making up. A lot of them are. A lot of them are just like, come on. Right. Like, w- w- didn't a crystal ball get put in for Gerby Lambert like six months ago? W- what's going on there? Right. 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 Like, kid hasn't taken an official visit anywhere. Weren't there a bunch of crystal balls that ca- went in for Caleb Brewer, I believe, to Notre Dame? You know, things change. It's part there's of the deal. All, there, there's also crystal balls out there. It's probably changed since then because you could change them, but there were crystal balls at one point for both the Smith twins. Yep. And for TJ Lindsay. And for TJ Lindsay to Notre Dame. Yeah. Right. And where, where are those? Yeah. Right. So we're just not going to play. Look, recruiting right now is going fine. Is it going elite? Great. No, not right now, but there's a board out there for them to like somebody put on the board. It was hilarious. Somebody was like, would you be okay with this dream class? And they said, CJ Carr, um, it was young, CJ probably. Carr, Neus Williams, Kedron Young, yeah, and Cam Williams, Isaiah Canyon, Jason Robinson, Micah Gilbert, Jack Larson, Styles Prescott, Gearby Lambert, Peter Jones, and Anthony Knapp. I'm like, that's that's your dream class? Like, that's not even pie in the sky, dude. That's what I think is going that's to possible. happen. Yeah, I know. It's very you know possible. What I mean, like, that's my. And, and but it's just kind of like that class is. And when I mean like not a dream class, I mean like that's not a. When I think dream class, I think like, oh man, if everything goes right. Like yeah. that, that's if I had to predict right now, I, I think there's a decent chance that that actually happens a hundred percent every single one. It may be, maybe not, but I, I think there's a chance that they hit on all those. It's a pretty good freaking class. Oh, you know? offensively, but, it's an excellent class. There's a couple of positions that I have questions about for sure, but like for the, the line, most part, yeah, defense safety, line, linebacker, linebacker, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But even on the D line, we're going to feel a lot better about where that is by the end of the weekend. And it's in a, it's in a, you know, you, you got to hit a couple, hit a couple out of the park linebacker. I feel a lot better about linebacker today than I did a, a couple weeks ago, but it's Three still a big ago, question yeah. mark because you <laughs> yeah. gotta, you gotta close, right? You can't lose momentum of what you have now. Safety is a big question mark for me right now, yeah. but yeah. two weeks ago, I thought they had zero chance with Jalen Dewan lane. And now I'm like, they're in the ball game for Dewan lane, but you got to close. So there's work to be done, but Notre Dame right now has a chance I'll say this, if Notre Dame, if, if I were to create the dream class for Notre Dame, we just did the offensive one, 
Okay, defensively, let's say Bryce Young, Justin Scott, you already got Cole Mullins, and either Elijah Rushing or Malachi Williams. That'd be with a Owen great Wayful. D-line class. With, yeah. Already with Owen Wayful and Cole yeah. Mullins, right? That'd be a great D-line class, in my opinion. Linebacker class. Cole, if they get Chris Cole, Kingston Viliyama, Asa, and Bodie Cahoon, I am fired up about that class. If they get Leonard Moore, Carson Hobbs, and Caleb Beasley at corner, I'm fired up about that group. If they get Dewan Lane, uh, Kennedy Erlacher, and Davis Andrews, I'm fired up about that safety position. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. That is a that is an elite class to me. I don't care where it's ranked. Don't care because Davis Andrews is never going to be ranked properly. Leonard Moore's never going to be ranked properly. He's the next Benjamin Morrison from a ranking standpoint. I'm not saying he's as good as Benjamin, but you get my point. Cole Mullins is never is not going to go from three star to top 150 like he should, in my opinion. But for how I look at that, that's a great class. Might even be better than last year's class. Don't care what's ranked. It might be better. Than Notre Dame class. is in the top three for every single one of the kids I just mentioned. That's a good place to be in April. But now the key is, okay, but can you close? That's the question. And that's where the – I don't even want to say concern, but that's where the need is. Can you close? Right. But you're in a good place. You're in a good place, and you just need to close it out. Will they do that? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Give Neither does anybody else. No matter what you call it, you don't have a crystal ball. Because the crystal ball tells you something you don't know, Right. What they do now is they take something that someone tells them and they go with it. It's not crystal ball. That's not reading the tea leaves. That's I'm doing what I'm told or or what people tell me or where things are trending because of information I've gathered, right? That's why I actually like what Rivals calls it better. It's a forecast, yeah, right? Because a forecast is kind of saying, hey, this is what it's trending. This is the direction it's going. I actually like that better. And and a forecast can can change, right? Like a weather forecast, it can change, yeah. A crystal ball comes across as predictive, and that's not yeah. really what. And then they explain what a crystal ball is, and I'm like, that's not what a crystal ball is. You're you're talking about trends. Yeah. Crystal ball is not a trend, right? It's not a magic eight ball where you shake it and it tells you something different every time, right? So it, it it's false advertising if we're going to be completely honest with you. But um, you know, I, I'm what is on three call theirs? Do you have any I have idea? No idea? I think it might just be a prediction. I think it's just yeah, a sure. prediction. Imagine that. Yeah. Okay. But uh, look, they got a lot of work to do. They do. Yeah. But I like where they're at. Now they just got to close. They got to finish. And I and and there's a co- the, I'll say this right, except for safety, I feel a lot better about D line and linebacker recruiting right now than I did three weeks ago. It's fair. Even yeah. two weeks ago, it was two weeks ago, we're like, you know, they're probably going to take the Smith Twins. And look, guys, they're solid players. Don't be upset. Don't cry. They're good, solid football players. And a lot of people were upset, and now they are perceived to have lost them and people are now mad about it. It's like, you guys got to pick a lane here. Okay. But the reason that they're not in on now is because they went and got, they knocked the Cole Mullins visit out of the park. He's a better player than Jacob, in my opinion. And you know who else agrees with me? The Notre Dame coaching staff. Now we could be wrong. We could be wrong. Ryan could be right. We'll see. But the reality is it's a, it's a conversation to be had. It's not like it's, Ryan's like, I can't believe Driscoll thinks Cole Mullins better than Jerry, Jerry Jacob Smith. Like, that is the dumbest. No, Ryan thinks Jacob's a little better. I think Cole's better. They're both good football players. Notre Dame staff thought Cole was better. We'll find out if they're right or not. But they got who they wanted. Yep. You know, and that's the reality of it. Now they just got to close in some other guys. Close. So we'll see. Time. They do have, hey guys, can I remind you they have a five star quarterback and a five star receiver committed in the class? Did, have you forgotten that? But see, that's the whole thing is if CJ Carr and Cam Williams committed this week, oh, if they were not today. in the class, <laughs> huh? They'd be pumped right now. They'd be like, right? If if they if if they were not committed and they both committed at the Blue Gold game, no one would ask this question because yeah. the timing because it's an emotional response. I'm emotionally responding to the present moment as opposed to someone who sits back and looks at. Where are they? Big picture. So if they had the same exact class that they have right now, but it, yep. but but it, it got that way because at the spring game you got a commitment from Peter Jones, uh, CJ Carr, and 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 Cam Williams, and let me think here for another one, um, Leonard Moore, all yeah. committed at the spring game. We would be talking about like, oh my God, they're gonna they're gonna do great because we'd be riding the emotional high of those guys all committing. But because yep. they committed a summer ago, it's just kind of like, okay, well, you know, 
it is what it is. But what are we doing now? <laughs> right now, they have a freaking five-star quarterback and a five-star receiver in their class. That's what they're doing right now. They they need um they need they need CJ Carr to renew his vows and then they'll. I mean, honestly, seriously, <laughs> it, people would be happier about recruiting right now if CJ Carr would have like gone on three visits and then renewed his his Notre Dame commitment. I mean, it, it's yeah. sad, but that's just the reality of it. Yeah. Um, like a guy was like, "Hey, is uh, CJ locked in?" I'm like, "Yes, he is." He's like, "Well, has he said so publicly?" I was like, "CJ Carr does not have to come out here every week and reaffirm his week, love and affection." Man. Because you are emotional about it and you're paranoid about something, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I was joking about the renewing the vows thing, but it actually is kind of like renewing the vows. Like they need to hear that affirmation that, like, yeah, man, I still yeah. love this school. Like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, it's unhealthy. <laughs> it's, very unhealthy. It's, it's very unhealthy. It's I have very unhealthy. One from uh, Wicked Bronco Productions says, I don't understand the Diggs transfer. Either he didn't want to share first-team reps with Estimate or he couldn't handle the heat of Jabron Payne, Jeremiah Love, and Jadarian Price. I, I think the sharing reps thing is part of it, but I'm, I'm telling yeah. you all, it's not always about that. I, I think a lot of it was just he would just never felt comfortable here. Yep. I mean, I, I not everything is nefarious, guys. Not everything has some, like, hidden what really happened this is some drama not everything's a soap opera sometimes kids are just like you know i love my brothers but i just don't want to be here and i want to be closer to home and i'm going to use this as an excuse like i've said this before like kids who don't come to Notre Dame because of the weather or the girls that's not why they're not coming to Notre Dame. there's another reason why they're just using that as an excuse yeah. right and and so you know, I, I don't think Logan Diggs is a worried about heat. If again, if kids that come to Notre Dame are usually not worried about competition. And if he chooses to go back home to LSU, guys, he's not worried about competition. If he didn't want to actually like in reality face competition, he'd go to like Troy or Louisiana Lafayette or something. Right. I just think that's the excuse that was kind of used to help him feel better about wanting to go because it's not, you know, manly to say I want to be closer to my mom. Oh, I wish I lived closer to my mom. Very, very much wish I lived closer to my mom. But I'm also 45 years old, about to be 45 years old. Logan's 19, 20. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and just never felt comfortable here. That's That doesn't make him soft. doesn't mean he's afraid of competition. It just means his circumstances. There's 80-some kids on his team. They're not all going to feel the same way about everything. This, I mean, Notre Dame lost guys. You guys know that they lost transfers from guys who played on the 1988 title team. Arnold Ali, what what happened? He he wanted to he was, wanted to get closer to home. He went to UCLA. He started. He played a bunch on that eighty eight team. It happens. Doesn't mean that Lou Holtz was losing his program, right? They had they had other guys transfer. I mean, Dorsey Levens, Kent Graham. I mean, we could go down this long list of guys that transferred that ended up becoming NFL football players. Does that mean Lou Holtz was part of a sinking ship? No, it's just how football works. Especially when you recruit the way that Marcus Freeman and his staff are recruiting. Yeah. So. Anyway, I'm super to, from John Burdut. And I don't like it, but I also yeah. can't be a hypocrite and say that no kid should transfer because I transferred for my freshman year and I started. I wasn't afraid of competition. I just, I didn't have a good relationship with the coaching staff and I was lied to. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't put in the work that I needed to put in the work for people that I didn't believe in and trust. And I made an immature decision. I went to a school for football only and didn't take enough account how miserable I'd be living in Vietnam, North Carolina. I made a bad decision and it created another bad decision or not another a tough decision. Cause then I had to transfer. So I, sometimes kids just, they're not happy somewhere. I couldn't, I could, I'm the last person to fault the kid for that. I'd be the biggest hypocrite in the world. I just think that the, the one-time transfer thing helps, but here's the thing about Logan Diggs. I don't think Logan Diggs is making an emotional decision here. He's been, do, go, he's been battling for a long, long time. time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, not every circumstance is the same. And that's right. why I just wish we'd say, hey, look, I'm bummed. You do you. We're going we're gonna to move forward to guys that are that want to be here and yep. wish them the best. That's it, man. But I also understand that the passion that makes people feel react that way is also what keeps them coming back to this team. And we're glad that you do. It's fandom, man. It's fandom. Yep. And I, yep. you know, I, I get it. Trust me, I get it. I get it. All right, here we go. Let's get one here down from Michael Collins. Michael says, if this hasn't already been addressed, how is team morale? 
Is the team mostly behind Sam Hartman and the coaches, or are there or are these departures taking their yeah. toll? We someone talked about earlier that the kids are fine. I mean, I've yeah. talked to parents, I've talked to people around the program, and and people that would. I mean, you know the people I talk to, Ryan. They're straight as straight shooters as you're going to find. Yes, and they haven't always been happy with stuff. And they're like, no, the kids are fine. They understand. This is guys. This is just part of football. I mean, you can't get mad about guys leaving when you're also getting guys to come in. That's just part of the game, right? Yep. I'll just say this. There's a, the kids liked Tyler. They did. The receivers liked Tyler as a, as, as a person and they would have played hard for him, but they, they understand what's there now. They understand why this decision was made and they fully support it because they know what they know, what their goals are and they know what that Sam can help them get there. Yes. And that's, and that doesn't mean that they dislike Tyler wouldn't play for Tyler. And again, not everything's a soap opera. Right, we can turn it into it in the media. We can try to turn it into a soap opera. Oh, Tyler versus Sam. Well, Tyler and Sam didn't feel that though. I mean, they, they were battling, but they didn't view it. They had a great relationship, you know. And you know, the kids understand it. That they're they're, they're 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 behind Sam, but they would have also been behind Tyler if Tyler started. If Tyler beat Sam out, they would have been behind Tyler. But Sam was is they know who Sam is, and they know what he's going to bring to this offense, and they're excited about it. And it doesn't mean they dislike not Michael's not saying that it doesn't mean that they dislike Tyler. They just know that Sam Hartman's different and he brings something different to the table. And every major scrimmage they've had proved that, that this, when, when, when it matters, I don't care what he did in a Tuesday, third down blitz practice that makes people formulate their entire opinions of spring ball based off one third down blitz day. Right. They care about in that scrimmage, or it was live bullets and it was an actual game situation. Dude lit it up and his team won. They got we, to the spring game. Dude lit it up and his team won. That's what the players see. That's yeah, and I, we've heard that really early in this process too. I remember I was talking to a parent, Brian, of a wide receiver that is on campus now who said, like, I think it was one of the first workouts they had in the winter. He was like, yeah, they, they say Sam's really legit. Yeah. Like he's legit. So it, this has been a thing, right? Like this isn't just like, yes, the blue goal game. He turned it on for the first time. Like right. they've been seeing this since the winter. They've been right. <laughs> right. Well, that's the other one too, is I remember, I remember I did a, uh, a mid spring Intel and they're like, yeah, Sam's better than we thought. Like, and, and then like we got in the next practice and it's like a third down blitz practice. And it's like, there's certain people like turn. It's like, Oh, Sam strum. No, he's not. Right. Do you guys not? This is about you not knowing what you're watching than anything else. It's a practice. He's yep. fine. Right. This yep. is, but, but what the Notre Dame people were saying, it's not that he's better than we thought because he completed 95%. It's the leadership, the ability to connect to the players, the ability to consume the offense. No, he doesn't have it all figured out now, but he's so much further ahead than we thought he would be. You know, the ability to connect with the players. Are they there yet? No, but they're, that's what they were talking about. And as we came to see by the end of the spring, that's exactly what we were seeing on the football field, you know? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's it. That's it, man. Yeah. All right. Let's get to some more questions here. Uh, we've got one from, um, there we go. From oh, Sam I just realized, This is the guy who used to be TB 12 for Heisman. <laughs> SH10 just for Heisman that. now. SH10 for that. Heisman. What are the early returns on Jared Parker as a recruiter at the offensive coordinator position? Very good. Very yeah. good. I mean, he hasn't had a chance to, for it to show in results yet because most of their top guys were already on board, right? He already had a tight end. They already had a five-star quarterback. They already had a, But, I mean, we've heard a lot of good things from wide receivers about the impact that Jared Parker had meeting with them because he's a wide receiver. I mean, he played wide receiver in the SEC. He's been a wide receivers coach most of his career. That's really his best position as a coach. Yes. Where he'll sit down with them and explain their vision and he can speak their language, right? I mean, Jared Parker, again, played in the SEC. He can speak the language of what these kids want to hear and what, what they can yep. do for them. And, and and it's not a surprise that all of a sudden Notre Dame's got a chance to sign a really good receiver class in 24 again and then another one in 25 because you have an offensive coordinator that can speak that language on top of having a five-star quarterback in your class in this, this year. So early returns are good, but it's uh, with anything, it's too early to tell. Yeah. That that's the reality. I, of it. I mean, I will say there are some examples of really good returns early on, right? Because I, like Jason Robinson, when he was on his visit two weeks ago now, I mean, he talked a lot about, and 
the fact that it wasn't as much chancy stucky that kind of like really had like he had the impact as most mo- the biggest impact in the visit it was jared parker be- being right. able to sit down and like ask like how, how how am i going to be using this offense like what are you phil- philosophically going to do and so i you're, you're starting to hear coach parker more and more with other positions right like not just the tight ends on the board you're starting to hear it with the wide receivers and in, in different capacities which is great and that's smart recruiting because Chancey already had that connection with Jason. So you don't need to repeat that again. It's about, okay, let's get him, let's get the, let's give the OC the shot. And that's how good yes. recruiting happens. And so, so far, so good. No, again, that was anything, guys. They got to close, right? I mean, a year ago, we were talking about Notre Dame having an, an, a great defensive class, and, it was, and then they lose Keon, it was Peyton. And it's still very good, but it wasn't as good as it was. Right. Well, an offensive class. Oh, it's not good. It's this, it's that, it's all these. And then turned out to be pretty flipping good when it was all said and done. Yep. And so there's a lot of time. I mean, we're sitting there in October last year thinking, I don't know that they're going to get a quarter. I mean, we literally sat in shows last year on recruiting hour. Like, <laughs> I have no clue they're going to get a quarterback. I, they may strike out a quarterback in one of the deepest quarterback years. We literally had that conversation on our recruiting hour show. We did. And then guess what happens? They kept, they kept grinding, they, they kept working, and they got a pretty darn good football player at that position. Right. We're sitting here uh, 13 months ago thinking, oh, well, Carnell's faded and I don't know what's going on with Rodney Gallagher. But I, outside of that, I don't know who they're going to get a receiver. Yeah. And then lo and behold, I didn't know they were going to get Jaden Greathouse 13 months ago or Braylon James starting to feel a little bit good about it. had no concept of them getting Rico Flores 13 months ago and 13 months ago. I had no freaking clue who Caleb Smith was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know true. what I mean? And, and, and I didn't think 13 months ago they're going to get Jeremiah Love. That was going to be Cedric Irvin and Jaden Lamar, yeah. you know, or Cedric Irvin, you know, and so it's a process. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So that ah, good one. Here's I got one more super chat here from uh, wicked Bronco productions. Thank you again for the additional super chat. Was it just me or did Tyler Buckner look uh, disinterested in playing in the blue gold game? Him and Tommy are the Trojan horse at Bama. Hope Freeman plays the freshman wide receivers. I genuinely believe Hartman will win a Heisman and a national championship. I'm I'm with you on the last two. I I just I don't know. We don't have to turn everything into some sort of negative thing. Did he look disinterested? No, what he looked like in the spring game. A guy whose offensive line wasn't blocking a soul. Yes. That's what he looked like in the spring game. Right? It was very um, apparent too. It was very yeah. apparent. So yeah. yeah. Uh you know. I, I hope that they play the freshman receivers, and I hope that Hartman wins the Heisman in an Addy too. And it has nothing to do with <laughs> sticking it to Tommy and Tyler. Just that's just what I want as a Notre Dame fan. I don't care I don't care less how they could not care less how they get there. That's just what I'm looking just for. Just win, baby. Just win. That's baby. it. That's it, man. Just win. Let's let's try to rock through some others here, Ryan, and, and just start kind of rolling through all these type of things. So uh, let me get good, down man. here to uh, one here from John A. One. John says, now seeing a bit of Chris Tyree at wide receiver, does that change your opinion of how good the Notre Dame wide receivers are compared to title contending teams? No. Uh, I mean, I think he gives them an element that makes them better. I still think More they're well-rounded ability- maybe. Yeah, I, I think yeah. I think their ability to be a title contending team still falls on the shoulders of Tobias Merriweather and Deion Colsey. I, yeah. I still think those are the, those are the two. Jaden Tom- I love Jaden Thomas. He's going to be a good player. And he can be part of a championship team, but the guy that elevates this offense to that, the two guys are Tobias and Dion. They Alphys. they have to get those two guys going. They have to, yeah. and then that makes Jaden even better and more dangerous, and it makes Tyree even more dangerous. And all the, the one of those two guys has to step up and be a dude because we know what Jaden's going to do, right? Jaden's going to be a good football player. Yes, and he can do. It. But but you, it, okay? If Dion doesn't step up, you can move Jaden out to boundary. Yes, of course. But wouldn't it be better if you Dion stepped up and you could keep Jaden here, and then now you had all three of them dominating, and then you got – that's yeah. the whole point is – You don't have to do it, it right. It's about Dion. We know who Jaden is. We know what Chris can bring to the table. The the receiving core being a championship ca- t- contending unit is dependent upon Tobias Merriweather and De- Dion Colsey. In 2023, that's the two guys who are going to hold the key to Notre Dame's receiving core futures. If they don't step up and, and be what they are capable of being, if they don't put in the work between now and the beginning of the season and develop that killer, that killer, I don't say killer, but that just that. So I say, that's why I say like that dog in them because I hate yeah. using the word killer, 
But if they don't have this, that dog where I'm just, I'm the man and you can't stop me and I'm going to work as my butt off to be the best I can be. Cause I want to not just beat you. I want to humiliate you. I want your mama to be embarrassed to be your mama because of how bad I beat you on Saturday. That's how I want that attitude to be. But I'm going to, I'm going to work to show you how good I can be. That's the great ones. And if, if Dion and Tobias can kind kind of get that, and I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying this is what's needed. Whether they have it or not, if they have it, they got to continue it. If they don't have it, they got to develop it. It's just more of a general statement as opposed to saying they don't have it. But if those two kids have that mentality and that work, that view on work, this team is going to be very, very, very good. But yes. they're the keys. They're the two keys at receiver, in my opinion. Next question is from Scott L. Reg- regarding linebacker. There seemed to be encouraging news from spring practice. Are players like Nolan Ziegler and Jalen Sneed in a legit competition to be starters, or have they shown they should play? Well, I don't I don't know if they're in legit conversation to be starters because I don't truly know what's in Al Golden's head. Right. But they're going to play and they should play. And and I don't see any reason that I I'm I'm at the very least I'm willing to say I'm comfortable saying that I believe Al Golden knows that he wants to play Nolan and Jalen Steed as part of a rotation at the very least. Yeah. Does that mean one of them is going to be a starter? That I don't know. I could see a scenario in which they got kind of go more nickel and play a lot more Thomas Harper and have Jack Kaiser and J.D. Bertrand as your starters. Jalen Steed and Nolan are playing a ton on third down, and they're also rotating in as part of your linebacker rotation. I can see that too. I, there's a lot of different scenarios. I don't know where they're going to go with it. But I definitely feel this. I'll be shocked if those two kids don't play. They have to the play. Shit. They have to play. Yeah. You have to. I mean, they're two of your best athletes on defense. They have to play. I mean, that's just kind of where we are with it. The linebackers did not play well enough in 2022 for them not to get legitimate chances. So they have to play. Will they play? It's a completely different conversation, Scott. I hope so. I mean, because I would love to see 6'3", 230 run around, and then Jalen Sneed at 6'1", 215 with the athleticism he has. would love to see it. So – they should play. They need to play. Will they play? I sure hope so, but we shall yeah. see. From Archer. What's up, Archer? Even with Logan Diggs transfer, would you argue the four best running back rooms in the country are all in the Midwest? I wouldn't say the four best. I think th- there's four in the Midwest in that conversation. I still think Notre Dame is, is that. And part of the reason that we hyped up Notre Dame is the depth, right? I mean, this is where they are, the depth. I I think if I had Notre Dame two, I'd probably knock them down to three or four now just because there's not as much proven now behind yeah. Audric Estime. But the town in the room, I'll still stack up with anybody, one through four. I'll stack up against anybody. Yeah. And, and you know, but but right now, you I can't put them ahead of Michigan right now. I think you could have yeah. made a case to have them ahead of Michigan going into the season because they're one, two, plus their depth. Well, now it's just one in the depth of proven players. Michigan's guys had more production, but I think that you could argue that yes. But then there's a big drop off between three and four, and if the and if those two guys weren't splitting carries with Chris Tyree last year, then their production is 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 equal to theirs. That's the biggest difference between you know the the two backfields and was last year was Notre Dame's was a three man backfield and Michigan's was a two. And, and, you know, that, that, like you said, that kind of factors into why that was a little bit different. And so for Michigan, right, Blake Corm is 1,400 yards. Donovan Edwards has 991. Yep. And then their next leading back had 273. And then their next leading back had 101. Where you look at Notre Dame, they had 920, 822. And that, but their next back had 444. On right. So, on a, like 100 carries, right? Or something right. like that. 100 so, carries. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So it's just a little bit different. Uh, but, um, you know, when, when you look at it, it, to me, it's Michigan's gotta be, and I still would have had Michigan ahead of them, but I think it would have been a conversation. I'm kind of making a point. There's no, there's no debate. Now you have to put Michigan ahead of them, even with, I think Notre Dame having better three and being better at three and four because their one, two is so proven. I'd argue the same thing with Penn state. I think Notre Dame's three and four are better than Penn state's three and four, but right now Penn state's one and two is significantly more proven and established than Notre Dame's one, two. Yeah. So that's where I think it hurts it, but it's, it doesn't drop them too much, in my opinion, Ryan. Yeah. It just in that group of five. But are they are they definitely I mean, there's some there's some good backfields out there still. There, there are. There's still some really good backfields out there. I'd have to sit down and kind of go through it. But like I think Alabama's yeah. a team that I think is gonna have a really good backfield this year. Their freshmen are gonna be part of that. You got I think you got J- Jason McClellan's back, isn't he? 
Jason McClellan is back. Yep. You know, so they're they're going to have a pretty good backfield this year. There's a couple other teams that that are going to going to have pretty good backfields this year. To, I was trying to think of a couple. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, here, let me just let me just pull it up here real quick and, and go through some of these teams that I think are going to have pretty good backfields again this year. Um, but you know, um, Ole Miss is going to have a very good backfield this year with Quinshawn Junkins. I know Zach Evans gone, but they've got a couple yeah. other young backs that I really like. Uh, Arkansas, uh, Rocket Sanders, is he back or is he yes. in the draft? No, he's he's back. They, he's only he was only a sophomore last year. Yeah, they've got a pretty good backfield coming back. In my opinion, he's a monster. You can you count KJ Jefferson yeah. as a running back too. That's right. <laughs> AJ Green, Rashad Debinion, those are all quality players. You know they they got a pretty good backfield. You're right about KJ Jefferson when he's healthy. <laughs> you know they got a pretty good backfield. I did see a ranking come out the other day, Ryan, that had a top ten backs in the country, and they did not have Audric Estim in there. And I was like, that's why I did that tweet the other night. Like if you you know quick note, if you don't have if you have a top ten list of backs and you don't have Audric Estim, redo your list. I'm just looking out for you. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, they're uh, uh, Florida State's another one that needs to yeah. be in that conversation. Even with the kid they lost, they lost him because Lord. of how loaded they are at that position. Yeah. So that's another team that's in that conversation for me. Uh, Ohio okay. State has to be in that conversation too, right? If Trey well, Henderson is his, healthy, but that's what he's saying. Um, yeah, the four best rooms are in the Midwest. He's talking about Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State. Yeah. So for Archer, Ohio State's already in there. That's what he's saying. Gotcha. The four best: Penn State, Michigan, Notre Dame, Ohio State. Gotcha. I just. I think they're they're four of the top six or seven. They're they're definitely in there. Are they one, two, three, and four? Maybe it's close. Yeah, I got yeah. I got a I got a I I tell you what, right? I got a a Florida State backfield's got a chance to be pretty good. Also this year, I, Benson's I really a really do. good player. I like the Trey yeah. Benson kid. Yeah, I mean he had nine ninety last year at six four carry. Treshawn Ward had six twenty eight last year. He was one that transferred the right. Yeah, Ward. yeah. yeah. Uh, but Lawrence Toa had 457, and they got a running. They got a fresh. Didn't they have a freshman coming in this year that's a really good football player? That, I know they have Cameron Davis in the 2024 class. Yeah. I'm not sure about 2023. Yeah. So, I mean, Florida State's got to be in there. And when you look at Florida State, too, like you said, you got to kind of, you got to somewhat consider their running back uh, a little bit as well. So th- they're in the conversation there where they would be in that group. Um, I couldn't, I could, I would not really comfortable to say, but we are going to do that this summer. We're going to rank the top 10 position groups in yeah. the country this year. And Notre Dame will at least have that Sam Singleton. That's who they have. Have you seen him, Ryan? Not, not as, he's, Oh, he's, he's the, is he the one with the dreads. He has dreads. Uh, I, think. I think so. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think I saw him in the all-star game. I think he was yeah. down in San Antonio. If I remember. Correctly. Yeah, he does. He's skinny yeah. kid, but really athletic. He's a good yeah, back. He, I don't know he, if he's he, freshman ready, but he's a pretty good player. He, he was a late call up to the all American bowl. Yeah. I think someone got hurt and he was asked to come yeah. out there in San Antonio. He's a good player. Yeah. So yeah. there's some backfields, but we'll, we'll put all those together and we'll do some fun stuff with that over the summer. But note, Notre Dame will be in the top 10 there. They'll be in the top 10 on offensive line. Uh, they'll be in the top 10 uh, quarterback rooms, in my opinion, still, even without Tyler Buckner. Yeah. Uh, and I I would – it's debatable. I got to do more investigating, but I have a hard time not believing that their tight end group is going to be in the top 10 and their corner room is in the top 10. Those are all the position groups that, to me, Notre Dame has a top 10 unit. Defensive line is not top 10 right now. It could be, but it's not right now. Linebacker's not top 10 right now. It could be, but it's not right now. Safety room will never be top 10. It's just not enough depth, in my opinion. Yep. Um, but, I mean, that's every other – I mean, every position is is either top 10 or capable of being top 10 except for the safety room, in my opinion. Would yep. you agree with that, Ryan? They're yep. not all there right now. I don't think it's outrageous at all. Receive, receiving core is not in the top 10, right? There's no way you can justify putting the receiving core in the top 10 right now. No yeah. way. Now a proven production. Exactly. But would you be shocked if they're there by the end of the year? No, I'm not shocked at all. Not shocked at all. And and that's the key. Like, but right now, for sure, O line's in there, running backs in there, quarterbacks in there, and the corners are in there. Like right now. But they're they just are. Before last season, no one was talking about Johnny Wilson and Malik Neighbors, for instance, right? And all of a sudden, they're like two of the top returning receivers in college football this year. It happens every year, those breakouts happen. Yep. And yeah, and everybody thought Keyshawn Boutte was going to be phenomenal. Great, player, yeah. best receiver in the country. It's awful. It's he was awful bad last year. And even before he got in trouble, he was bad. I mean, he just wasn't good. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And, and this is kind of – this is a, a – you know, John asked this, right? He says, now that Onye seems poised for a breakout, John Baptiste is reported to be better than suspected. How good can the 23, 23D line be compared to the title contenders? I got to see it, man. 
Like yeah, that's the thing is like, I'm excited about it, but like I gotta I gotta see Jason Onye go make a play in a real game. I gotta see Javante Jean Baptiste actually be that in a real game. I'm ex- I'm I'm c- uh, cautiously optimistic about what it can be. I need to see Riley Mills take it. Right now, they're a long way away from being what those other teams are. Yeah, it's but it's just the talent is there for them to get there. But that doesn't mean tools. they're there. A lot of tools. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a lot to prove. They have a lot yep. to prove. This is a fascinating question. I'm gonna I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna I want you to answer it first, Ryan. John okay. A. One asks if Ian Book could read defenses. At the level Sam Hartman has shown, does Notre Dame have a playoff win? Yes. Yes, they do. He Ian Book had tools, man. I feel like people kind of don't give him enough credit, but I thought Ian Book right. had a plus arm, and he was a really nice athlete for the position as well. Yes. His thing was just always that he just didn't see the game quick enough, right? Like he didn't yeah. see things, and then he was afraid to pull the trigger when he did see things sometimes. Like, yeah, yeah. And that was the one thing holding them back. It wasn't wasn't a talent issue. I actually, some people try to tell me that sometimes. They're like, how can you draft a, this not talented quarterback of the fourth round? I'm like, it's not a talent issue with Ian. Brown, no, it's man. not. It never has been. That kid he has wasn't a strong the biggest arm. guy. But he had, yeah. yes, you were correct. Yeah. He wasn't the, the biggest guy. Very under. People say Ian Book couldn't throw the ball. No, 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 no. Ian yeah, Book threw a great velocity, deep man. ball. Yeah. Ian Book wouldn't throw the deep ball. Big yeah. difference. Yeah, big difference for a six foot guy. He could generate velocity, and he was yes. a four, five, eight athlete. I think at the pro day, yep. like he could run too, man. Like he was, a, he's good. Ta- he was a yes. good talent. It was just what would the win have been? Like that's the question. And so yeah. for me, I mean, Ohio State fans aren't going to like this, but if Ian Book could read a defense the way Sam Hartman did, they beat Clemson twice and knocked Clemson out of the playoff in twenty twenty. Number yeah, one. 2020 is a good one. And yeah. Notre Dame probably is playing Ohio State in the semifinals, and I think they beat that Ohio State team. It With Ian Book playing like Sam Hartman. Yeah. Mentally. They, yeah. Yes, I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that. Um, But, you know, that's the thing is, what would the seeding have been? They probably are still playing Clemson. Could they have beat Clemson if he played like – yes, I think they could have. Because here's the thing. If Ian Book played like Sam Hartman – Notre Dame's up probably 17 to three on Clemson early in that game. Because there were guys open. They just won't throw the ball. They take a seven nothing lead on drive two. He's got Miles Boykin open on a post route for the very at worst case scenario, Miles catches and he's inside the 10. Worst case scenario. And he just wouldn't throw it. Sam Hartman throws that ball and he dimes it and it's first and ten, if not a touchdown. Miles might have dragged that guy to the end zone for all that. You know what I mean? Like, there's no doubt. I mean, they'd have had a shot. Would they have been able to hold off Clemson for four quarters? I don't know. That was a pretty dang good Clemson team. A really that was a really good team. Clemson team. But Notre Dame matched up against them because here's why. They had receivers that could give those corners problems. The Alabama receivers did not give them the same kind of problems because they were bigger than those Alabama receivers. And other than that one big play from Jerry Judy, they kind of beat those guys up a little bit. Couldn't beat up Miles Boykin and Chase Claypool. They couldn't. And that's the difference. But, yeah, I think they have a playoff win. Just not sure what that would, so. which year that would have been. And here's the other thing: their playoff win might have been in 2019 because if Notre Dame, if Sam Hartman, if Ian Book played like Sam Hartman, Notre Dame's undefeated in 2019. That was a pathetic schedule. They would have absolutely they'd have beat Georgia by 10. Yeah. If 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 he played like Sam Hartman mentally, seriously, they'd have beat him by at least 10 at Georgia. Was that the Jake Brown played, freshman year? Yeah, was sophomore year. Sophomore no, year. junior yeah. year. That was his junior oh. year. At George in 19. Has Jake Fromm was a freshman that 17. Long? Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. They they lost 23-17. They got the ball at the 48-yard line with two minutes left after the defense forced a punt and then got a piece of it, and it shanked out at midfield. They got the ball at the Georgia 48-yard line with two minutes left, and they got anywhere close to the end zone. But, yeah, yes. Because because remember, Georgia's – both of their corners were out by the end of the first series. Sam Hartman would have picked on them all freaking game Wait. long. With Chase Claypool and Cole Komet, are you kidding me? I feel like I'm mixing up the Georgia games. Was that the one where – was that Mike McGlinchey's last year? Or was that – No. That was after that too. That, you're that thinking time. of 17 when they played him at yeah. home. Brandon Wimbush was the quarterback. They played gotcha. two years yeah, yeah, later yeah, yeah. at Georgia, yeah. and it was it was uh, he, Tony Jones, the starting quarterback. It yeah, was yeah. a game where Lawrence Keyes caught that go route on the, mm-hmm. on the sideline to, to set up a score for Notre Dame. Yeah, um, their their only touchdown that game, one of their two touchdowns that game was off came off of a, a blocked punt that they recovered deep in Georgia yeah. territory. So yeah, they would have beat Georgia by because that wasn't a great Georgia team. They would have beat Georgia by at least ten that year if yeah. if he because like 
Chase Claypool was open like in one on ones all game long, and Ian just wouldn't throw him the ball. Just he wouldn't throw him the ball. Yeah. So that team would have gone to the playoff and been in, been interesting to watch. Very interesting to watch because you'd had LSU against Oklahoma one and four, and what was the other the, the playoff game that year? It was Clemson. It was Clemson and um, who who did Clemson play that year in nineteen? Who they because LSU beat Oklahoma in the Ohio semifinal. State? No. Yeah, it was. It was. Ohio it State. was. That was a really good Ohio State team. Yes, it was. A really, yes, but was. I don't think. But would Ohio State have got in that year? What was Ohio State's record in nineteen? I'm trying to remember. I do not remember Ohio State's regular season record that year. They were undefeated, so then Clemson wouldn't have been in. They'd have knocked Clemson out. No, I don't know who would have got. No, Oklahoma would have got knocked out. So Notre Dame would not have won a playoff game in nineteen. Notre Dame would have been the four seed. They'd have, played they'd, they'd have been the yeah. four seed, and they would have been. Uh, you'd have had four undefeated teams in the playoff that year, and LSU would have beat the dogs not out of Notre Dame that year. Yes. They couldn't stop. They <laughs> couldn't stop that LSU offense. No, now they just could. To be they'd fair. have scored on yeah. LSU. It would have lo- looked a lot like the Clemson game, in my opinion. Yeah, but that defense was not stopping the LSU offense. No way. No way. And Ian Book wasn't that good where he would have, and their talent wasn't that good where they would have been able to keep up with that. They would have, yes. they'd, have got, they'd have got, they'd have got pounded, but everyone I, I, got pounded by LSU that year. It wouldn't have been as bad as the Oklahoma game, Ryan. I was about to say, I don't know if Joe Burrow would have had seven touchdowns at halftime, but it would have, it wouldn't have been great. No, not have been great. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right. Let's get down to a few more here, Ryan. I uh, want to get some more uh, here. Michael Koster just had my second boy a couple weeks ago. Newest Irish and IB fan. And I'm terrible for not wanting them. Am I terrible for not wanting them to play football? No, nah, I don't think um, so, Michael. I don't, I don't think, think you're so. terrible. I just, I, 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 I'd say, I don't think it's, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem letting them play. Here's what I, here's my advice I give to parents. And this is coming from a college football coach, not a parent. I, I'm not a parent. As a college football coach, my advice would be do not let your children play Pop Warner football. Do not let them play football until they at least get to junior high school. They're not learning anything in Pop Warner that's going to keep them or allow them to be college football players. If they're good enough to play college football, then they're going to play college football. There's enough There's enough seven-on-seven seven in flag football leagues nowadays that they can do that. But I would say let them play soccer. Let them play football. I mean, basketball, baseball. Let them play on things that are going to develop their, their conditioning and not have the physical pounding that they're going to have as Pop Warner kids. That's my advice. Other people tell you differently, but I would not let, if I had a son and he wanted to play football, I'd let him play football, but I would not let him play football till at least he got to junior high school and maybe even not till high school with all the other, other things that are out there. You let him be on the seven on 17, but I'm not letting him play high school football or uh, Pop Warner football. I'm just, just not, just not going to do it. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, you just look, it's just one of those deals where, I mean, that's, that's your choice as a parent. Yes, it is. And so, it's, a tough, it's a tough conversation to have, too. I yeah. mean, it's not an easy one, man. Because I love I football, don't, but I feel like I would be hesitant with it a little bit at certain yeah. ages. So um, I just I think a lot of that's because we've bought into stuff that I just don't believe to be true about the violence of the game. And and a lot of things that uh, there's a lot of things that I believe uh, are, are, are more spin as opposed to actual data. It's spewed data. It's skewed data. Excuse me. Uh, that I just that I just don't think is um, accurate. And look, equipment's getting safer and safe. You just had a son. By the time he's playing football, the the, the safety protocols are going to even be greater than they are now. So I would have it's no gonna hesitation. Be, it's going to be robot football at that point. So. Just don't let kids whose brains are still developing at the young ages of like 10, 11, and twelve. Don't let them play tackle football. You know, but then you could say don't let them play soccer either because then they're freaking hitting the ball against their head all the time. But you know, that's a little bit of a different animal. I mean, soccer's most like magnet ball at that age. Soccer players get a lot of concussions too, man. They're high, they're high rates as well. But like at that age, though, you're not having a lot of headers when you're. It's just like like I said, it's that (laughs) magnet ball. It's like they're all kind of you know, it's like a swarm of bees. (laughs) Swarm of bees. All right, let's see here. Let me get to some. Here's a question: uh, If Notre Dame once uh, was to move Chris Tyree back to running back, do you think that would encourage them to take four receivers to three? No, they're not making moves in 24 class to replace guys who are seniors. Yeah. You're you're more recruiting against the junior class is is really where that that you are. Um, let's see here. Uh, Pat Koleski says, "Why does Notre Dame always miss on top end skill talent in the state? Lost on David Bell, Terry McLaurin, and a few others. Now own three of Fort Wayne kids and Nitro. Or are they just not fits or looked over?" With the exception of Terry McLaurin, none of those kids that you just brought up could have got into school, and that's exactly yes. why they miss on most kids in the state of Indiana at wide receiver. Yep. That's it. Now, Austin Max an exception. Austin could have got into school. They just got beat because he went to Ohio State. But yeah, I um, 
And they that's never a reason. Off, they never even offered Nitro Tuggle either. So that's, yeah, and there's yeah. a reason why he's a local kid with the Georgia offer that they never and they brought him in for a visit, but it was just kind of like, mm. yeah, yeah. No, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, here, here's one, Ryan. From uh, I'll read this one, Ryan. Can you help explain why in the world my Detroit Lions were doing last night? Running back and inside linebacker, twelve and eighteen. Seems like we could have gotten them in round two. I, I wish I could understand the thought process. Me and Brian talked about it on the live stream a lot last night because, unfortunately, I would call Detroit one of my big losers of the night because it was just – it wasn't the football players they drafted. Like, in a vacuum, I really like Jameer Gibbs, and I like Jack, Jack Campbell. I think they're both going to be good football players in the NFL level. It's just Jameer Gibbs at 12 when you have David Montgomery and DeMondre Swift already on the roster, that's just not a massive need for me, right? And then Jack Campbell – just he's the type of player that I just be, think is becoming less valuable in today's game. So in a league now where I would say running back and linebacker are the two positions that are depreciating the most, you drafted both of them in the top 20. When I also think you could use defensive line help, I think that you could use, I, I think you could use another pass catcher to go along with an Amon Ross St. Brown. I, I mean, there was just other options. Cornerback, I think it was a need because you, just traded away, obviously, you know, Jeff Akuda that came out of Ohio State a few years ago. So you don't you have Emmanuel Mosley on a one year deal who's coming off of an injury. So I just think there was bigger needs on the board. I think you took good two I think the Detroit Lions took two, two good football players, but I just don't think the value matches those positions or those players in the top twenty. I'm gonna I'm gonna work through a couple draft ones here, Ryan, for before you have to you have to run. Here's one from uh, Remy Lalise. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. Second, while I'm upset that Mayer wasn't drafted in the first round, do you think that Dal- that uh, Dalton Kincaid may fit the Bills better because Mayer is more similar to Dawson Knox? I, I think the opposite, actually, Remy. I think that Dawson Knox is more similar to to Dalton Kincaid. They're more of the athletic guys that can kind of move around, I guess, a little bit more, a little bit more of a detached options. I actually think Mayer is more of that guy that can play in line, be physical, can be attached, also be detached at times as well. So I actually would push back and just say that I think that Dawson and Kincaid are a little bit more similar. So I just think that it was a guy they liked, man, and we'll see if it ends up being right or wrong. But I just think that they just went for the guy that's a little bit more of a spread option at tight end, I guess. Yeah. All right, we've got another draft question here, Ryan, from Conrad. Thoughts on the Raiders draft for day two? Will they pull the trigger on quarterback or draft other positions? I mean, it depends who's on the board, Conrad. Like, I mean, would they be willing to take Will Levis or Hendon Hooker if he's on the board potentially With since you have Jimmy Garoppolo in there and you're willing to be, I guess, a little bit more patient? I, I think it's possible, right? But ultimately, I mean, the Raiders need offensive line help. I think they need some cornerback help. I, I, they're a roster that needs a lot of retooling, so I don't think there's necessarily a wrong answer. But if Will Levis or Hendon Hooker is in the right spot on day two, I would consider it because you could take a day two dart throw on a guy like that because they both have talent. It's just about fitting into the right spot, obviously, right? So it, it would be something I would definitely consider without question. And then here's the last one for draft stuff, Ryan, then you can take off and I, I'll be able to handle the rest of it. But uh, Conrad also wanted to know thoughts on the two defensive linemen from Clemson drafted in the first round. Will there be def- will, will their defense see a step down next year? I, I think at certain spots it could, right? I mean, because look, the one good thing for Clemson is that they got back a lot of their interior players this year. So they got back Tyler Davis. They got back Rook or or however you pronounce his name. Miles Murphy, I think, is an incredible talent, man. He's I don't know how to pronounce his name, man. You can try to do it for me. <laughs> I'll, I'll learn next year this time. This time it's not there. that you don't know how to pronounce it. I have no clue. Or, it's or, just or, like, or, 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 whatever. <laughs> I sounded like Scooby Doo there for a second. But <laughs> Miles Murphy. Miles Murphy is explosive, strong, physical. He didn't take his game to the next level in 2022, but the upside is immense, man. And Brian Bercy, I would say, has some of the highest upside of any player in the class. It's just Injured in 2021, missed some games this offseason due to a personal issue, obviously, off the field that's out of his control. So he's missed some development time. But, man, if Detroit can be patient with – or not Detroit, who drafted him? Uh, the Saints. If the Saints can be patient with a guy like a Brian Bersie and develop him properly, I think he could be a star when it's all said and done. Yeah. Ryan, that's good stuff. I got a, a few more I'm going to get to here that uh, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm not going to add any new questions to the docket, everybody. So uh, we're, we're kind of done. Uh, adding the questions, but I do want to uh, get to some of these that are still there. I'm, I'm not going to get to all of them, but uh, I want to do. I do want to get to some of these that I think are good questions. 
uh, Nathan Milton says, I, I live the, I, I love the idea that if a kid transfers, the school he transfers has to pay back the scholarship to the school he leaves. I.e., Bama should have to pay Notre Dame back for the scholarship uh, Tyler Buckner used. Thoughts? I, I don't like that idea. I look, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I get what you're saying, and, and you're basically saying you're not punishing the kid because the school has to pay it, but you are kind of indirectly pu punishing a kid because, you know, what if a kid transfers for good reasons? I mean, I'm not opposed to transferring. I, I think we're trying we're trying to make this way too freaking complicated. And paying back this and that, it's simple. Sign a contract. If you get out of that contract for reasons other than a violation of the terms of the contract, you have to sit out a year. It's not that hard. You can be part of the team. You can practice. You can go to school. You can do all the things you need to do. You just can't play in games on Saturdays until the following year. It's not that freaking hard. I don't understand. We don't need to do this. Now, there are some things you can do. You know, have the contract. And if they, like I said, if they if they stay in good academic standing, they get that year of eligibility, they lost back. There's, there's things you can do, but this isn't that hard. If you want to limit the number of transfers, make them sit out a year. Simple. And then have very clear, very strict rules for being able to leave and getting a waiver. Don't have this ridiculously stupid waiver process where, you know, some kids get it, some kids don't. And it's just typical stupid stupidity of the NCAA. It's very clear. One of these five things or whatever has to be met for you to be able to transfer without a waiver. You have to have very clear documentation on this being happening, you know, or, you know, you have to have this, you have to have this. Or make the contracts more detailed and, and allow, I mean, kids are allowed to have agents now for NIL, right? Why can't they have lawyers to help them make sure that they sign their NIL? And look, the NIL stuff is standard. It's not where you're negotiating this or that. It's just very clear. What promises did you make? Are you willing to make for my client to be able to stay in good standing? He's going to get a chance to play running back. You're not going to move him to another position. He's going to get a wear number seven. He's going to not have to live in student dorms. You're going to let him have a car on campus as a freshman when most freshmen can have a car on campus. You know, you're going to play him at least 100 snaps a game, blah, 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 barring injury. And then if you don't live up to the things that you promised that kid, the contract is null and void like any other contract. We signed a contract. You didn't live up to the terms of your contract. This contract is over. I, I'm out of the contract. I'm going to go take my business elsewhere. It's not that hard, right? We're making this way too complicated. And, and it just, it doesn't need to be this complicated. It's simple. You had a decent structure in place that you jacked up, fix the prior system, make the prior system work more for both parties. And then we're, we're, we're cooking. The, the, this system is just stupid and we don't need to get into all this penalties and all this other kind of stuff, because listen, here's the deal. USC would have had no problem paying pit for whatever pit, you know, the peanuts that it would have been, and, you know, say, let's say it's thirty thousand, you know, ninety thousand dollars. You don't think they'd have had any issue? Jordan Addison was a pit for two years. It wouldn't even that have been sixty, seventy thousand dollars. You think they would have had any problem paying? Do you think Alabama would have had any issue at all paying one hundred forty thousand dollars, which is what Notre Dame basically paid for Michael Mayer to be on scholarship for two years? If Michael Mayer wanted to go to Alabama, that's not stopping a dang thing for the top players. They're still going to go because that's nothing to these schools. That doesn't fix it. All that does is create a problem for maybe some of those other smaller kids who aren't, you know, who maybe aren't the big time kids that want to go somewhere. And you say, yeah, I'm, that's not worth it. That's not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's not worth it. I think you end up doing more damage to kids than you help. It's not, it's guys, this is not a complicated process. I know the NCAA likes to make it complicated, but it's really not. It's not that complicated and it doesn't have to be that complicated. Here's a question from Joe Papiti. Thank you, Joe. What, what I see is the fact that this is actually more of a comment. What I see is the fact that Freeman is bringing in top tier talent that are pushing the upperclassmen. And that hasn't been the culture of Notre Dame in the Kelly era. No tenure, only talent. I, Joe, I think you nailed it. That's a great point. It's a great point. I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Jeff Fluke says, would you go after Ty Simpson if he entered the draft? Um, I would not, or I'm in, entered the portal. I would not. Uh, I wasn't as high on Ty Simpson as some other people. I also don't think that that fixes your problems. I, I don't think he's uh, going to beat out some of the guys you have on your roster. He's definitely not better than CJ Carr. Uh, he's not better than Sam Hartman. I think him and Kenny Minchie are very comparable in talent. The only difference is, is he has a year of experience on Kenny Minchie. Beyond that, I don't think Ty Simpson adds a, a ton of value to the quarterback room, in my opinion. So I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go after him. The only thing I would take portal wise is if it's like a veteran who's here for a year that understands I'm just here to help in case there's an injury that that's really it. 
I have a question here from We Are Not Marshall. Will the 2021 recruiting class go down as an overrated class or what you both expected it to be? I don't think it's overrated. I, I Look, Lorenzo Styles was not as good as I thought it would be. So far, Deion Colsey's got a chance to be what we thought. So far, Jaden Thomas has got a chance to be what we thought. Mitchell Evans has been better than advertised. Logan Diggs has far outplayed being a three-star recruit. Audric Estime so far has been as good as advertised. Tyler Buckner just had injuries. He was a good player when he was healthy and had a chance to be a good player. He just got beat out by a guy that is an older player that you're expecting to be a, a great player. Joe Walt has been better than advertised. Blake Fisher has been every bit as good as advertised. Rocco Spindler hasn't been as good as advertised, but he's again, he's a, he's a retro freshman this past year. Prince Colley, same, not quite as good as advertised. Gabriel Rubio has been good so far. Jason Onye has got a chance to outplay his ranking. Uh, Ryan Barnes is, you know, he's been a three star kid. It hasn't played a whole ton. And so I, I think this class is on par to kind of be exactly what it is. There's going to be some really good players in the class, guys that have a chance to be impactful players from Notre Dame at the next level. And I mean, look, that 2021 class is a big reason Notre Dame beat South Carolina last year, guys. I mean, let's think about it. Your starting quarterback was in that class. Your your top two tailbacks were in that class. Your best receiver was in that class. Your two starting offensive tackles in that class. Your starting tight end who had the game-winning touchdown pass was in that class. Eight of your 11 starters on your offensive team last year were in that class. And it put up over 500 yards and 45 points. Sometimes it just, you know, other. it's not always about overrated. If the 21 class is – a really good class or should have ranked eighth or ninth. The 23 class is a class that ranks third. There's going to be some guys that get beat out. It doesn't mean those guys in 21 are, are overrated. It just means other guys are better. And you went out and got a 60 year senior and Sam Hartman and beat out Tyler Buckner. If Tyler Buckner doesn't get hurt last year. We have a completely different opinion of, of him and Sam Hartman's somewhere else. He's not at Notre Dame. So I wouldn't say it's overrated. I think it's been pretty good. We're, we're talking about Audrey SMA having a chance to be a, a thousand yard running back. Uh, he was a thousand yard guy last year as a true sophomore. He had two 2021 running backs last year, had over a thousand yards of offense last year. It's pretty good. Uh, you had two, your two starting left tackles, your two starting offensive tackles were both 21 guys. It's pretty good. And so, I mean, I, I, I think, I think that that's what it's going to be. So, uh, Ramlick, real quick says, Brian, are you going to just roll into, in, uh, into two, into the, this evening's IB Nation sports talk? Want to know if I should make myself a drink? Uh, there will be no uh, IB Nation Sports Talk tonight. Sean has tonight uh, off. He had last night off. He has tonight off as well. So we're going to end the show here uh, when we're done. We're not done yet, but I just wanted to to speak to that where there will be no show after this tonight. Next one here. This is from uh, Pythagorean. He says, uh, I understand the reality of the portal, but my concern is that Tyler Buckner loss could wreak havoc on the locker room. Couldn't the cum cumulative exit as acerbate the situation with team chemistry. First of all, you use a lot of big words there. I was a history major and I'm a football coach. So you use some big words. I hope I got them right. Uh, no, I don't think it as, you know, acerbates anything. I, I think if anything, it, it's part of the deal. Look, I, I know that there's people out there saying that there's a fractured locker room. I haven't heard that. I, I've talked to so, all types of sources who have told me in the past, look, the people that I talked to that told me that there was a locker room issue last year. So it's not like, Look, it's not like we're going to sit here and spin, oh, there's no locker room issue. Everything is fine. Everything's great. And I get that scene from like Animal House, like, you know, everybody remain calm, right? As panic is going on, right? I, that's what I'm talking about. We've talked about these things before, but those people aren't telling me that right now. They're like, oh, they're fine. The kids are fine. What this shows is that Marcus Freeman is going to do whatever it takes to put this football team in the best position to win. And I think the kids respect that. And they appreciate that. And they were honest with Tyler. And they gave Tyler every opportunity to compete. We said this at the very beginning. Notre Dame had to make Sam Hartman earn this. Otherwise, there'd be a fractured locker room. And that's true. There wasn't a fractured locker room because to the players, it was very obvious who the best quarterback was. It was Sam Hartman for this year's team. And the kids respect that. So, no, there's no there's no locker room issue with Tyler Buckner or anybody else. Having, could it wreak havoc? In theory, it could, but it isn't, and it hasn't because the players understand it. Let's see here. Archer 452 says, Ohio State and Notre Dame are in the same spot right now with their classes being very top-heavy with offensive commits. When do you think the defensive recruiting will pick up? Well, for Notre Dame, I think they'll they'll get at least one more often defensive guy soon. Uh, honestly, for Notre Dame's defensive recruiting, it's going to be a long haul. I mean, a lot of the kids that they're going after are most likely kids that are not deciding anytime soon. The offensive class could be close to filling up at all but second running back, maybe a fourth receiver, and the offensive line after next week. 
it's going to be really close. Defense is going to take a little longer to get put together. So uh, when do I think defensive recruiting will pick up? I hope it picks up in June and July. I hope that's, that's, that's the ideal scenario, but I think they're going to get another defender soon. Might have another kid pop soon. They might get a couple defensive players in the next couple weeks, but uh, it's not going to really take off until June or or really July after kids visit in June. I think we'll see July and August start to June and July, maybe into August is when they fill up and, and for the most part, finish things off. Tyler Evans with a super chat. Thank you, Tyler. Last question for me. What position in the draft will we have a run on tonight? Obviously that's a, a, would be a little bit of a Ryan question, but, but, from what I have seen and, and what I think is available and what's been taken so far, I think there's a couple positions we're going to see a run on tonight. I think number one is wide receiver. I think there's a lot of round two and three guys on the board right now. I look at Jonathan Mingo, Jalen Hyatt, Cedric Hillman, Marvin Mims, Josh Downs, Tyler Scott. I think we see some uh, runs on those positions. I think there's uh, some offensive linemen. I think we're going to see a little bit of run on offensive linemen tonight. You, you look at, obviously, um, uh, Matthew Bergeron, Cody Mouch, Dewan Jones, Break Freeland, some of those guys as tackles on the inside. Uh, you've got John Michael Schmitz, uh, Joe Tipman, a couple of Big Ten kids that I think could go tonight and, and day two. Osiris Torrance could go tonight. Steve Avila could go tonight. So I think we'll see some an off, a little bit of an offensive line run. And, and then another one is I, I think there's some really good defensive backs on the board. I think it's like safety, for example. We can see a couple – I mean, Brian Branch is a guy Ryan talked about. But I think we can see a little bit of a corner run tonight. Joey Porter Jr. still on the board. Keely Ringo, Julius Brents, Tyreek Stevenson. So I think those are the positions, Clark Phillips, where we'll see uh, some potential runs tonight, uh, positions that they didn't load up. But I think the biggest one for me is probably wide receiver. I think we're going to see a bunch of wide receivers taken tonight in days two and three of this draft. Let's get to a couple more. NH asks thoughts on Tyler being able to win the Alabama team over. Will they play hard for him if he wins the job? If he wins the job, you nailed it. If he wins the job, meaning it's obvious that he's the best quarterback on that roster, then yes, they will play for him. Because look, you go to Alabama because you want to win, right? And if Tyler Buckner goes in there and everybody's like, look, this is the best quarterback we have, just like with Sam Hartman, they'll play for him. There's no doubt. Tyler's a nice kid. And the other thing, too, is Tyler's a really quiet kid. He's not He's not a, a guy that's going to walk in the locker room and be like, you know, I'm Tyler Buckner. I'm here. Sit down. Respect me. You know, recognize the game. It's not him. He's, hey, yes, sir. Thank you. Hey, I'm just happy to be here. I just want to go battle and compete. He's going to work hard. He's going to be quiet. He's going to go ball. They'll respect him if he plays well. Simple as that. If Tyler plays well, they'll, they'll love him. If he doesn't, they're going to want somebody else. It's it's so, but it, he's got, it's got, but the thing to your point, NH, it's got to be clear. And this is what we talked about yesterday. It's got to be obvious. He's the best quarterback. If it's any, if it's close at all, then the perception is going to be that Tommy went with his boy. So Tyler's going to have to come in there and uh, be the guy to where everybody's like, yeah, I love Ty or I love Jalen or I love Dylan Lonergan, but man, he's the dude. He's the dude. This guy's the dude. And I hope he can do that. And if he plays like he did in spring practice, then I think he'll do that. I mean, he had a very good spring. But, you know, we'll have to see how it plays. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm rooting for the kid. I really am. I, I like Tyler. I'd like to see Tyler do well. It's just – it's a tough situation. John, John 88, in your opinion, do you feel like this year's defensive line is the potential to be more disruptive than the past years? And, by the way, I appreciate the mug. I'm glad you enjoyed it very much. Obviously, John's talking about the mug he got as part of being uh, either the gold shamrock or blue club, the booster clubs at Irish breakdown. So I appreciate you. And I'm, I'm glad you got it. Uh, does it have a chance to be? Yes, it has. It has actually, I think that this defensive line has a lot more potential to be disruptive than the last two years defensive lines. Cause in 2021, I mean, you had Foskey was very disruptive, but outside of Foskey, you know, it, you, you had a bunch of okay players. You, you didn't have a lot of really disruptive guys in 2021. You know, Foskey. And then after that, it was like Jason Adamiel had seven. Justin had six. You had Kurt Heinrich with five and a half. You had Myron Tungo Lowell playing defensive man. It was like really tough physical run stopper types, but it wasn't a real disruptive unit. And then last year was a similar deal. You know, I think the last time you had a really disruptive defensive line, like a really disruptive defensive line, was probably going back to, to 18. Because they had three guys with 10 plus tackles for loss in 2019, but they were all like two of the three were linebackers. 
But in 2018, you had three defensive linemen with 10 plus tackles for loss. Then you had Dalen Hayes at five. Adi was at two. And so you had a you had a lot. I think this defensive line has a chance to be the best since then from a disruption standpoint. But there's a lot to prove because I think you're going to probably have your most disruptive big end in several years. The Viper position as a collective has a chance to 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 match what Foskey. Did. I don't know if one guy can do it, but as a collective, they can. I I fully expect Riley Mills to be more disruptive and productive than Jason Adamiola. Howard Cross is going to be Howard Cross. And then the depth behind it as like last year, the depth was a bunch of pluggers. You know, you put in Gabriel Rubio and Chris Smith, a bunch of pluggers. You know, Gabriel is going to be better than what he is. And Tim Priester on this show had talked about how he thinks he's going to be a lot more disruptive. We'll see if Tim's right. I hope he is. And, and he, you know, he's a kid that's very disruptive in high school. And, and, but Jason Onye is a guy that brings a lot more disruptive ability. Donovan Heinisch brings a lot more disruptive ability than some of the guys that they had on, on last year. I, I can see like Donovan eventually taking over like a role similar to what Jacob Lacey had last year, you know, like, 15 snaps a game, but when he's in there, man, he's shooting, he's penetrating, he's getting into the backfield and 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 doing some things for you. So it's got a shot for sure. They've got a lot to prove though. Right now it's just potential. I mean, because because you 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 nailed it, John. John, you said, does this D-line have the potential? Yes, they have the potential. Now we just got to go see it. And uh that's kind of what we're gonna find out. Two last two here. Ryan Haley says, which Notre Dame past Notre Dame receiving core do you compare this year's core? I think the closest one is the 18 group. I think it's a very easy comparison. You have two big kids on the outside. You have a little bit of a shifty guy in the slot, like Chris Tyree with Chris Fink. I think the one thing that this group has that that group didn't have, however, is there was no Jaden Thomas in the slot on that team. And, and he had something completely different to the mix. And this group has a lot better depth. This freshman class is better than that freshman class. That was a good freshman class. It was Kevin Austin, Braden Lindsey, Lawrence Keyes, Joe Wilkins, and Micah Jones. It was a good freshman class. Braylon, uh, uh, Kevin Austin and Braylon James were the only – or uh, Bray, Braden Lindsey were the only ones who should have played as freshmen that year. This year, I think all the freshmen can play. Much more advanced, a lot more size. Uh, so it could be there. And then and I'm going to point to this last one from Nathan Milne. I'm a hypocrite when it comes to football. I love watching college football, but won't let my kids play. I mean, they're your kids. You can do what you got to do. All I'm going to say is, as someone who's been around the sport most of my life, there are far, 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 far more benefits to your children playing football than not, than, than dangers. There's danger to anything, right? I mean, I grew up as a kid. I remember watching Ohio State play, and they had this, this guard. I don't even remember what his name was. And he slid, slid, and he ran into something, and he broke his neck, and he was in, like, one of those halos, right? Um, I mean, we see we've seen guys get beamed in the head with a baseball and and have brain damage. And there's all types of things that can happen playing playing sports. I I just I think what has happened is we are in an era of fear. People try to strike fear into other people. There's a I think a war on football, which comes from another area that I don't want to get into because I don't talk politics. And that there's been a lot of misinformation put out, in my opinion. Uh, about the dangers of football. Of course there's dangers and risk to playing football, but it's not any greater than it's not, it's not what people make it out to be in my opinion. And there's so, 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 so many, so many benefits to, to it. Conditioning, toughness, camaraderie, unity, direction, discipline. Uh, I mean, you just, I, I would encourage you to, if your kids want to play football, I would encourage you to allow them to play football. As I've said, just don't let it be any, any, don't even consider it before junior high school. And junior high for me, it's seventh and eighth grade. And I would even consider not till high school, let them play flag football, soccer, basketball, baseball, whatever, but understand that those sports come with dangers as well. I just, I just, I'm, the only, I'm just very against like Pop Warner. I just don't think kids that are whose bodies and bones and and skulls are still in such a developmental phase. I just feel like, um, I, I just feel like there are so many pos, you know, so many benefits to it, but they just don't need it. They, they, there's so many benefits to football, but I don't think those benefits come until you're older, in my opinion. So I just wouldn't let my kids. If I had a son, I wouldn't let him play. Uh, football until and I didn't start playing football until junior high school my my and it was a similar thing my dad you know had talked to people and gotten that advice and I was mad at him for it I mean I at times I mean I had the pop Warner coaches calling my house hey we want Brian we want Brian we want Brian and I get all excited and my dad would be like no he's not playing football 
And it was, I, mean, I hated him for it. I mean, I hated that he wouldn't let me play. I hate my dad. I love my dad, but I hated him that he wouldn't let me play. But looking back now as a 44 year old, my dad absolutely made the right call. hundred percent made the right call. Um, but you know, and my dad was a baseball guy. My dad didn't love football, but he just, that's kind of some things he'd learned. And, just, and then as I've learned and done more research and things like that, I'd say, look, I wouldn't let my kids play Pop Warner football for a million reasons. Not just like, not just safety ones, but just like, they're not really learning anything at that game. I mean, it's like the game of football is such that it's just, it's hard to play when you're just that small and, and, and those type of things. So I, I wouldn't let them play, but when they get older, absolutely. I'd absolutely let them play football. My advice, you, they're your kids, man. As long as you have done your research and 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 have really done your true homework and listened to all parts and all sides of it and you decide this is what we're not going to do, then I mean, that's, that's, that's your choice. They're your kids. I would just say, um, I would just say that I think people who don't let their kids play football are 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 believing things that I believe to be skewed and uh, more agenda driven than data driven. That That's my only thing. That's my only two cents on that. And if you're curious to have further conversation with me, feel free to reach out. But otherwise, man, I mean, they're your kids. As long as you love them and teach them discipline and, and teach them to be good people, I don't give a crap what sport they play, to be honest with you, because that's what's more important. I just feel like football goes a long way towards teaching a lot of those things that I just never got from other sports. And I played soccer. I played football. I played baseball i played basketball i played another sport that i won't mention you know i did all types i was in a band my parents made me do a lot of different things made, made me take piano lessons for a couple of years my parents wanted me ex to experience a lot of different things in life and nothing taught me the lessons about life and discipline and loyalty and togetherness and and following instructions and leadership and just uh, doing things that are right because it's the right thing to do. And because you're looking out for the man next to you, not just because, I mean, there's so many great lessons I learned from football that I just didn't learn from other sports. And I played them all and I was pretty good at all of them. I mean, I was a pretty athletic kid when I, when I was young. And so I'd start playing a sport and pretty good at one played soccer, never played soccer in my life, never picked up a soccer ball in my life and was second best player on my team. You know, it was a pretty good basketball player as a kid. I was a really good baseball player uh, as a kid. But football, just something different, man. Just something different. And, and again, there's flag football now. There's seven on seven. There's a lot of those. If your kid plays seven on seven, though, make sure he's in a league where they allow him to wear those helmets because that's where you can get real dangerous as you start kids playing seven on seven without protection on their helmets. And that's where, you, I mean, that's worse than playing football. But as a young kid, I don't want to play flag, flag football. It's, you know, but there's a lot of other things they could do. But um, anyway, that's my two cents. I got that out there. So that's going to do it today, everybody. I appreciate y'all very, very much. A uh, fun show. We'll, we are not going to be doing a show tonight. No uh, Ivy Nation sports talk. No uh, no uh, draft stuff. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy the draft. Uh, make sure you check out IrishBreakdown.com. Uh, you can find that. We have a lot of new content, a lot of good stuff coming up. We'll have a lot of draft stuff. Uh, Sean Davis and I tomorrow, as of right now, our plan is to do a show at 4 o'clock. Um, We'll have some recruiting stuff to talk about tomorrow around four o'clock. So we'll have that as well. And then, of course, we'll be back Monday with our Notre Dame recruiting hour. So, hey, everybody, have an awesome rest of your day. Make sure you sign up for the message boards at boards.irishbreakdown.com. I have a lot of fun conversation going on. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. And so all of you who gave so much, we raised over $7,000, almost $8,000 yesterday to help a family in need. Uh, and that was on you. You are such an amazing group of people. I'm so blessed to be a part of this community and thankful that you all have chosen to make IB uh, your, your Notre Dame family and are, are on board with, with me as we go out and we try to use our platform and use our, the blessings that we've been, been given to go out there and help others. So y'all are amazing. Tip of the cap to you. Can't wait to see you again on the next edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast.